Chapter Two of Book Second of The Mill on the Floss by George Eliot. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Tom Denham. The Christmas Holidays. Fine old Christmas, with the snowy hair and ruddy face, had done his duty that year in the noblest fashion, and had set off his rich gifts of warmth and colour with all the heightening contrast of frost and snow. Snow lay on the croft and river-bank in undulations softer than the limbs of infancy. It lay with the neatliest finished border on every sloping roof, making the dark red gables stand out with a new depth of colour. It weighed heavily on the laurels and fir-trees till it fell from them with a shuddering sound. It clothed the rough turnip-field with whiteness, and made the sheep look like dark blotches. The gates were all blocked up with the sloping drifts, and here and there a disregarded four-footed beast stood as if petrified in unrecumbent sadness. There was no gleam, no shadow, for the heavens too were one still pale cloud, no sound or motion in anything but the dark river that flowed and moaned like an unresting sorrow. But old Christmas smiled as he laid this cruel-seeming spell out on the outdoor world, for he meant to light up home with new brightness, to deepen all the richness of indoor colour, and give a keener edge of delight to the warm fragrance of food. He meant to prepare a sweet imprisonment that would strengthen the primitive fellowship of kindred, and make the sunshine of familiar human faces as welcome as the hidden day-star. His kindness fell but hardly on the homeless, fell but hardly on the homes where the hearth was not very warm, and where the food had little fragrance, where the human faces had no sunshine in them, but rather the leaden, blank-eyed gaze of unexpected want. But the fine old season meant well, and if he has not learned the secret how to bless men impartially, it is because his father, time, with ever unrelenting purpose, still hides that secret in his own mighty, slow-beating heart. And yet this Christmas day, in spite of Tom's fresh delight in home, was not, he thought, somehow or other, quite so happy as it had always been before. The red berries were just as abundant on the holly, and he and Maggie had dressed all the windows and mantelpieces and picture frames on Christmas Eve with as much taste as ever, wedding the thick-set scarlet clusters with branches of the black-berried ivy. There had been singing under the windows after midnight, supernatural singing, Maggie always felt, in spite of Tom's contemptuous insistence, that the singers were Old Patch, the parish clerk, and the rest of the church choir. She trembled with awe when their carolling broke in upon her dreams, and the image of men in fustian clothes was always thrust away by the vision of angels resting on the parted cloud. But the midnight chant had helped as usual to lift the morning above the level of common days. And then there was the smell of hot toast and ale from the kitchen at the breakfast hour, the favourite anthem, the green boughs, and the short sermon gave the appropriate festal character to the church-going, and Aunt and Uncle Moss, with all their seven children, were looking like so many reflectors of the bright parlour fire, when the church-goers came back, stamping the snow from their feet. The plum pudding was of the same handsome roundness as ever, and came in with the symbolic blue flames around it, as if it had been heroically snatched from the nether fires into which it had been thrown by dyspeptic Puritans. The dessert was as splendid as ever, with its golden oranges, brown nuts, and the crystalline light and dark 
of apple jelly and damson cheese. In all these things Christmas was as it had always been since Tom could remember. It was only distinguished, if by anything, by superior sliding and snowballs. Christmas was cheery, but not so Mr. Tulliver. He was irate and defiant, and Tom, though he espoused his father's quarrels and shared his father's sense of injury, was not without some of the feeling that oppressed Maggie when Mr. Tulliver got louder and more angry in narration and assertion with the increased leisure of dessert. The attention that Tom might have concentrated on his nuts and wine was distracted by a sense that there were rascally enemies in the world, and that the business of grown-up life could hardly be conducted without a good deal of quarrelling. Now Tom was not fond of quarrelling unless it could soon be put to an end by a fair stand-up fight with an adversary whom he had every chance of thrashing, and his father's irritable talk made him uncomfortable, though he never accounted to himself for the feeling or conceived the notion that his father was faulty in this respect. The particular embodiment of the evil principle now exciting Mr. Tulliver's determined resistance was Mr. Pivart, who, having lands higher up the ripple, was taking measures for their irrigation, which either were, or would be, or were bound to be, on the principle that water was water, an infringement on Mr. Tulliver's legitimate share of water-power. Dix, who had a mill on the stream, was a feeble auxiliary of old Harry compared with Pivart. Dix had been brought to his senses by arbitration, and Wakeham's advice had not carried him far. No, Dix, Mr. Tulliver considered, had been as good as nowhere in point of law, and in the intensity of his indignation against Pivart, his contempt for a baffled adversary like Dix began to wear the air of a friendly attachment. He had no male audience to-day except Mr. Moss, who knew nothing, as he said, of the nature of mills, and could only assent to Mr. Tulliver's arguments on the a priori ground of family relationship and monetary obligation. But Mr. Tulliver did not talk with the futile intention of convincing his audience. He talked to relieve himself. While good Mr. Moss made strong efforts to keep his eyes wide open, in spite of the sleepiness which an unusually good dinner produced in his hard-worked frame, Mrs. Moss, more alive to the subject, and interested in everything that affected her brother, listened and put in a word as often as maternal preoccupations allowed. "'Why, Pivart's a new name here about, brother, isn't it?' she said. "'He didn't own the land in father's time, nor yours either, before I was married.' "'New name? Yes, I should think it is a new name,' said Mr. Tulliver, with angry emphasis. "'Dalcott Mills been in our family a hundred year and better.' and nobody ever heard of a pivart meddling with the river till this fellow came and bought Bingcombe's farm out of hand before anybody else could so much as say snap. But I'll pivart him, added Mr. Tulliver, lifting his glass with a sense that he had defined his resolution in an unmistakable manner. "'You won't be forced to go to law with him, I hope, brother,' said Mrs. Moss, with some anxiety. "'I don't know what I shall be forced to, but I know what I shall force him to, with his dikes and irrigations, if there's any law to be brought to bear at the right side. I know well enough who's at the bottom of it. He's got Wakem to back him and egg him on. I know Wakem tells him the law can't touch him for it, but there's folks can handle the law besides Wakem. It takes a big rascal to beat him, but there's bigger to be found, as no more the ins and outs of the law, else how came Wakem to lose Brumley's suit for him? 
Mr. Tulliver was a strictly honest man, and proud of being honest, but he considered that in law the ends of justice could only be achieved by employing a stronger knave to frustrate a weaker. Law was a sort of cock-fight in which it was the business of injured honesty to get a game-bird with the best pluck and the strongest spurs. "'Gore's no fool. You needn't tell me that,' he observed presently in a pugnacious tone, as if poor Gritty had been urging that lawyer's capabilities. "'But, you see, he isn't up to the law as Wakem is. And water's a very particular thing. You can't pick it up with a pitchfork. That's why it's been nuts to old Harry and the lawyers.' It's plain enough what's the rights and wrongs of water if you look at it straight forward. For a river's a river, and if you've got a mill, you must have water to turn it, and it's no use telling me Pivart's irrigation and nonsense won't stop my wheel. I know what belongs to water better than that. Talk to me of what the engineers say. I say it's common sense as Pivart's dykes must do me an injury. But if that's their engineering, I'll put Tom to it by and by, and he shall see if he can't find a bit more sense in the engineering business than what that comes to. Tom, looking round with some anxiety at this announcement of his prospects, unthinkingly withdrew a small rattle he was amusing Baby Moss with, whereupon she, being a baby that knew her own mind with remarkable clearness, instantaneously expressed her sentiments in a piercing yell, and was not to be appeased even by the restoration of the rattle, feeling apparently that the original wrong of having it taken from her remained in all its force. Mrs. Moss hurried away with her into another room, and expressed to Mrs. Tulliver, who accompanied her, the conviction that the dear child had good reasons for crying, implying that if it was supposed to be the rattle that the baby clamoured for, she was a misunderstood baby. The thoroughly justifiable yell being quieted, Mrs. Moss looked at her sister-in-law and said, "'I'm sorry to see brother so put out about this water-work.' "'It's your brother's way, Mrs. Moss. I'd never anything of that sort before I was married,' said Mrs. Tulliver, with a half-implied reproach. She always spoke of her husband as your brother to Mrs. Moss, in any case when his line of conduct was not matter of pure admiration. Amiable Mrs. Tulliver, who was never angry in her life, had yet her mild share of that spirit without which she could hardly have been at once a Dodson and a woman. Being always on the defensive towards her own sisters, it was natural that she should be keenly conscious of her superiority, even as the weakest Dodson, over a husband's sister, who, besides being poorly off and inclined to hang on her brother, had the good-natured submissiveness of a large, easy-tempered, untidy, prolific woman, with affection enough in her, not only for her own husband and abundant children, but for any number of collateral relations. "'I hope and pray he won't go to law,' said Mrs. Moss, "'for there's never any knowing where that'll end. "'And the right doesn't always win.' This Mr. Pivart's a rich man, by what I can make out, and the rich mostly get things their own way. "'As to that,' said Mrs. Tulliver, stroking her dress down, "'I've seen what riches are in my own family, for my sisters have got husbands as can afford to do pretty much what they like. But I think sometimes I shall be drove off my head with the talk about this law and irrigation.' and my sisters lay all the fault to me, for they don't know what it is to marry a man like your brother. How should they? Sister Pullet has her own way from morning till night.' "'Well,' said Mrs. Moss, 
"'I don't think I should like my husband if he hadn't got any wits of his own, and I had to find headpiece for him. It's a deal easier to do what pleases one's husband than to be puzzling what else one should do. "'If people come to talk of doing what pleases their husbands,' said Mrs. Tulliver, with a faint imitation of her sister Glegg, "'I'm sure your brother might have waited a long while before he'd have found a wife that had let him have his say in everything as I do. "'It's nothing but law and irrigation now from when we first get up in the morning till we go to bed at night, and I never contradict him. I only say, "'Well, Mr. Tulliver, do as you like, but whatever you do, don't go to law.' Mrs. Tulliver, as we have seen, was not without influence over her husband. No woman is. She can always incline him to do either what she wishes or the reverse, and on the composite impulses that were threatening to hurry Mr. Tulliver into law, Mrs. Tulliver's monotonous pleading had doubtless its share of force. It might even be comparable to that proverbial feather which has the credit or discredit of breaking the camel's back, though on a strictly impartial view the blame ought rather to lie with the previous weight of feathers which had already placed the back in such imminent peril that an otherwise innocent feather could not settle on it without mischief. Not that Mrs. Tulliver's feeble beseeching would have had this feather's weight in virtue of her single personality— but whenever she departed from entire assent to her husband, he saw in her the representative of the Dodson family, and it was a guiding principle with Mr. Tulliver to let the Dodsons know that they were not to domineer over him, or more specifically, that a male Tulliver was far more than equal to four female Dodsons, even though one of them was Mrs. Glegg but not even a direct argument from that typical Dodson female herself against his going to law could have heightened his disposition towards it so much as the mere thought of Wakeham, continually freshened by the sight of the too able attorney on market days. Wakeham, to his certain knowledge, was, metaphorically speaking, at the bottom of Pivart's irrigation— Wakeham had tried to make Dicks stand out and go to law about the dam. It was unquestionably Wakeham who had caused Mr. Tulliver to lose the suit about the right of road and the bridge that made a thoroughfare of his land for every vagabond who preferred an opportunity of damaging private property to walking like an honest man along the high road. All lawyers were more or less rascals, but Wakeham's rascality was of that peculiarly aggravated kind which placed itself in opposition to that form of right embodied in Mr. Tulliver's interests and opinions. And as an extra touch of bitterness, the injured miller had recently, in borrowing the five hundred pounds, been obliged to carry a little business to Wakeham's office on his own account— a hook-nosed, glib fellow, as cool as a cucumber, always looking so sure of his game. And it was vexatious that Lawyer Gore was not more like him, but was a bald, round-featured man, with bland manners and fat hands, a gamecock that you would be rash to bet upon against Wakeham. Gore was a sly fellow, his weakness did not lie on the side of scrupulosity. But the largest amount of winking, however significant, is not equivalent to seeing through a stone wall, and confident as Mr. Tulliver was in his principle that water was water, and in the direct inference that Pivart had not a leg to stand on in this affair of irrigation, he had an uncomfortable suspicion that Wakeham had more law to show against this rationally irrefragable inference than Gore could show for it. But then, if they went to law, 
there was a chance for Mr. Tulliver to employ Councillor Wilde on his side, instead of having that admirable bully against him, and the prospect of seeing a witness of Wakeham's made to perspire and become confounded, as Mr. Tulliver's witness had once been, was alluring to the love of retributive justice. Much rumination had Mr. Tulliver on these puzzling subjects during his rides on the grey horse, much turning of the head from side to side as the scales dipped alternately. But the probable result was still out of sight, only to be reached through much hot argument and iteration in domestic and social life. That initial stage of the dispute which consisted in the narration of the case, and the enforcement of Mr. Tulliver's views concerning it throughout the entire circle of his connections, would necessarily take time, and at the beginning of February, when Tom was going to school again, there were scarcely any new items to be detected in his father's statement of the case against Pivart or any more specific indication of the measures he was bent on taking against that rash convener of the principle that water was water. Iteration, like friction, is likely to generate heat instead of progress, and Mr. Tulliver's heat was certainly more and more palpable. If there had been no new evidence on any other point, there had been new evidence that Pivart was as thick as mud with Wakeham. "'Father,' said Tom, one evening near the end of the holidays, "'Uncle Glegg says lawyer Wakeham is going to send his son to Mr. Stelling. It isn't true what they said about his going to be sent to France. You won't like me to go to school with Wakeham's son, shall you?' "'It's no matter for that, my boy,' said Mr. Tulliver. "'Don't you learn anything bad of him, that's all. "'The lad's a poor, deformed creature, "'and takes after his mother in the face. "'I think there isn't much of his father in him. "'It's a sign Wakeham thinks high of Mr. Stelling "'as he sends his son to him, "'and Wakeham knows meal from Bran.' "'Mr. Tulliver, in his heart, was rather proud of the fact "'that his son was to have the same advantages as Wakeham's. But Tom was not at all easy on the point. It would have been much clearer if the lawyer's son had not been deformed, for then Tom would have had the prospect of pitching into him with all that freedom which is derived from a high moral sanction. End of chapter 2 of Book 2nd Recording by Tom Denham Chapter Three of Book Second of The Mill on the Floss by George Eliot. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Tom Denham. The New Schoolfellow. It was a cold, wet January day on which Tom went back to school, a day quite in keeping with this severe phase of his destiny. If he had not carried in his pocket a parcel of sugar candy and a small Dutch doll for little Laura, there would have been no ray of expected pleasure to enliven the general gloom. But he liked to think how Laura would put out her lips and her tiny hands for the bits of sugar candy, and to give the greater keenness to these pleasures of imagination, he took out the parcel, made a small hole in the paper, and bit off a crystal or two which had so solacing an effect under the confined prospect and damp odours of the gig umbrella that he repeated the process more than once on his way well tulliver we're glad to see you again said mr stelling heartily take off your wrappings and come into the study till dinner you'll find a bright fire there and a new companion Tom felt in an uncomfortable flutter, as he took off his woollen comforter and other wrappings. He had seen Philip Wakeham at St. Ogg's, but had always turned his eyes away from him as quickly as possible. 
he would have disliked having a deformed boy for his companion, even if Philip had not been the son of a bad man. And Tom did not see how a bad man's son could be very good. His own father was a good man, and he would readily have fought any one who said the contrary. He was in a state of mingled embarrassment and defiance as he followed Mr. Stelling to the study. "'Here is a new companion for you, to shake hands with, Tolliver,' said that gentleman on entering the study. "'Master Philip Wakeham. I shall leave you to make acquaintance by yourselves. You already know something of each other, I imagine, for you are neighbours at home.' Tom looked confused and awkward, while Philip rose and glanced at him timidly. Tom did not like to go up and put out his hand, and he was not prepared to say, "'How do you do?' on so short a notice. Mr. Stelling wisely turned away, and closed the door behind him. Boys' shyness only wears off in the absence of their elders. Philip was at once too proud and too timid to walk towards Tom. He thought, or rather felt, that Tom had an aversion to looking at him. Every one almost disliked looking at him, and his deformity was more conspicuous when he walked. So they remained without shaking hands or even speaking, while Tom went to the fire and warmed himself, every now and then casting furtive glances at Philip, who seemed to be drawing absently first one object and then another on a piece of paper he had before him. He had seated himself again, and as he drew was thinking what he could say to Tom, and trying to overcome his own repugnance to making the first advances. Tom began to look oftener and longer at Philip's face, for he could see it without noticing the hump, and it was really not a disagreeable face, very old-looking, Tom thought. He wondered how much older Philip was than himself. An anatomist, even a mere physiognomist, would have seen that the deformity of Philip's spine was not a congenital hump, but the result of an accident in infancy. But you do not expect from Tom any acquaintance with such distinctions. To him, Philip was simply a humpback. He had a vague notion that the deformity of Wakeham's son had some relation to the lawyer's rascality, of which he had so often heard his father talk with hot emphasis. And he felt, too, a half-admitted fear of him as probably a spiteful fellow, who, not being able to fight you, had cunning ways of doing you a mischief by the sly. There was a humpback tailor in the neighbourhood of Mr. Jacob's Academy, who was considered a very unamiable character, and was much hooted after by public-spirited boys solely on the ground of his unsatisfactory moral qualities, so that Tom was not without a basis of fact to go upon. Still, no face could be more unlike that ugly tailor's than this melancholy boy's face. The brown hair round it waved and curled at the ends like a girl's. Tom thought that truly pitiable. This Wakeham was a pale, puny fellow, and it was quite clear he would not be able to play at anything worth speaking of. But he handled his pencil in an enviable manner, and was apparently making one thing after another without any trouble. What was he drawing? Tom was quite warm now, and wanted something new to be going forward. It was certainly more agreeable to have an ill-natured humpback as a companion than to stand looking out of the study window at the rain, and kicking his foot against the washboard in solitude. Something would happen every day. A quarrel or something! And Tom thought he should rather like to show Philip that he had better not try his spiteful tricks on him. He suddenly walked across the hearth, and looked over Philip's paper. "'Why, that's a donkey with panniers, and a spaniel, and partridges in the corn!' he exclaimed, 
his tongue being completely loosed by surprise and admiration. "'Oh, my buttons! I wish I could draw like that! I'm to learn drawing this half. I wonder if I shall learn to make dogs and donkeys.' "'Oh, you can do them without learning,' said Philip. "'I never learned drawing.' "'Never learned?' said Tom, in amazement. "'Why, when I make dogs and horses and those things, the heads and the legs won't come right, though I can see how they ought to be very well. I can make houses and all sorts of chimneys, chimneys going all down the wall, and windows in the roof, and all that.' "'But I dare say I could do dogs and horses if I was to try more,' he added, reflecting that Philip might falsely suppose that he was going to knock under if he were too frank about the imperfection of his accomplishments. "'Oh, yes,' said Philip, "'it's very easy. You've only to look well at things and draw them over and over again. What you do wrong once, you can alter the next time.' "'But haven't you been taught anything?' said Tom, beginning to have a puzzled suspicion that Philip's crooked back might be the source of remarkable faculties. "'I thought you'd been to school a long while.' "'Yes,' said Philip, smiling. "'I've been taught Latin and Greek and mathematics and writing and such things. "'Oh, but I say, you don't like Latin, though, do you?' said Tom, lowering his voice confidentially. "'Pretty well. I don't much care about it,' said Philip. "'Ah, but perhaps you haven't got into the proprie que maribus,' said Tom, nodding his head sideways as much as to say, "'That was the test. It was easy talking till you came to that.' Philip felt some bitter complacency in the promising stupidity of this well-made, active-looking boy, but made polite by his own extreme sensitiveness, as well as by his desire to conciliate, he checked his inclination to laugh, and said quietly, "'I've done with the grammar. I don't learn that any more.' "'Then you won't have the same lessons as I shall,' said Tom, with a sense of disappointment. "'No, but I dare say I can help you. I shall be very glad to help you if I can.' Tom did not say thank you, for he was quite absorbed in the thought that Wakem's son did not seem so spiteful a fellow as might have been expected. "'I say,' he said presently, "'do you love your father?' "'Yes,' said Philip, colouring deeply. "'Don't you love yours?' "'Oh, yes. I only wanted to know,' said Tom, rather ashamed of himself, now he saw Philip colouring and looking uncomfortable. He found much difficulty in adjusting his attitude of mind towards the son of Lawyer Wakeham, and it had occurred to him that if Philip disliked his father, that fact might go some way towards clearing up his perplexity. "'Shall you learn drawing now?' he said, by way of changing the subject. "'No,' said Philip. "'My father wishes me to give all my time to other things now.' "'What, Latin and Euclid and those things?' said Tom. "'Yes,' said Philip, who had left off using his pencil, and was resting his head on one hand, while Tom was leaning forward on both elbows, and looking with increasing admiration at the dog and the donkey. "'And you don't mind that?' said Tom, with strong curiosity. "'No, I like to know what everybody else knows. I can study what I like by and by.' "'I can't think why anybody should learn Latin,' said Tom. "'It's no good.' "'It's part of the education of a gentleman,' said Philip. "'All gentlemen learn the same things.' "'What, do you think Sir John Crake, the master of the Harriers, knows Latin?' said Tom who had often thought he should like to resemble Sir John Crake. "'He learnt it when he was a boy, of course,' said Philip, "'but I dare say he's forgotten it.' "'Oh, well, I can do that, then,' said Tom, not with any epigrammatic intention, 
but with serious satisfaction at the idea that, as far as Latin was concerned, there was no hindrance to his resembling Sir John Creek. "'Only you're obliged to remember it while you're at school, else you've got to learn ever so many lines of speaker. Mr. Stelling's very particular, did you know?' He'll have you up ten times if you say nam for yam. He won't let you do a letter wrong, I can tell you. Oh, I don't mind, said Philip, unable to choke a laugh. I can remember things easily, and there are some lessons I'm very fond of. I'm very fond of Greek history and everything about the Greeks. I should like to have been a Greek and fought the Persians, and then have come home and have written tragedies, or else have been listened to by everybody for my wisdom, like Socrates, and have died a grand death. Philip, you perceive, was not without a wish to impress the well-made barbarian with a sense of his mental superiority. "'Why, were the Greeks great fighters?' said Tom who saw a vista in this direction. "'Is there anything like David and Goliath and Samson in the Greek history? Those are the only bits I like in the history of the Jews.' "'Oh, there are very fine stories of that sort about the Greeks, about the heroes of early times who killed the wild beasts as Samson did. And in the Odyssey—that's a beautiful poem— there's a more wonderful giant than Goliath, Polypheme, who had only one eye in the middle of his forehead, and Ulysses, a little fellow, but very wise and cunning, got a red-hot pine tree and stuck it into this one eye, and made him roar like a thousand bulls. "'Oh, what fun!' said Tom, jumping away from the table, and stamping first with one leg and then the other. "'I say—' "'Can you tell me all about those stories? "'Because I shan't learn Greek, you know. "'Shall I?' he added, pausing in his stamping with a sudden alarm, "'lest the contrary might be possible. "'Does every gentleman learn Greek? "'Will Mr. Stelling make me begin with it, do you think?' "'No, I should think not. "'Very likely not,' said Philip. "'But you may read those stories without knowing Greek. "'I've got them in English.' "'Oh, but I don't like reading. I'd sooner have you tell them me. But only the fighting ones, you know. My sister Maggie is always wanting to tell me stories, but they're stupid things. Girls' stories always are. Can you tell a good many fighting stories?' "'Oh, yes,' said Philip. "'Lots of them, besides the Greek stories.' I can tell you about uh, Richard Coeur de Lyon and Saladin, and about William Wallace and Robert Bruce and James Douglas. I know no end. You're older than I am, aren't you? said Tom. Why, how old are you? I'm fifteen. I'm only going in fourteen, said Tom. But I thrashed all the fellows at Jacob's. That's where I was before I came here. "'And I beat them all at bandy and climbing. "'And I wish Mr. Stelling would let us go fishing. "'I could show you how to fish. "'You could fish, couldn't you? "'It's only standing and sitting still, you know.' "'Tom, in his turn, wished to make the balance dip in his favour. "'This hunchback must not suppose "'that his acquaintance with fighting stories "'put him on a par with an actual fighting hero like Tom Tulliver.' Philip winced under this allusion to his unfitness for active sports, and he answered almost peevishly, "'I can't bear fishing. I think people look like fools sitting watching a line hour after hour, or else throwing and throwing and catching nothing. Ah, but you wouldn't say they look like fools when they landed a big pike, I can tell you,' said Tom who had never caught anything that was big in his life, but whose imagination was on the stretch with indignant zeal for the honour of sport. Wakeham's son, it was plain, had his disagreeable points, and must be kept in due check. Happily for the harmony of this first interview, they were now called to dinner, 
and Philip was not allowed to develop farther his unsound views on the subject of fishing. But Tom said to himself that was just what he should have expected from a hunchback. End of chapter 3 of Book Second Recording by Tom Denham Chapter 4 of Book Second of The Mill on the Floss by George Eliot This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Tom Denham The Young Idea the alternations of feeling in that first dialogue between Tom and Philip continued to mark their intercourse even after many weeks of schoolboy intimacy. Tom never quite lost the feeling that Philip, being the son of a rascal, was his natural enemy, never thoroughly overcame his repulsion to Philip's deformity. He was a boy who adhered tenaciously to impressions once received. As with all minds in which mere perception predominates over thought and emotion, the external remained to him rigidly what it was in the first instance. But then it was impossible not to like Philip's company when he was in a good humour. He could help one so well in one's Latin exercises, which Tom regarded as a kind of puzzle that could only be found out by a lucky chance and he could tell such wonderful fighting stories about Hal of the Wind, for example, and other heroes who were especial favourites with Tom because they laid about them with heavy strokes. He had small opinion of Saladin, whose scimitar could cut a cushion in two in an instant. Who wanted to cut cushions? That was a stupid story, and he didn't care to hear it again but when Robert Bruce, on the black pony, rose in his stirrups, and lifting his good battle-axe, cracked at once the helmet and the skull of the too hasty knight at Bannockburn, then Tom felt all the exaltation of sympathy, and if he had had a cocoa-nut at hand, he would have cracked it at once with the poker. Philip, in his happier moods, indulged Tom to the top of his bent, heightening the crash and bang and fury of every fight with all the artillery of epithets and similes at his command. But he was not always in a good humour or happy mood. The slight spurt of peevish susceptibility which had escaped him in their first interview was a symptom of a perpetually recurring mental ailment, half of it nervous irritability, half of it the heart-bitterness produced by the sense of his deformity. In these fits of susceptibility every glance seemed to him to be charged either with offensive pity or with ill-repressed disgust. At the very least it was an indifferent glance, and Philip felt indifference as a child of the South feels the chill air of a northern spring. Poor Tom's blundering patronage when they were out of doors together would sometimes make him turn upon the well-meaning lad quite savagely, and his eyes, usually sound and quiet, would flash with anything but playful lightning. No wonder Tom retained his suspicions of the humpback. But Philip's self-taught skill in drawing was another link between them, for Tom found, to his disgust, that his new drawing-master gave him no dogs and donkeys to draw, but brooks and rustic bridges and ruins, all with a general softness of black-lead surface, indicating that nature, if anything, was rather satiny. And as Tom's feeling for the picturesque in landscape was at present quite latent, it is not surprising that Mr. Goodrich's production seemed to him an uninteresting form of art. Mr. Tulliver, having a vague intention that Tom should be put to some business which included the drawing out of plans and maps, had complained to Mr. Riley, when he saw him at Mudport, that Tom seemed to be learning nothing of that sort, whereupon 
that obliging adviser had suggested that Tom should have drawing lessons. Mr. Tulliver must not mind paying extra for drawing. Let Tom be made a good draughtsman, and he would be able to turn his pencil to any purpose. So it was ordered that Tom should have drawing lessons, and whom should Mr. Stelling have selected as a master if not Mr. Goodrich, who was considered quite at the head of his profession within a circuit of twelve miles round King's Lawton, by which means Tom learned to make an extremely fine point to his pencil, and to represent landscape with a broad generality which doubtless from a narrow tendency in his mind to details, he thought extremely dull. All this, you remember, happened in those dark ages when there were no schools of design, before schoolmasters were invariably men of scrupulous integrity, and before the clergy were all men of enlarged minds and varied culture. In those less favoured days, it is no fable that there were other clergymen besides Mr. Stelling, who had narrow intellects and large wants, and whose income, by a logical confusion to which fortune, being a female as well as blindfold, is peculiarly liable, was proportioned not to their wants, but to their intellect, with which income clearly has no inherent relation. The problem these gentlemen had to solve was to readjust the proportion between their wants and their income. And since wants are not easily starved to death, the simpler method appeared to be to raise their income. There was but one way of doing this. Any of those low callings in which men are obliged to do good work at a low price were forbidden to clergymen. Was it their fault if their only resource was to turn out very poor work at a high price? Besides, how should Mr. Stelling be expected to know that education was a delicate and difficult business? Any more than an animal endowed with the power of boring a hole through a rock should be expected to have wide views of excavation. Mr. Stelling's faculties had been early trained to boring in a straight line, and he had no faculty to spare. But among Tom's contemporaries, whose fathers cast their sons on clerical instruction to find them ignorant after many days, there were many far less lucky than Tom Tulliver. Education was almost entirely a matter of luck, usually of ill luck, in those distant days. The state of mind in which you take a billiard cue or a dice-box in your hand is one of sober certainty compared with that of old-fashioned fathers, like Mr. Tulliver, when they selected a school or a tutor for their sons. Excellent men, who had been forced all their lives to spell on an impromptu phonetic system, and having carried on a successful business in spite of this disadvantage, had acquired money enough to give their sons a better start in life than they had had themselves, must necessarily take their chance as to the conscience and the competence of the schoolmaster whose circular fell in their way, and appeared to promise so much more than they would ever have thought of asking for, including the return of linen, fork, and spoon. It was happy for them if some ambitious draper of their acquaintance had not brought up his son to the church, and if that young gentleman, at the age of four and twenty, had not closed his college dissipations by an imprudent marriage. Otherwise these innocent fathers, desirous of doing the best for their offspring, could only escape the draper's son by happening to be on the foundation of a grammar school as yet unvisited by commissioners, where two or three boys could have all to themselves the advantages of a large and lofty building, together with a headmaster, toothless, dim-eyed, and deaf, whose erudite indistinctness and inattention were engrossed by them at the rate of three hundred pounds a head a ripe scholar doubtless when first appointed, 
but all ripeness beneath the sun has a further stage less esteemed in the market. Tom Tulliver, then, compared with many other British youths of his time, who have since had to scramble through life with some fragments of more or less relevant knowledge, and a great deal of strictly relevant ignorance, was not so very unlucky. Mr. Stelling was a broad-chested, healthy man, with the bearing of a gentleman, a conviction that a growing boy required a sufficiency of beef, and a certain hearty kindness in him that made him like to see Tom looking well and enjoying his dinner. Not a man of refined conscience, or with any deep sense of the infinite issues belonging to everyday duties, not quite competent to his high offices, but incompetent gentlemen must live, and without private fortune it is difficult to see how they could all live genteelly if they had nothing to do with education or government. Besides, it was the fault of Tom's mental constitution that his faculties could not be nourished on the sort of knowledge Mr. Stelling had to communicate. A boy born with a deficient power of apprehending signs and abstractions must suffer the penalty of his congenital deficiency, just as if he had been born with one leg shorter than the other. A method of education sanctioned by the long practice of our venerable ancestors was not to give way before the exceptional dullness of a boy who was merely living at the time then present. And Mr. Stelling was convinced that a boy so stupid at signs and abstractions must be stupid at everything else, even if that reverend gentleman could have taught him everything else. It was the practice of our venerable ancestors to apply that ingenious instrument, the thumbscrew, and to tighten and tighten it in order to elicit non-existent facts. They had a fixed opinion, to begin with, that the facts were existent, and what had they to do but to tighten the thumbscrew? In like manner, Mr. Stelling had a fixed opinion that all boys with any capacity could learn what it was the only regular thing to teach. If they were slow, the thumbscrew must be tightened. The exercises must be insisted on with increased severity, and a page of Virgil be awarded as a penalty to encourage and stimulate a too languid inclination to Latin verse. Nevertheless, the thumbscrew was relaxed a little during this second half-year. Philip was so advanced in his studies, and so apt, that Mr. Stelling could obtain credit by his facility, which required little help, much more easily than by the troublesome process of overcoming Tom's dullness. Gentlemen with broad chests and ambitious intentions do sometimes disappoint their friends by failing to carry the world before them. Perhaps it is that high achievements demand some other unusual qualification besides an unusual desire for high prizes. Perhaps it is that these stalwart gentlemen are rather indolent, their divini particulum ori being obstructed from soaring by a too hearty appetite. Some reason or other there was why Mr. Stelling deferred the execution of many spirited projects, why he did not begin the editing of his Greek play, or any other work of scholarship in his leisure hours, but, after turning the key of his private study with much resolution, sat down to one of Theodore Hook's novels. Tom was gradually allowed to shuffle through his lessons with less rigour, and having Philip to help him, he was able to make some show of having applied his mind in a confused and blundering way, without being cross-examined into a betrayal that his mind had been entirely neutral in the matter. He thought school much more bearable under this modification of circumstances, and he went on contentedly enough, picking up a promiscuous education 
chiefly from things that were not intended as education at all. What was understood to be his education was simply the practice of reading, writing, and spelling, carried on by an elaborate appliance of unintelligible ideas, and by much failure in the effort to learn by rote. Nevertheless, there was a visible improvement in Tom under this training, perhaps because he was not a boy in the abstract, existing solely to illustrate the evils of a mistaken education, but a boy made of flesh and blood, with dispositions not entirely at the mercy of circumstances. There was a great improvement in his bearing, for example, and some credit on this score was due to Mr. Poulter, the village schoolmaster, who, being an old peninsular soldier, was employed to drill Tom, a source of high mutual pleasure. Mr. Poulter, who was understood by the company at the Black Swan to have once struck terror into the hearts of the French, was no longer personally formidable. He had rather a shrunken appearance, and was tremulous in the mornings, not from age, but from the extreme perversity of the King's Lawton boys, which nothing but gin could enable him to sustain with any firmness. Still, he carried himself with martial erectness, had his clothes scrupulously brushed, and his trousers tightly strapped, and on the Wednesday and Saturday afternoons, when he came to Tom, he was always inspired with gin and old memories, which gave him an exceptionally spirited air, as of a superannuated charger who hears the drum. The drilling lessons were always protracted by episodes of warlike narrative, much more interesting to Tom than Philip's stories out of the Iliad, for there were no cannon in the Iliad, and besides, Tom had felt some disgust on learning that Hector and Achilles might possibly never have existed. But the Duke of Wellington was really alive, and Boney had not been long dead. Therefore, Mr. Poulter's reminiscences of the Peninsular War were removed from all suspicion of being mythical. Mr. Poulter, it appeared, had been a conspicuous figure at Talavera, and had contributed not a little to the peculiar terror with which his regiment of infantry was regarded by the enemy. On afternoons, when his memory was more stimulated than usual, he remembered that the Duke of Wellington had, in strict privacy, lest jealousies should be awakened, expressed his esteem for that fine fellow Poulter. The very surgeon who attended him in the hospital after he had received his gunshot wound had been profoundly impressed with the superiority of Mr. Poulter's flesh. No other flesh would have healed in anything like the same time. On less personal matters connected with the important warfare in which he had been engaged, Mr. Poulter was more reticent only taking care not to give the weight of his authority to any loose notions concerning military history. Any one who pretended to a knowledge of what occurred at the siege of Badajoz was especially an object of silent pity to Mr. Poulter. He wished that prating person had been run down, and had the breath trampled out of him at the first go-off, as he himself had. He might talk about the siege of Badajoz then— Tom did not escape irritating his drill-master occasionally by his curiosity concerning other military matters than Mr. Poulter's personal experience. "'And General Wolfe, Mr. Poulter, wasn't he a wonderful fighter?' said Tom, who held the notion that all the martial heroes commemorated on the public-house signs were engaged in the war with Boney. "'Not at all,' said Mr. Poulter, contemptuously. "'Nothing of the sort. Heads up!' he added, in a tone of stern command, which delighted Tom, and made him feel as if he were a regiment in his own person. "'No, no,' 
Mr. Poulter would continue, on coming to a pause in his discipline. "'They'd better not talk to me about General Wolfe. He did nothing but die of his wound. That's a poor action, I consider. Any other man that had died of the wounds I've had. One of my sword-cuts would have killed a fellow like General Wolfe. "'Mr. Poulter,' Tom would say, at any allusion to the sword, "'I wish you'd bring your sword and do the sword exercise.' For a long while Mr. Poulter only shook his head in a significant manner at this request, and smiled patronizingly, as Jupiter may have done when Semele urged her too ambitious request. But one afternoon, when a sudden shower of heavy rain had detained Mr. Poulter twenty minutes longer than usual at the Black Swan, the sword was brought, just for Tom to look at. "'And is this the real sword you fought with in all the battles, Mr. Poulter?' said Tom, handling the hilt. "'Has it ever cut a Frenchman's head off?' "'Head off? Ah, and would, if he'd had three heads!' "'But you had a gun and bayonet besides,' said Tom. "'I should like the gun and bayonet best, because you could shoot em first and spear em after. Bang! Pssst!' Tom gave the requisite pantomime to indicate the double enjoyment of pulling the trigger and thrusting the spear. "'Ah, but the sword's the thing when you come to close fighting!' said Mr. Poulter, involuntarily falling in with Tom's enthusiasm, and drawing the sword so suddenly that Tom leaped back with much agility. "'Oh, but, Mr. Poulter, if you're going to do the exercise,' said Tom, a little conscious that he had not stood his ground as became an Englishman, "'let me go and call Philip. He'll like to see you, you know.' "'What the humpbacked lad!' said Mr. Poulter contemptuously. "'What's the use of his looking on?' "'Oh, but he knows a great deal about fighting,' said Tom, "'and how they used to fight with bows and arrows and battle-axes.' "'Let him come, then. <laughs> I'll show him something different from his bows and arrows,' said Mr. Poulter, coughing, and drawing himself up, while he gave a little preliminary play to his wrist. Tom ran into Philip, who was enjoying his afternoon's holiday at the piano in the drawing-room, picking out tunes for himself and singing them. He was supremely happy, perched like an amorphous bundle on the high stool, with his head thrown back, his eyes fixed on the opposite cornice, and his lips wide open, sending forth with all his might impromptu syllables to a tune of arms which had hit his fancy. "'Come, Philip,' said Tom, bursting in. "'Don't stay roaring la-la there. Come and see old Poulter do his sword exercise in the carriage-house.' The jar of this interruption, the discord of Tom's tones coming across the notes to which Philip was vibrating in soul and body, would have been enough to unhinge his temper, even if there had been no question of Poulter the drilling-master. And Tom— in the hurry of seizing something to say, to prevent Mr. Poulter from thinking he was afraid of the sword when he sprang away from it, had alighted on this proposition to fetch Philip, though he knew well enough that Philip hated to hear him mention his drilling lessons. Tom would never have done so inconsiderate a thing except under the severe stress of his personal pride. Philip shuddered visibly as he paused from his music, then, turning red, he said, with violent passion, "'Get away, you lumbering idiot! Don't come bellowing at me! You're not fit to speak to anything but a cart horse!' It was not the first time Philip had been made angry by him, but Tom had never before been assailed with verbal missiles that he understood so well. "'I'm fit to speak to something better than you, you poor-spirited imp,' said Tom, lighting up immediately at Philip's fire. "'You know I won't hit you, because you're no better than a girl. 
but I'm an honest man's son, and your father's a rogue. Everybody says so. Tom flung out of the room and slammed the door after him, made strangely heedless by his anger. For to slam doors within the hearing of Mrs. Stelling, who was probably not far off, was an offence only to be wiped out by twenty lines of Virgil. In fact, that lady did presently descend from her room, in double wonder at the noise and the subsequent cessation of Philip's music. She found him lying in a heap on the hassock, and crying bitterly. "'What's the matter, Wakem? What was that noise about? Who slammed the door?' Philip looked up, and hastily dried his eyes. "'It was Tulliver who came in, to ask me to go out with him.' "'And what are you in trouble about?' said Mrs. Stelling. Philip was not her favourite of the two pupils. He was less obliging than Tom, who was made useful in many ways. Still, his father paid more than Mr. Tulliver did, and she meant him to feel that she behaved exceedingly well to him. Philip, however, met her advances towards a good understanding, very much as a caressed mollusk meets an invitation to show himself out of his shell. Mrs. Stelling was not a loving, tender-hearted woman. She was a woman whose skirt sat well, who adjusted her waist and patted her curls with a preoccupied air when she inquired after your welfare. These things, doubtless, represent a great social power, but it is not the power of love, and no other power could win Philip from his personal reserve. He said, in answer to her question, my toothache came on and made me hysterical again. This had been the fact once, and Philip was glad of the recollection. It was like an inspiration to enable him to excuse his crying. He had to accept eau de cologne and to refuse creosote in consequence, but that was easy. Meanwhile, Tom who had for the first time sent a poisoned arrow into Philip's heart, had returned to the carriage-house, where he found Mr. Poulter, with a fixed and earnest eye, wasting the perfections of his sword exercise on probably observant but inappreciative rats. But Mr. Poulter was a host in himself, that is to say, he admired himself more than a whole army of spectators could have admired him. He took no notice of Tom's return, being too entirely absorbed in the cut and thrust, the solemn one, two, three, four, and Tom, not without a slight feeling of alarm at Mr. Poulter's fixed eye and hungry-looking sword, which seemed impatient for something else to cut besides the air, admired the performance from as great a distance as possible. It was not until Mr. Poulter paused and wiped the perspiration from his forehead that Tom felt the full charm of the sword exercise, and wished it to be repeated. "'Mr. Poulter,' said Tom, when the sword was finally being sheathed, "'I wish you'd lend me your sword a little while to keep.' "'No, no, young gentleman,' said Mr. Poulter, shaking his head decidedly. "'You might do yourself some mischief with it.' "'No, I'm sure I wouldn't. "'I'm sure I'd take care and not hurt myself. "'I shouldn't take it out of the sheath much. "'But I could ground arms with it and all that. "'No, no, it won't do, I tell you. "'It won't do,' said Mr. Poulter, preparing to depart. "'What did Mr. Stelling say to me?' "'Oh, I say, do, Mr. Poulter.' "'I'd give you my five-shilling piece if you'd let me keep the sword a week.' "'Look here,' said Tom, reaching out the attractively large round of silver. The young dog calculated the effect as well as if he had been a philosopher. "'Well,' said Mr. Poulter, with still deeper gravity, "'you must keep it out of sight, you know.' "'Oh, yes, I'll keep it under the bed.' said Tom eagerly, or else at the bottom of my large box. 
let me see and let me see now whether you can draw it out of the sheath without hurting yourself that process having been gone through more than once mr poulter felt he had acted with scrupulous conscientiousness and said well now master tulliver if i take the crown piece it is to make sure as you'll do no mischief with the sword oh no indeed mr poulter said tom delightedly handing him the crown piece and grasping the sword which he thought might have been lighter with advantage but if mr stelling catches you carrying it in said mr poulter pocketing the crown piece provisionally while he raised this new doubt oh he always keeps in his upstairs study on saturday afternoons said tom who disliked anything sneaking but was not disinclined to a little stratagem in a worthy cause so he carried off the sword in triumph mixed with dread dread that he might encounter mr or mrs stelling to his bedroom where after some consideration he hid it in the closet behind some hanging clothes that night he fell asleep in the thought that he would astonish maggie with it when she came tie it round his waist with his red comforter and make her believe that the sword was his own and that he was going to be a soldier there was nobody but maggie who would be silly enough to believe him or whom he dared allow to know that he had a sword and maggie was really coming next week to see tom before she went to a boarding school with lucy if you think a lad of thirteen would not have been so childish you must be an exceptionally wise man who although you are devoted to a civil calling requiring you to look bland rather than formidable yet never since you had a beard threw yourself into a martial attitude and frowned before the looking-glass it is doubtful whether our soldiers would be maintained if there were not pacific people at home who like to fancy themselves soldiers war like other dramatic spectacles might possibly cease for want of a public end of chapter 4 of book 2nd recording by tom denham Chapter Five of Book Second of The Mill on the Floss by George Eliot. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Tom Denham. Maggie's Second Visit. This last breach between the two lads was not readily mended, and for some time they spoke to each other no more than was necessary. Their natural antipathy of temperament made resentment an easy passage to hatred, and in Philip the transition seemed to have begun. There was no malignity in his disposition, but there was a susceptibility that made him peculiarly liable to a strong sense of repulsion. The ox—we may venture to assert it on the authority of a great classic—is not given to use his teeth as an instrument of attack. And Tom was an excellent bovine lad, who ran at questionable objects in a truly ingenuous bovine manner, but he had blundered on Philip's tenderest point, and had caused him as much acute pain as if he had studied the means with the nicest precision and the most envenomed spite. Tom saw no reason why they should not make up this quarrel as they had done many others, by behaving as if nothing had happened. For though he had never before said to Philip that his father was a rogue, this idea had so habitually made part of his feeling as to the relation between himself and his dubious schoolfellow, whom he could neither like nor dislike, that the mere utterance did not make such an epoch to him as it did to Philip and he had a right to say so, when Philip hectored over him, and called him names. But perceiving that his first advances towards amity were not met, 
he relapsed into his least favourable disposition towards Philip, and resolved never to appeal to him either about drawing or exercises again. They were only so far civil to each other as was necessary to prevent their state of feud from being observed by Mr. Stelling, who would have put down such nonsense with great vigour. When Maggie came, however, she could not help looking with growing interest at the new schoolfellow, although he was the son of that wicked lawyer Wakeham who made her father so angry. She had arrived in the middle of school hours, and had sat by while Philip went through his lessons with Mr. Stelling. Tom, some weeks ago, had sent her word that Philip knew no end of stories, not stupid stories like hers, and she was convinced now from her own observation that he must be very clever. She hoped he would think her rather clever too when she came to talk to him. Maggie, moreover, had rather a tenderness for deformed things. She preferred the wry-necked lambs, because it seemed to her that the lambs, which were quite strong and well made, wouldn't mind so much about being petted, and she was especially fond of petting objects that would think it very delightful to be petted by her. She loved Tom very dearly, but she often wished that he cared more about her loving him. "'I think Philip Wakeham seems a nice boy, Tom,' she said, when they went out of the study together into the garden to pass the interval before dinner. "'He couldn't choose his father, you know, and I've read of very bad men who had good sons as well as good parents who had bad children. And if Philip is good—' I think we ought to be the more sorry for him because his father is not a good man. You like him, don't you? Oh, he's a queer fellow, said Tom curtly, and he's as sulky as can be with me, because I told him his father was a rogue. And I'd a right to tell him so, for it was true, and he began it with calling me names. But you stop here by yourself a bit, Magsy, will you? I've got something I want to do upstairs. "'Can't I go, too?' said Maggie, who, in this first day of meeting again, loved Tom's shadow. "'No, it's something I'll tell you about by and by. Not yet,' said Tom, skipping away. In the afternoon the boys were at their books in the study, preparing the morrow's lessons, that they might have a holiday in the evening in honour of Maggie's arrival.' Tom was hanging over his Latin grammar, moving his lips inaudibly like a strict but impatient Catholic repeating his tale of paternosters. And Philip, at the other end of the room, was busy with two volumes, with a look of contented diligence that excited Maggie's curiosity. He did not look at all as if he were learning a lesson. She sat on a low stool at nearly a right angle with the two boys, watching first one and then the other, and Philip, looking off his book once towards the fireplace, caught the pair of questioning dark eyes fixed upon him. He thought this sister of Tulliver's seemed a nice little thing, quite unlike her brother. He wished he had a little sister. What was it, he wondered, that made Maggie's dark eyes remind him of the stories about princesses being turned into animals. I think it was that her eyes were full of unsatisfied intelligence, and unsatisfied, beseeching affection. "'I say, Magsy,' said Tom at last, shutting his books and putting them away with the energy and decision of a perfect master in the art of leaving off. "'I've done my lessons now. Come upstairs with me.' "'What is it?' said Maggie, when they were outside the door, a slight suspicion crossing her mind as she remembered Tom's preliminary visit upstairs. "'It isn't a trick you're going to play me now?' "'No, no, Maggie,' said Tom, 
in his most coaxing tone. "'It's something you like ever so.' He put his arm round her neck, and she put hers round his waist, and twined together in this way, they went upstairs. "'I say, Magsy, you must not tell anybody, you know,' said Tom, "'else I shall get fifty lines.' "'Is it alive?' said Maggie, whose imagination had settled for the moment on the idea that Tom kept a ferret clandestinely. "'Oh, I shan't tell you,' said he. "'Now you go into that corner and hide your face while I reach it out,' he added, as he locked the bedroom door behind them. "'I'll tell you when to turn round. You mustn't squeal out, you know.' "'But if you frighten me, I shall,' said Maggie, beginning to look rather serious. "'You won't be frightened, you silly thing,' said Tom. "'Go and hide your face, and mind you don't peep.' "'Of course I shan't peep,' said Maggie disdainfully, and she buried her face in the pillow like a person of strict honour. But Tom looked round warily as he walked to the closet. Then he stepped into the narrow space and almost closed the door. Maggie kept her face buried without the aid of principle, for in that dream-suggestive attitude she had soon forgotten where she was, and her thoughts were busy with the poor deformed boy who was so clever when Tom called out, "'Now then, Magsy!' Nothing but long meditation and preconcerted arrangement of effects could have enabled Tom to present so striking a figure as he did to Maggie when she looked up. Dissatisfied with the pacific aspect of a face which had no more than the faintest hint of flaxen eyebrow, together with a pair of amiable blue-grey eyes and round pink cheeks that refused to look formidable, let him frown as he would before the looking-glass. Philip had once told him of a man who had a horseshoe frown, and Tom had tried with all his frowning might to make a horseshoe on his forehead. He had had recourse to that unfailing source of the terrible, burnt cork, and had made himself a pair of black eyebrows that met in a satisfactory manner over his nose, and were matched by a less carefully adjusted blackness about the chin. He had wound a red handkerchief round his cloth cap to give it the air of a turban, and his red comforter across his breast as a scarf, an amount of red which, with the tremendous frown on his brow, and the decision with which he grasped the sword as he held it with its point resting on the ground, would suffice to convey an approximate idea of his fierce and bloodthirsty disposition. Maggie looked bewildered for a moment, and Tom enjoyed that moment keenly, but in the next she laughed, clapped her hands together, and said, "'Oh, Tom, you've made yourself like Bluebeard at the show!' It was clear she had not been struck with the presence of the sword. It was not unsheathed. Her frivolous mind required a more direct appeal to its sense of the terrible, and Tom prepared for his master-stroke. Frowning with a double amount of intention, if not of corrugation, he carefully drew the sword from its sheath and pointed it at Maggie. "'Oh, Tom, please don't!' exclaimed Maggie, in a tone of suppressed dread, shrinking away from him into the opposite corner. "'I shall scream! I'm sure I shall! Oh, don't! I wish I'd never come upstairs!' The corners of Tom's mouth showed an inclination to a smile of complacency, that was immediately checked as inconsistent with the severity of a great warrior. Slowly he let down the scabbard on the floor, lest it should make too much noise, and then said sternly, "'I'm the Duke of Wellington! March!' stamping forward with the right leg a little bent, and the sword still pointing towards Maggie, 
who, trembling and with tear-filled eyes, got upon the bed as the only means of widening the space between them. Tom, happy in this spectator of his military performances, even though the spectator was only Maggie, proceeded, with the utmost exertion of his force, to such an exhibition of the cut and thrust as would necessarily be expected of the Duke of Wellington. "'Tom, I will not bear it! I will scream!' said Maggie at the first movement of the sword. "'You'll hurt yourself! You'll cut your head off!' "'One, two, said Tom resolutely, though at two his wrist trembled a little. Three came more slowly, and with it the sword swung downwards, and Maggie gave a loud shriek. The sword had fallen with its edge on Tom's foot, and in a moment after he had fallen too. Maggie leaped from the bed, still shrieking, and immediately there was a rush of footsteps towards the room. Mr. Stelling, from his upstairs study, was the first to enter. He found both the children on the floor. Tom had fainted, and Maggie was shaking him by the collar of his jacket, screaming with wild eyes. She thought he was dead, poor child, and yet she shook him as if that would bring him back to life. In another minute she was sobbing with joy because Tom had opened his eyes. She couldn't sorrow yet that he had hurt his foot. It seemed as if all happiness lay in his being alive. End of chapter 5 of Book 2nd Recording by Tom Denham Chapter 6 of Book 2nd of The Mill on the Floss by George Eliot This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Tom Denham A Love Scene Poor Tom bore his severe pain heroically, and was resolute in not telling of Mr. Poulter more than was unavoidable. The five-shilling piece remained a secret even to Maggie. But there was a terrible dread weighing on his mind, so terrible that he dared not even ask the question which might bring the fatal yes. He dared not ask the surgeon or Mr. Stelling, "'Shall I be lame, sir?' He mastered himself so as not to cry out at the pain, but when his foot had been dressed, and he was left alone with Maggie seated by his bedside, the children sobbed together with their heads laid on the same pillow. Tom was thinking of himself, walking about on crutches like the wheelwright's son. Maggie, who did not guess what was in his mind, sobbed for company. It had not occurred to the surgeon or to Mr. Stelling to anticipate this dread in Tom's mind, and to reassure him by hopeful words. But Philip watched the surgeon out of the house, and waylaid Mr. Stelling to ask the very question that Tom had not dared to ask for himself. "'I beg your pardon, sir, but does Mr. Askern say Tulliver will be lame?' "'Oh, no, oh, no,' said Mr. Stelling, "'not permanently, only for a little while.' "'Did he tell Tulliver so, sir, do you think?' "'No, nothing was said to him on the subject.' "'Then may I go and tell him, sir?' "'Yes, to be sure. Now you mention it, I dare say he may be troubling about that. Go to his bedroom, but be very quiet at present.' It had been Philip's first thought when he heard of the accident. "'Will Tulliver be lame? It will be very hard for him if he is.' and Tom's hitherto unforgiven offences were washed out by that pity. Philip felt that they were no longer in a state of repulsion, but were being drawn into a common current of suffering and sad privation. His imagination did not dwell on the outward calamity and its future effect on Tom's life, but it made vividly present to him the probable state of Tom's feeling. He had only lived fourteen years— but those years had, most of them, 
been steeped in the sense of a lot irremediably hard. "'Mr. Askin says you'll soon be all right again, Tulliver. Did you know?' he said rather timidly, as he stepped gently up to Tom's bed. "'I've just been to ask Mr. Stelling, and he says you'll walk as well as ever again, by and by.' Tom looked up with that momentary stopping of the breath which comes with a sudden joy. Then he gave a long sigh, and turned his blue-grey eyes straight on Philip's face, as he had not done for a fortnight or more. As for Maggie, this intimation of a possibility she had not thought of before affected her as a new trouble— the bare idea of Tom's being always lame overpowered the assurance that such a misfortune was not likely to befall him, and she clung to him and cried afresh. "'Don't be a little silly, Magsy,' said Tom tenderly, feeling very brave now. "'I shall soon get well.' "'Good-bye, Tulliver,' said Philip, putting out his small, delicate hand which Tom clasped immediately with his more substantial fingers. "'I say,' said Tom, "'ask Mr. Selling to let you come and sit with me sometimes, till I get up again, wake him, and tell me about Robert Bruce, you know.' After that, Philip spent all his time out of school hours with Tom and Maggie. Tom liked to hear fighting stories as much as ever, but he insisted strongly on the fact that those great fighters who did so many wonderful things and came off unhurt wore excellent armour from head to foot, which made fighting easy work, he considered. He should not have hurt his foot if he had had an iron shoe on. He listened with great interest to a new story of Philip's about a man who had a very bad wound in his foot, and cried out so dreadfully with the pain that his friends could bear with him no longer, but put him ashore on a desert island, with nothing but some wonderful poisoned arrows to kill animals with for food. "'I didn't roar out a bit, you know,' Tom said, "'and I dare say my foot was as bad as his. It's cowardly to roar.' But Maggie would have it, that when anything hurt you very much, it was quite permissible to cry out, and it was cruel of people not to bear it. She wanted to know if Philoctetes had a sister, and why she didn't go with him on the desert island and take care of him. One day, soon after Philip had told this story, he and Maggie were in the study alone together while Tom's foot was being dressed. Philip was at his books, and Maggie, after sauntering idly round the room, not caring to do anything in particular, because she would soon go to Tom again, went and leaned on the table near Philip to see what he was doing, for they were quite old friends now, and perfectly at home with each other. "'What are you reading about in Greek?' she said. It's poetry, I can see that, because the lines are so short. It's about Philoctetes, the lame man I was telling you of yesterday, he answered, resting his head on his hand, and looking at her, as if he were not at all sorry to be interrupted. Maggie, in her absent way, continued to lean forward, resting on her arms and moving her feet about, while her dark eyes got more and more fixed and vacant, as if she had quite forgotten Philip and his book. "'Maggie,' said Philip, after a minute or two, still leaning on his elbow and looking at her, "'if you had a brother like me, do you think you should have loved him as well as Tom?' Maggie started a little on being roused from her reverie, and said, "'What?' Philip repeated his question. "'Oh, yes, better,' she answered immediately. "'No, not better, because I don't think I could love you better than Tom. But I should be so sorry, so sorry for you.' Philip coloured. He had meant to imply, 
would she love him as well in spite of his deformity? And yet when she alluded to it so plainly, he winced under her pity. Maggie, young as she was, felt her mistake. Hitherto she had instinctively behaved as if she were quite unconscious of Philip's deformity. Her own keen sensitiveness and experience under family criticism sufficed to teach her this, as well as if she had been directed by the most finished breeding. "'But you are so very clever, Philip!' "'And you can play and sing,' she added quickly. "'I wish you were my brother. I'm very fond of you, and you would stay at home with me when Tom went out, and you would teach me everything, wouldn't you? Greek and everything. "'But you'll soon go away and go to school, Maggie,' said Philip, "'and then you'll forget all about me and not care for me any more. And then I shall see you when you're grown up, and you'll hardly take any notice of me.' "'Oh, no, I shan't forget you, I'm sure,' said Maggie, shaking her head very seriously. "'I never forget anything, and I think about everybody when I'm away from them. "'I think about poor Yap. "'He's got a lump in his throat, and Luke says he'll die. "'Only don't you tell Tom, because it will vex him so. "'You never saw Yap. He's a queer little dog.' "'Nobody cares about him but Tom and me.' "'Do you care as much about me as you do about Yap, Maggie?' said Philip, smiling rather sadly. "'Oh, yes, I should think so,' said Maggie, laughing. "'I'm very fond of you, Maggie. I shall never forget you,' said Philip. "'And when I'm very unhappy, I shall always think of you.' "'and wish I had a sister with dark eyes, just like yours.' "'Why do you like my eyes?' said Maggie, well pleased. She had never heard any one but her father speak of her eyes as if they had merit. "'I don't know,' said Philip. "'They're not like any other eyes. "'They seem trying to speak, trying to speak kindly. "'I don't like other people to look at me much.' "'But I like you to look at me, Maggie.' "'Why, I think you're fonder of me than Tom is,' said Maggie, rather sorrowfully. Then, wondering how she could convince Philip that she could like him just as well, although he was crooked, she said, "'Should you like me to kiss you, as I do Tom? I will, if you like.' "'Yes, very much. Nobody kisses me.' Maggie put her arm round his neck and kissed him quite earnestly. "'There now,' she said, "'I shall always remember you, and kiss you when I see you again, if it's ever so long. But I'll go now, because I think Mr. Askin's done with Tom's foot.' When their father came the second time, Maggie said to him, "'Oh, father,' "'Philip Wakeham is so very good to Tom. "'He is such a clever boy, and I do love him. "'And you love him too, Tom, don't you? "'Say you love him,' she added entreatingly. "'Tom coloured a little as he looked at his father and said, "'I shan't be friends with him when I leave school, father, "'but we've made it up now, since my foot has been bad, "'and he's taught me to play at draughts, and I can beat him.' "'Well, well,' said Mr. Tulliver, "'if he's good to you, try and make him amends, and be good to him. "'He's a poor, crooked creature, and takes after his dead mother. "'But don't you be getting too thick with him. "'He's got his father's blood in him, too. "'Aye, aye, the grey colt may chance to kick like his black sire.' The jarring natures of the two boys affected what Mr. Tulliver's admonition alone might have failed to effect. In spite of Philip's new kindness, and Tom's answering regard in this time of his trouble, they never became close friends. When Maggie was gone, and when Tom by and by began to walk about as usual, 
the friendly warmth that had been kindled by pity and gratitude died out by degrees, and left them in their old relation to each other. Philip was often peevish and contemptuous, and Tom's more specific and kindly impressions gradually melted into the old background of suspicion and dislike towards him as a queer fellow, a humpback, and the son of a rogue. If boys and men are to be welded together in the glow of transient feeling, they must be made of metal that will mix, else they inevitably fall asunder when the heat dies out. End of chapter 6 of Book Second Recording by Tom Denham Chapter Seven of Book Second of The Mill on the Floss by George Eliot. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Tom Denham. The Golden Gates Are Past. So Tom went on even to the fifth half year till he was turned sixteen at King's Lawton, while Maggie was growing with a rapidity which her aunts considered highly reprehensible, at Miss Furness's boarding-school in the ancient town of Laysom on the floss with Cousin Lucy for her companion. In her early letters to Tom she had always sent her love to Philip, and asked many questions about him, which were answered by brief sentences about Tom's toothache and a turf-house which he was helping to build in the garden, with other items of that kind— she was pained to hear Tom say in the holidays that Philip was as queer as ever again, and often cross. They were no longer very good friends, she perceived, and when she reminded Tom that he ought always to love Philip for being so good to him when his foot was bad, he answered, "'Well, it isn't my fault. I don't do anything to him.' She hardly ever saw Philip during the remainder of their school life. In the midsummer holidays he was always away at the seaside, and at Christmas she could only meet him at long intervals in the streets of St. Ogg's. When they did meet she remembered her promise to kiss him, but as a young lady who had been at a boarding-school she knew now that such a greeting was out of the question, and Philip would not expect it. The promise was void, like so many other sweet illusory promises of our childhood, void as promises made in Eden before the seasons were divided, and when the starry blossoms grew side by side with the ripening peach, impossible to be fulfilled when the golden gates had been passed. But when their father was actually engaged in the long-threatened lawsuit, and Wakeham as the agent at once of Pivart and old Harry, was acting against him, even Maggie felt with some sadness that they were not likely ever to have any intimacy with Philip again. The very name of Wakeham made her father angry, and she had once heard him say that if that crook-backed son lived to inherit his father's ill-gotten gains, there would be a curse upon him. "'Have as little to do with him at school as ye can, my lad,' he said to Tom, and the command was obeyed the more easily because Mr. Stelling by this time had two additional pupils, for though this gentleman's rise in the world was not of that meteor-like rapidity which the admirers of his extemporaneous eloquence had expected for a preacher whose voice demanded so wide a sphere— he had yet enough of growing prosperity to enable him to increase his expenditure in continued disproportion to his income. As for Tom's school course, it went on with mill-like monotony, his mind continuing to move with a slow, half-stifled pulse in a medium of uninteresting or unintelligible ideas but each vacation he brought home larger and larger drawings 
with the satiny rendering of landscape and water-colours in vivid greens, together with manuscript books full of exercises and problems, in which the handwriting was all the finer because he gave his whole mind to it. Each vacation he brought home a new book or two, indicating his progress through different stages of history, Christian doctrine, and Latin literature and that passage was not entirely without result besides the possession of the books. Tom's ear and tongue had become accustomed to a great many words and phrases which are understood to be signs of an educated condition, and though he had never really applied his mind to any one of his lessons, the lessons had left a deposit of vague, fragmentary, ineffectual notions. Mr. Tulliver, seeing signs of acquirement beyond the reach of his own criticism, thought it was probably all right with Tom's education. He observed, indeed, that there were no maps, and not enough summing, but he made no formal complaint to Mr. Stelling. It was a puzzling business, this schooling, and if he took Tom away, where could he send him with better effect? By the time Tom had reached his last quarter at King's Lawton, the years had made striking changes in him since the day we saw him returning from Mr. Jacob's academy. He was a tall youth now, carrying himself without the least awkwardness, and speaking without more shyness than was a becoming symptom of blended diffidence and pride. He wore his tail-coat and his stand-up collars, and watched the down on his lip with eager impatience, looking every day at his virgin razor, with which he had provided himself in the last holidays. Philip had already left, at the autumn quarter, that he might go to the south for the winter, for the sake of his health, and this change helped to give Tom the unsettled, exultant feeling that usually belongs to the last months before leaving school. This quarter, too, there was some hope of his father's lawsuit being decided. That made the prospect of home more entirely pleasurable. For Tom, who had gathered his view of the case from his father's conversation, had no doubt that Pivart would be beaten. Tom had not heard anything from home for some weeks, a fact which did not surprise him, for his father and mother were not apt to manifest their affection in unnecessary letters, when, to his great surprise, on the morning of a dark, cold day near the end of November, he was told, soon after entering the study at nine o'clock, that his sister was in the drawing-room. It was Mrs. Stelling who had come into the study to tell him, and she left him to enter the drawing-room alone. Maggie, too, was tall now, with braided and coiled hair. She was almost as tall as Tom, though she was only thirteen, and she really looked older than he did at that moment. She had thrown off her bonnet, her heavy braids were pushed back from her forehead, as if it would not bear that extra load, and her young face had a strangely worn look, as her eyes turned anxiously towards the door. When Tom entered, she did not speak, but only went up to him, put her arms round his neck, and kissed him earnestly. He was used to various moods of hers, and felt no alarm at the unusual seriousness of her greeting. "'Why, how is it you're come so early this cold morning, Maggie? Did you come in the gig?' said Tom, as she backed towards the sofa, and drew him to her side. "'No, I came by the coach. I've walked from the turnpike.' "'But how is it you're not at school? The holidays have not begun yet.' "'Father wanted me at home,' said Maggie, with a slight trembling of the lip. "'I came home three or four days ago.' "'Isn't my father well?' said Tom, rather anxiously. "'Not quite,' said Maggie. "'He's very unhappy, Tom. "'The lawsuit is ended, and I came to tell you "'because I thought it would be better for you to know it before you came home, "'and I didn't like only to send you a letter.' 
"'My father hasn't lost,' said Tom hastily, springing from the sofa, and standing before Maggie with his hands suddenly thrust in his pockets. "'Yes, dear Tom,' said Maggie, looking up at him with trembling. Tom was silent a minute or two, with his eyes fixed on the floor. Then he said, "'My father will have to pay a good deal of money, then.' "'Yes,' said Maggie, rather faintly. "'Well, it can't be helped,' said Tom bravely, not translating the loss of a large sum of money into any tangible results. "'But my father's very much vexed, I dare say,' he added, looking at Maggie, and thinking that her agitated face was only part of her girlish way of taking things. "'Yes,' said Maggie again faintly. Then, urged to fuller speech by Tom's freedom from apprehension, she said loudly and rapidly, as if the words would burst from her, "'Oh, Tom, he will lose the mill and the land and everything. He will have nothing left!' Tom's eyes flashed out one look of surprise at her before he turned pale and trembled visibly. He said nothing, but sat down on the sofa again, looking vaguely out of the opposite window. Anxiety about the future had never entered Tom's mind. His father had always ridden a good horse, kept a good house, and had the cheerful, confident air of a man who has plenty of property to fall back upon. Tom had never dreamed that his father would fail. That was a form of misfortune which he had always heard spoken of as a deep disgrace, and disgrace was an idea that he could not associate with any of his relations, least of all with his father. A proud sense of family respectability was part of the very air Tom had been born and brought up in. He knew there were people in St. Ogg's who made a show without money to support it, and he had always heard such people spoken of by his own friends with contempt and reprobation. He had a strong belief, which was a lifelong habit, and required no definite evidence to rest on, that his father could spend a great deal of money if he chose, and since his education at Mr. Stelling's had given him a more expensive view of life, he had often thought that when he got older he would make a figure in the world, with his horse and dogs and saddle and other accoutrements of a fine young man and show himself equal to any of his contemporaries at St. Ogg's, who might consider themselves a grade above him in society, because their fathers were professional men, or had large oil mills. As to the prognostics and head-shaking of his aunts and uncles, they had never produced the least effect on him, except to make him think that aunts and uncles were disagreeable society. He had heard them find fault in much the same way as long as he could remember. His father knew better than they did. The down had come on Tom's lip, yet his thoughts and expectations had been hitherto only the reproduction in changed forms of the boyish dreams in which he had lived three years ago. He was awakened now with a violent shock. Maggie was frightened at Tom's pale, trembling silence. There was something else to tell him, something worse. She threw her arms round him at last, and said, with a half-sob, "'Oh, Tom! Dear, dear Tom! Don't fret too much! Try and bear it well!' Tom turned his cheek passively to meet her entreating kisses, and there gathered a moisture in his eyes which he just rubbed away with his hand. The action seemed to rouse him, for he shook himself and said, "'I shall go home with you, Maggie. Didn't my father say I was to go?' "'No, Tom, father didn't wish it,' said Maggie, her anxiety about his feeling helping her to master her agitation." What would he do when she told him all? But mother wants you to come. Poor mother! She cries so! Oh, Tom, it's very dreadful at home!" 
Maggie's lips grew whiter, and she began to tremble almost as Tom had done. The two poor things clung closer to each other, both trembling, the one at an unshapen fear, the other at the image of a terrible certainty. When Maggie spoke, it was hardly above a whisper. And, and, poor father! Maggie could not utter it, but the suspense was intolerable to Tom. A vague idea of going to prison as a consequence of debt was the shape his fears had begun to take. "'Where's my father?' he said impatiently. "'Tell me, Maggie!' "'He's at home,' said Maggie, finding it easier to reply to that question. "'But,' she added after a pause, "'not himself. He fell off his horse. He has known nobody but me ever since. He seems to have lost his senses. Oh, father, father!' With these last words Maggie's sobs burst forth with the more violence for the previous struggle against them. Tom felt that pressure of the heart which forbids tears. He had no distinct vision of their troubles as Maggie had, who had been at home. He only felt the crushing weight of what seemed unmitigated misfortune. He tightened his arm almost convulsively round Maggie as she sobbed, but his face looked rigid and tearless. His eyes blank, as if a black curtain of cloud had suddenly fallen on his path. But Maggie soon checked herself abruptly. A single thought had acted on her like a startling sound. "'We must set out, Tom. We must not stay. Father will miss me. We must be at the turnpike at ten to meet the coach.' She said this with hasty decision, rubbing her eyes, and rising to seize her bonnet. Tom at once felt the same impulse, and rose too. "'Wait a minute, Maggie,' he said. "'I must speak to Mr. Stelling, and then we'll go.' He thought he must go to the study where the pupils were, but on his way he met Mr. Stelling, who had heard from his wife that Maggie appeared to be in trouble when she asked for her brother, and now that he thought the brother and sister had been alone long enough, was coming to inquire and offer his sympathy. "'Please, sir, I must go home,' Tom said abruptly, as he met Mr. Stelling in the passage. "'I must go back with my sister directly. My father's lost his lawsuit. He's lost all his property.' and he's very ill." Mr. Stelling felt like a kind-hearted man. He foresaw a probable money loss for himself, but this had no appreciable share in his feeling, while he looked with grave pity at the brother and sister for whom youth and sorrow had begun together. When he knew how Maggie had come, and how eager she was to get home again, he hurried their departure only whispering something to Mrs. Stelling, who had followed him, and who immediately left the room. Tom and Maggie were standing on the doorstep, ready to set out, when Mrs. Stelling came with a little basket, which she hung on Maggie's arm, saying, "'Do remember to eat something on the way, dear.' Maggie's heart went out towards this woman, whom she had never liked, and she kissed her silently. It was the first sign within the poor child of that new sense which is the gift of sorrow, that susceptibility to the bare offices of humanity which raises them into a bond of loving fellowship, as to haggard men among the icebergs the mere presence of an ordinary comrade stirs the deep fountains of affection. Mr. Stelling put his hand on Tom's shoulder and said, "'God bless you, my boy. Let me know how you get on.' Then he pressed Maggie's hand, but there were no audible good-byes. Tom had so often thought how joyful he should be the day he left school for good, and now his school years seemed like a holiday that had come to an end. 
the two slight youthful figures soon grew indistinct on the distant road, were soon lost behind the projecting hedgerow. They had gone forth together into their new life of sorrow, and they would never more see the sunshine undimmed by remembered cares. They had entered the thorny wilderness, and the golden gates of their childhood had for ever closed behind them. End of chapter seven of book second. End of book second. Recording by Tom Denham. Chapter one of book third of the Mill on the Floss by George Eliot. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Tom Denham. What had happened at home? When Mr. Tulliver first knew the fact that the lawsuit was decided against him, and that Pivart and Wakeham were triumphant, every one who happened to observe him at the time thought that for so confident and hot-tempered a man he bore the blow remarkably well. He thought so himself. He thought he was going to show that if Wakeham or anybody else considered him crushed, they would find themselves mistaken. He could not refuse to see that the costs of this protracted suit would take more than he possessed to pay them, but he appeared to himself to be full of expedients by which he could ward off any results but such as were tolerable, and could avoid the appearance of breaking down in the world. All the obstinacy and defiance of his nature, driven out of their old channel, found a vent for themselves in the immediate formation of plans by which he would meet his difficulties, and remain Mr. Tulliver of Dalcott Mill in spite of them. There was such a rush of projects in his brain, that it was no wonder his face was flushed when he came away from his talk with his attorney, Mr. Gore, and mounted his horse to ride home from Lindum. There was Furley, who held the mortgage on the land. A reasonable fellow, who would see his own interest, Mr. Tulliver was convinced, and who would be glad not only to purchase the whole estate, including the mill and homestead, but would accept Mr. Tulliver as tenant, and be willing to advance money to be repaid with high interest out of the profits of the business, which would be made over to him, Mr. Tulliver only taking enough barely to maintain himself and his family. Who would neglect such a profitable investment? Certainly not Furley, for Mr. Tulliver had determined that Furley should meet his plans with the utmost alacrity, and there are men whose brains have not yet been dangerously heated by the loss of a lawsuit, who are apt to see in their own interest or desires a motive for other men's actions. There was no doubt in the miller's mind that Furley would do just what was desirable, and if he did, why things would not be so very much worse. Mr. Tulliver and his family must live more meagerly and humbly, but it would only be till the profits of the business had paid off Furley's advances, and that might be while Mr. Tulliver had still a good many years of life before him. It was clear that the costs of the suit could be paid without his being obliged to turn out of his old place and look like a ruined man. It was certainly an awkward moment in his affairs. There was that suretyship for poor Riley, who had died suddenly last April, and left his friend saddled with a debt of two hundred and fifty pounds, a fact which had helped to make Mr. Tulliver's banking-book less pleasant reading than a man might desire towards Christmas. Well, he had never been one of those poor-spirited sneaks who would refuse to give a helping hand to a fellow-traveller in this puzzling world. The really vexatious business was the fact that some months ago the creditor who had lent him the five hundred pounds to repay Mrs. Glegg had become uneasy about his money, set on by Wakeham, of course, and Mr. Tulliver, still confident that he should gain his suit, 
and finding it eminently inconvenient to raise the said sum until that desirable issue had taken place, had rashly acceded to the demand that he should give a bill of sale on his household furniture, and some other effects, as security in lieu of the bond. It was all one, he had said to himself. He should soon pay off the money, and there was no harm in giving that security any more than another. But now the consequences of this bill of sale occurred to him in a new light, and he remembered that the time was close at hand when it would be enforced unless the money were repaid. Two months ago he would have declared stoutly that he would never be beholden to his wife's friends, but now he told himself as stoutly that it was nothing but right and natural that Bessie should go to the Pullets and explain the thing to them. They would hardly let Bessie's furniture be sold, and it might be security to pull it if he advanced the money. There would, after all, be no gift or favour in the matter. Mr. Tulliver would never have asked for anything from so poor-spirited a fellow for himself, but Bessie might do so if she liked. It is precisely the proudest and most obstinate men who are the most liable to shift their position and contradict themselves in this sudden manner. Everything is easier to them than to face the simple fact that they have been thoroughly defeated, and must begin life anew. And Mr. Tulliver, you perceive, though nothing more than a superior miller and maltster, was as proud and obstinate as if he had been a very lofty personage, in whom such dispositions might be a source of that conspicuous, far-echoing tragedy which sweeps the stage in regal robes, and makes the dullest chronicler sublime. The pride and obstinacy of millers, and other insignificant people, whom you pass unnoticingly on the road every day, have their tragedy too. But it is of that unwept hidden sort that goes on from generation to generation and leaves no record. Such tragedy, perhaps, as lies in the conflicts of young souls, hungry for joy, under a lot made suddenly hard to them, under the dreariness of a home where the morning brings no promise with it, and where the unexpectant discontent of worn and disappointed parents weighs on the children like a damp, thick air, in which all the functions of life are depressed, or such tragedy as lies in the slow or sudden death that follows on a bruised passion, though it may be a death that finds only a parish funeral. There are certain animals to which tenacity of position is a law of life. They can never flourish again after a single wrench, and there are certain human beings to whom predominance is a law of life. They can only sustain humiliation so long as they can refuse to believe in it, and in their own conception predominate still. Mr. Tulliver was still predominating in his own imagination as he approached St. Ogg's, through which he had to pass on his way homeward. But what was it that suggested to him, as he saw the lacem coach entering the town, to follow it to the coach office and get the clerk there to write a letter requiring Maggie to come home the very next day? Mr. Tulliver's own hand shook too much under his excitement for him to write himself, and he wanted the letter to be given to the coachman to deliver at Miss Furness's school in the morning. There was a craving which he would not account for to himself, to have Maggie near him, without delay. She must come back by the coach to-morrow. To Mrs. Tulliver, when he got home, he would admit no difficulties, and scolded down her burst of grief on hearing that the lawsuit was lost, by angry assertions that there was nothing to grieve about. He said nothing to her that night about the bill of sale and the application to Mrs. Pullet, for he had kept her in ignorance of the nature of that transaction, and had explained the necessity for taking an inventory of the goods as a matter connected with his will. The possession of a wife conspicuously one's inferior in intellect is, like other high privileges, 
attended with a few inconveniences, and among the rest with the occasional necessity for using a little deception. The next day Mr. Tulliver was again on horseback in the afternoon on his way to Mr. Gore's office at St. Ogg's. Gore was to have seen Furley in the morning, and to have sounded him in relation to Mr. Tulliver's affairs. But he had not gone half-way when he met a clerk from Mr. Gore's office, who was bringing a letter to Mr. Tulliver. Mr. Gore had been prevented by a sudden call of business from waiting at his office to see Mr. Tulliver, according to appointment, but would be at his office at eleven to-morrow morning, and meanwhile had sent some important information by letter. "'Oh!' said Mr. Tulliver, taking the letter, but not opening it. "'Then tell Gore I'll see him to-morrow at eleven. And he turned his horse. The clerk, struck with Mr. Tulliver's glistening, excited glance, looked after him for a few moments, and then rode away. The reading of a letter was not the affair of an instant to Mr. Tulliver. He took in the sense of a statement very slowly through the medium of written or even printed characters, so he had put the letter in his pocket, thinking he would open it in his armchair at home. But by and by it occurred to him that there might be something in the letter Mrs. Tulliver must not know about, and if so, it would be better to keep it out of her sight altogether. He stopped his horse, took out the letter, and read it. It was only a short letter. The substance was that Mr. Gore had ascertained, on secret but sure authority, that Furley had been lately much straitened for money, and had parted with his securities, among the rest the mortgage on Mr. Tulliver's property, which he had transferred to Wakeham. In half an hour after this, Mr. Tulliver's own wagoner found him lying by the roadside, insensible, with an open letter near him, and his grey horse snuffing uneasily about him. When Maggie reached home that evening, in obedience to her father's call, he was no longer insensible. About an hour before he had become conscious, and after vague, vacant looks around him, had muttered something about a letter, which he presently repeated impatiently. At the instance of Mr. Turnbull, the medical man, Gore's letter was brought and laid on the bed, and the previous impatience seemed to be allayed. The stricken man lay for some time with his eyes fixed on the letter, as if he were trying to knit up his thoughts by its help. But presently a new wave of memory seemed to have come and swept the other away. He turned his eyes from the letter to the door, and after looking uneasily, as if striving to see something his eyes were too dim for, he said, THE LITTLE WENCH. He repeated the words impatiently from time to time, appearing entirely unconscious of everything except this one importunate want, and giving no sign of knowing his wife or any one else. And poor Mrs. Tulliver, her feeble faculties almost paralysed by this sudden accumulation of troubles, went backwards and forwards to the gate, to see if the laysome coach were coming, though it was not yet time. But it came at last, and set down the poor anxious girl, no longer the little wench, except to her father's fond memory. "'Oh, mother, what is the matter?' Maggie said, with pale lips, as her mother came towards her, crying. She didn't think her father was ill, because the letter had come at his dictation from the office at St. Ogg's. But Mr. Turnbull came now to meet her. A medical man is the good angel of the troubled house, and Maggie ran towards the kind old friend, whom she remembered as long as she could remember anything, with a trembling, questioning look. "'Don't alarm yourself too much, my dear,' he said, taking her hand. "'Your father—' has had a sudden attack, and has not quite recovered his memory. 
but he has been asking for you, and it will do him good to see you. Keep as quiet as you can, take off your things, and come upstairs with me. Maggie obeyed, with that terrible beating of the heart which makes existence seem simply a painful pulsation. The very quietness with which Mr. Turnbull spoke had frightened her susceptible imagination. Her father's eyes were still turned uneasily towards the door when she entered, and met the strange, yearning, helpless look that had been seeking her in vain. With a sudden flash and movement he raised himself in the bed. She rushed towards him, and clasped him with agonized kisses. Poor child! It was very early for her to know one of those supreme moments in life when all we have hoped or delighted in, all we can dread or endure, falls away from our regard as insignificant, is lost like a trivial memory in that simple, primitive love which knits us to the beings who have been nearest to us in their times of helplessness or of anguish. But that flash of recognition had been too great a strain on the father's bruised, enfeebled powers. He sank back again, in renewed insensibility and rigidity, which lasted for many hours, and was only broken by a flickering return of consciousness, in which he took passively everything that was given to him, and seemed to have a sort of infantine satisfaction in Maggie's near presence, such satisfaction as a baby has when it is returned to the nurse's lap. Mrs. Tulliver sent for her sisters, and there was much wailing and lifting up of hands below stairs. Both aunts and uncles saw that the ruin of Bessie and her family was as complete as they had ever foreboded it, and there was a general family sense that a judgment had fallen on Mr. Tulliver, which it would be an impiety to counteract by too much kindness. But Maggie heard little of this, scarcely ever leaving her father's bedside, where she sat opposite him with her hand on his. Mrs. Tulliver wanted to have Tom fetched home, and seemed to be thinking more of her boy even than of her husband, but the aunts and uncles opposed this. Tom was better at school, since Mr. Turnbull had said there was no immediate danger, he believed. But at the end of the second day, when Maggie had become more accustomed to her father's fits of insensibility, and to the expectation that he would revive from them, the thought of Tom had become urgent with her too, and when her mother sat crying at night and saying, "'My poor lad, it's nothing but right he should come home,' Maggie said, "'Let me go for him, and tell him, mother. I'll go to-morrow morning if father doesn't know me and want me. It would be so hard for Tom to come home and not know anything about it beforehand.' And the next morning Maggie went, as we have seen. Sitting on the coach on their way home, the brother and sister talked to each other in sad, interrupted whispers. "'They say Mr. Wakeham has got a mortgage or something on the land, Tom,' said Maggie. "'It was the letter with that news in it that made father ill, they think.' "'I believe that scoundrel's been planning all along to ruin my father,' said Tom, leaping from the vaguest impressions to a definite conclusion. "'I'll make him feel for it when I'm a man. "'Mind you never speak to Philip again.' "'Oh, Tom!' said Maggie, in a tone of sad remonstrance. But she had no spirit to dispute anything then, still less to vex Tom by opposing him. End of chapter 1 of Book 3rd Recording by Tom Denham Chapter 2 of Book Third of The Mill on the Floss by George Eliot. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Tom Denham. Mrs. Tulliver's Teraphim or Household Gods. When the coach set down Tom and Maggie, 
It was five hours since she had started from home, and she was thinking with some trembling that her father had perhaps missed her, and asked for the little wench in vain. She thought of no other change that might have happened. She hurried along the gravel walk and entered the house before Tom, but in the entrance she was startled by a strong smell of tobacco. The parlour door was ajar. That was where the smell came from. It was very strange. Could any visitor be smoking at a time like this? Was her mother there? If so, she must be told that Tom was come. Maggie, after this pause of surprise, was only in the act of opening the door when Tom came up, and they both looked in the parlour together. There was a coarse, dingy man, of whose face Tom had some vague recollection, sitting in his father's chair, smoking, with a jug and glass beside him. The truth flashed on Tom's mind in an instant. To have the bailiff in the house, and to be sold up, were phrases which he had been used to even as a little boy. They were part of the disgrace and misery of failing, of losing all one's money, and being ruined, sinking into the condition of poor working people. It seemed only natural this should happen, since his father had lost all his property, and he thought of no more special cause for this particular form of misfortune than the loss of the lawsuit. But the immediate presence of this disgrace was so much keener an experience to Tom than the worst form of apprehension, that he felt at this moment as if his real trouble had only just begun. It was a touch on the irritated nerve compared with its spontaneous dull aching. "'How do you do, sir?' said the man, taking the pipe out of his mouth, with rough, embarrassed civility. The two young, startled faces made him a little uncomfortable. But Tom turned away hastily without speaking. The sight was too hateful. Maggie had not understood the appearance of this stranger as Tom had. She followed him, whispering, "'Who can it be, Tom? What is the matter?' Then, with a sudden undefined dread, lest this stranger might have something to do with a change in her father, she rushed upstairs, checking herself at the bedroom door to throw off her bonnet and enter on tiptoe. All was silent there. Her father was lying, heedless of everything around him, with his eyes closed as when she had left him. A servant was there, but not her mother. "'Where's my mother?' she whispered. The servant did not know. Maggie hastened out and said to Tom, "'Father is lying quiet. Let us go and look for my mother. I wonder where she is.' Mrs. Tulliver was not downstairs, not in any of the bedrooms. There was but one room below the attic, which Maggie had left unsearched. It was the storeroom, where her mother kept all her linen and all the precious best things that were only unwrapped and brought out on special occasions. Tom, preceding Maggie as they returned along the passage, opened the door of this room and immediately said, Mother! Mrs. Tulliver was seated there with all her laid-up treasures. One of the linen chests was open. The silver teapot was unwrapped from its many folds of paper, and the best china was laid out on the top of the closed linen chest. Spoons and skewers and ladles were spread in rows on the shelves, and the poor woman was shaking her head and weeping with a bitter tension of the mouth over the mark Elizabeth Dodson on the corner of some tablecloths she held in her lap. She dropped them and started up as Tom spoke. "'Oh, my boy, my boy!' she said, clasping him round the neck. "'To think as I should live to see this day! We're ruined! Everything's going to be sold up! To think as your father should have married me to bring me to this! We've got nothing! We shall be beggars! We must go to the workhouse!' She kissed him, then seated herself again, 
and took another tablecloth on her lap, unfolding it in a little way to look at the pattern, while the children stood by in mute wretchedness, their minds quite filled for the moment with the words beggars and workhouse. "'To think of these cloths as I spun myself," she went on, lifting things out and turning them over with an excitement all the more strange and piteous, because the stout blonde woman was usually so passive. If she had been ruffled before, it was at the surface merely. And Job Haxey wove em, and brought the piece home on his back, as I remember standing at the door and seeing him come, before I ever thought of marrying your father. And the pattern as I chose myself. It bleached so beautiful, and I marked em, so as nobody ever saw such marking. They must cut the cloth to get it out, for it's a particular stitch." and they're all to be sold, and to go into strange people's houses, and perhaps be cut with the knives, and wore out before I'm dead. You'll never have one of em, my boy, she said, looking up at Tom with her eyes full of tears, and I meant em for you. I wanted you to have all of this pattern. Maggie could have had the large check. It never shows so well when the dishes are on it. Tom was touched to the quick, but there was an angry reaction immediately. His face flushed as he said, "'But will my aunts let them be sold, mother? Do they know about it? They'll never let your linen go, will they? Haven't you sent to them?' "'Yes. I sent Luke directly they'd put the baileys in, and your aunt Pullet's been, and "'Oh, dear, oh, dear, she cries so, and says your father's disgraced my family, and made it the talk of the country, and she'll buy the spotted cloths for herself, because she's never had so many as she wanted of that pattern, and they shan't go to strangers. But she's got more checks already now she can do with.' Here Mrs. Tulliver began to lay back the tablecloths in the chest, folding and stroking them automatically. "'And your uncle Glegg's been too, and he says things must be brought in for us to lie down on, but he must talk to your aunt, and they're all coming to consult. But I know they'll none of em take my chaney,' she added, turning towards the cups and saucers, "'for they all found fault with em when I bought em, cause of the small gold sprig all over em between the flowers.' "'But there's none of em got better, Janey, not even your Aunt Pullet herself, "'and I bought it with me own money as I'd saved ever since I was turned fifteen. "'And the silver teapot, too. "'Your father never paid for em. "'And to think as he should have married me and brought me to this!' "'Mrs. Tulliver burst out crying afresh, "'and she sobbed with her handkerchief at her eyes a few moments.' But then, removing it, she said in a deprecating way, still half sobbing, as if she were called upon to speak before she could command her voice, "'And I did say to him, times and times, whatever you do, don't go to law. And what more could I do? I've had to sit by while my own fortune's been spent, and what should have been my children's too?' "'You'll never have a penny, my boy. "'But it isn't your poor mother's fault.' "'She put out one arm toward Tom, "'looking up at him piteously with her helpless, childish blue eyes. "'The poor lad went to her and kissed her, "'and she clung to him. "'For the first time Tom thought of his father with some reproach. "'His natural inclination to blame— hitherto kept entirely in abeyance towards his father by the predisposition to think him always right, simply on the ground that he was Tom Tulliver's father, was turned into this new channel by his mother's plaints, and with his indignation against Wakem there began to mingle some indignation of another sort. Perhaps his father might have helped bringing them all down in the world, and making people talk of them with contempt, but no one should talk long of Tom Tulliver with contempt. The natural strength and firmness of his nature 
was beginning to assert itself. Urged by the double stimulus of resentment against his aunts, and the sense that he must behave like a man and take care of his mother. "'Don't fret, mother,' he said tenderly. "'I shall soon be able to get money. I'll get a situation of some sort.' "'Bless you, my boy,' said Mrs. Tulliver, a little soothed. Then, looking round sadly, "'But I shouldn't have minded so much if we could have kept the things with my name on them. Maggie had witnessed this scene with gathering anger. The implied reproaches against her father, her father, who was lying there in a sort of living death, neutralised all her pity for griefs about tablecloths and china, and her anger on her father's account was heightened by some egoistic resentment at Tom's silent concurrence with her mother in shutting her out from the common calamity. She had become almost indifferent to her mother's habitual depreciation of her, but she was keenly alive to any sanction of it, however passive, that she might suspect in Tom. Poor Maggie was by no means made up of unalloyed devotedness, but put forth large claims for herself where she loved strongly. She burst out at last in an agitated, almost violent tone, "'Mother, how can you talk so, as if you cared only for things with your name on, and not for what has my father's name too, and to care about anything but dear father himself, when he's lying there and may never speak to us again? Tom, you ought to say so too. You ought not to let any one find fault with my father.' Maggie, almost choked with mingled grief and anger, left the room and took her old place on her father's bed. Her heart went out to him with a stronger movement than ever at the thought that people would blame him. Maggie hated blame. She had been blamed all her life, and nothing had come of it but evil tempers. Her father had always defended and excused her, and her loving remembrance of his tenderness was a force within her that would enable her to do or bear anything for his sake. Tom was a little shocked at Maggie's outburst, telling him as well as his mother what it was right to do. She ought to have learned better than have those hectoring, assuming manners by this time but he presently went into his father's room, and the sight there touched him in a way that effaced the slighter impressions of the previous hour. When Maggie saw how he was moved, she went to him, and put her arm round his neck as he sat by the bed, and the two children forgot everything else in the sense that they had one father and one sorrow. End of chapter 2 of Book 3rd Recording by Tom Denham Chapter 3 of Book 3rd of The Mill on the Floss by George Eliot This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Tom Denham The Family Council it was at eleven o'clock the next morning that the aunts and uncles came to hold their consultation. The fire was lighted in the large parlour, and poor Mrs. Tulliver, with a confused impression that it was a great occasion, like a funeral, unbagged the bell-rope tassels and unpinned the curtains, adjusting them in proper folds, looking round and shaking her head sadly at the polished tops and legs of the tables, which Sister Pullet herself could not accuse of insufficient brightness. Mr. Dean was not coming. He was away on business, but Mrs. Dean appeared punctually in that handsome new gig with the head to it, and the livery servant driving it, which had thrown so clear a light on several traits in her character to some of her female friends in St. Ogg's. 
Mr. Dean had been advancing in the world as rapidly as Mr. Tulliver had been going down in it, and in Mrs. Dean's house the Dodson linen and plate were beginning to hold quite a subordinate position, as a mere supplement to the handsomer articles of the same kind purchased in recent years, a change which had caused an occasional coolness in the sisterly intercourse between her and Mrs. Glegg, who felt that Susan was getting like the rest, and there would soon be little of the true Dodson spirit surviving except in herself, and, it might be hoped, in those nephews who supported the Dodson name on the family land, far away in the wolds. People who live at a distance are naturally less faulty than those immediately under our own eyes, and it seems superfluous when we consider the remote geographical position of the Ethiopians, and how very little the Greeks had to do with them, to inquire further why Homer calls them blameless. Mrs. Dean was the first to arrive, and when she had taken her seat in the large parlour, Mrs. Tulliver came down to her, with her comely face a little distorted, nearly as it would have been if she had been crying. She was not a woman who could shed abundant tears, except in moments when the prospect of losing her furniture became unusually vivid, but she felt how unfitting it was to be quite calm under present circumstances. "'Oh, sister, what a world this is!' she exclaimed as she entered. "'What trouble, oh dear!' Mrs. Dean was a thin-lipped woman, who made small, well-considered speeches on peculiar occasions, repeating them afterwards to her husband, and asking him if she had not spoken very properly. "'Yes, sister,' she said deliberately, "'this is a changing world, and we don't know to-day what may happen to-morrow. But it's right to be prepared for all things, and if trouble sent, to remember.' as it isn't sent without a cause. I'm very sorry for you as a sister, and if the doctor orders jelly for Mr. Tulliver, I hope you'll let me know. I'll send it, willingly, for it is but right he should have proper attendance while he's ill. Thank you, Susan, said Mrs. Tulliver, rather faintly, withdrawing her fat hand from her sister's thin one. But there's been no talk of jelly yet. Then, after a moment's pause, she added, "'There's a dozen of cut jelly glasses upstairs. I shall never put jelly into em no more.' Her voice was rather agitated as she uttered the last words, but the sound of wheels diverted her thoughts. Mr. and Mrs. Glegg were come, and were almost immediately followed by Mr. and Mrs. Pullet. Mrs. Pullet entered crying, as a compendious mode at all times of expressing what were her views of life in general, and what, in brief, were the opinions she held concerning the particular case before her. Mrs. Glegg had on her fuzziest front, and garments which appeared to have had a recent resurrection from a rather creasy form of burial, a costume selected with the high moral purpose of instilling perfect humility into Bessie and her children. "'Mrs. G., won't you come nearer the fire?' said her husband, unwilling to take the more comfortable seat without offering it to her. "'You see, I've seated myself here, Mr. Glegg,' returned this superior woman. "'You can roast yourself, if you like.' "'Well,' said Mr. Glegg, seating himself good-humouredly. "'And how's the poor man upstairs?' "'Dr. Turnbull thought him a good deal better this morning,' said Mrs. Tulliver. "'He took more notice and spoke to me. But he's never known Tom yet. Looks at the poor lad as if he was a stranger, though he said something once about Tom and the pony.' The doctor says his memory's gone a long way back, and he doesn't know Tom because he's thinking of him when he was little. Eh, hey, dear, eh, hey, dear. 
"'I doubt it's the water got on his brain,' said Aunt Pullet, turning round from adjusting her cap in a melancholy way at the pier-glass. "'It's much if he ever gets up again, and if he does, he'll most like be childish as Mr. Carr was, poor man. They fed him with a spoon as if he'd been a babby for three year. He'd quite lost the use of his limbs, but then he'd got a bath-chair and somebody to draw him, and that's what you won't have, I doubt, Bessie. "'Sister Pullet,' said Mrs. Glegg severely, "'if I understand right, we've come together this morning to advise and consult about what's to be done in this disgrace as has fallen upon the family, and not to talk of people as don't belong to us. Mr. Carr was none of our blood, nor no ways connected with us, as I've ever heard.' "'Sister Glegg,' said Mrs. Pullet in a pleading tone, drawing on her gloves again and stroking the fingers in an agitated manner, "'if you've got anything disrespectful to say of Mr. Carr, I do beg of you, as you won't say it to me. I know what he was,' she added with a sigh. "'His breath was short to that degree as you could hear him two rooms off.' "'Sophie,' said Mrs. Glegg, with indignant disgust, "'you do talk of people's complaints till it's quite undecent. "'But I say again, as I said before, "'I didn't come away from home to talk about acquaintance, "'whether they'd short breath or long. "'If we aren't come together for one to hear what the other'll do "'to save a sister and her children from the parish, "'I shall go back. "'One can't act without the other, I suppose. "'It isn't to be expected, as I should do everything.' "'Well, Jane,' said Mrs. Pullard, "'I don't see as you've been so very forward at doing. "'So far as I know, this is the first time as here you've been "'since it's been known as the bailiffs in the house.' "'And I was here yesterday, and looked at all Bessie's linen and things, "'and I told her I'd buy in the spotted tablecloths. "'I couldn't speak fairer, for as for the teapot, "'as she doesn't want to go out of the family, "'it stands to sense I can't do with two silver teapots, "'not if it hadn't a straight spout. "'But the spotted damask I was all as fond on, "'Oh, I, I wish it could be managed so as my teapot and chaney "'and the best casters needn't be put up for sale,' "'said poor Mrs. Tulliver, beseechingly. "'And the sugar-tongs, the first things I ever bought.' "'But that can't be helped, you know,' said Mr. Glegg. "'If one of the family chooses to buy em in, they can, "'but one thing must be bid for as well as another.' "'And it isn't to be looked for,' said Mr. Pullet, with unwonted independence of idea, "'as your own family should pay more for things nor they'll fetch. "'They may go for an old song by auction.' "'Oh, dear, oh, dear,' said Mrs. Tulliver, "'to think of my Janey being sold in that way, "'and I bought it when I was married just as you did yours, Jane and Sophie,' "'and I know you didn't like mine because of the sprig. "'But I was fond of it, and there's never been a bit broke, "'for I've washed it myself. "'And there's the tulips on the cups and the roses, "'as anybody might go and look at them for pleasure. "'You wouldn't like your chaney to go for an old song "'and be broke to pieces, "'though yours has got no colour in it, Jane. "'It's all white and fluted and didn't cost so much as mine.' "'And there's the casters. "'Sister Dean, I can't think but you'd like to have the casters, "'for I've heard you say they're pretty.' "'Well, I've no objection to buy some of the best things,' "'said Mrs. Dean, rather loftily. "'We can do with extra things in our house.' "'Best things!' exclaimed Mrs. Glegg, with severity, "'which had gathered intensity from her long silence.' 
"'It drives me past patience to hear you all talking of best things "'and buying in this, that, and the other, such as silver and chainy. "'You must bring your mind to your circumstances, Bessie, "'and not be thinking of silver and chainy, "'but whether you shall get so much as a flock-bed to lie on, "'and a blanket to cover you, and a stool to sit on. "'You must remember, if you get em, "'It'll be because your friends have bought em for you, "'for you're dependent upon them for everything. "'For your husband lies there helpless "'and hasn't got a penny in the world to call his own. "'And it's for your own good, I say this, "'for it's right you should feel what your state is "'and what disgrace your husband's brought on your own family, "'as you've got to look to for everything.' "'and be humble in your mind.' "'Mrs. Clegg paused, "'for speaking with much energy for the good of others "'is naturally exhausting. "'Mrs. Tulliver, always borne down "'by the family predominance of Sister Jane, "'who had made her wear the yoke of a younger sister "'in very tender years, said pleadingly, "'I'm sure, sister,' "'I've never asked anybody to do anything, only buy things, as it'd be a pleasure to em to have, so as they mightn't go and be spoiled as strange houses. I never asked anybody to buy the things in for me and my children, though there's the linen I spun, and I thought when Tom was born, I thought one of the first things when he was lying in the cradle as all the things I'd bought with me own money and had been so careful of had go to him. But I've said nothing as I wanted my sisters to pay their money for me. What my husband has done for his sisters unknown, and we should have been better off this day if it hadn't been as he's lent money and never asked for it again. "'Come, come,' said Mr. Glegg kindly. "'Don't let us make things too dark. "'What's done can't be undone. "'We shall make a shift among us to buy what's sufficient for you, "'though, as Mrs. G. says, they must be useful, plain things. "'We mustn't be thinking of what's unnecessary. "'A table, and a chair or two, and kitchen things, and a good bed, and such like.' "'Why, I've seen the day when I shouldn't have known myself "'if I'd lain on sacking instead of the floor. "'We get a deal of useless things about us "'only because we've got the money to spend.' "'Mr. Glegg,' said Mrs. G., "'if you'll be kind enough to let me speak "'instead of taking the words out of my mouth, "'I was going to say, Bessie,' "'as it's fine talking for you to say "'as you've never asked us to buy anything for you. "'Let me tell you you ought to have asked us. "'Pray, how are you to be provided for "'if your own family don't help you? "'You must go to the parish if they didn't. "'And you ought to know that, "'and keep it in mind and ask us humble "'to do what we can for you, "'instead of saying and making a boast "'as you've never asked us for anything.' "'You talk to the mosses, "'and what Mr. Tulliver's done for em, said Uncle Pullet, "'who became unusually suggestive "'where advances of money were concerned. "'Haven't they been a near you? "'They ought to do something as well as other folks. "'And if he's lent them money, "'they ought to be made to pay it back.' "'Yes, to be sure,' said Mrs. Dean. "'I've been thinking so. "'How is it Mr. and Mrs. Moss aren't here to meet us? "'It is but right they should do their share.' "'Oh, dear,' said Mrs. Tulliver, "'I never sent him word about Mr. Tulliver, "'and they live so backward among the lanes at Bassett. "'They never hear anything only when Mr. Moss comes to market.' "'But I never gave him a thought. "'I wonder Maggie didn't, though, "'for she was always so fond of her Aunt Moss. "'Why don't your children come in, Bessie?' "'said Mrs. Pullet, at the mention of Maggie. 
they should hear what their aunts and uncles have got to say, and Maggie, when it's me as have paid for half her schooling, she ought to think more of her aunt Pullet nor of aunt Mosses. I may go off sudden when I get home to-day. There's no telling. If I'd had my way, said Mrs. Glegg, the children had a been in the room from the first. It's time they knew who they've to look to, and it's right as somebody should talk to em, and let em know their condition in life, and what they come down to, and make em feel as they've got to suffer for their father's faults. "'Well, I'll go and fetch em, sister,' said Mrs. Tulliver resignedly. She was quite crushed now, and thought of the treasures in the storeroom with no other feeling than blank despair. She went upstairs to fetch Tom and Maggie, who were both in their father's room, and was on her way down again, when the sight of the storeroom door suggested a new thought to her. She went towards it, and left the children to go down by themselves. The aunts and uncles appeared to have been in warm discussion when the brother and sister entered, both with shrinking reluctance, for though Tom, with a practical sagacity which had been roused into activity by the strong stimulus of the new emotions he had undergone since yesterday, had been turning over in his mind a plan which he meant to propose to one of his aunts or uncles, he felt by no means amicably towards them and dreaded meeting them all at once, as he would have dreaded a large dose of concentrated physic, which was but just endurable in small draughts. As for Maggie, she was peculiarly depressed this morning. She had been called up after brief rest at three o'clock, and had that strange dreamy weariness which comes from watching in a sick-room through the chill hours of early twilight and breaking day, in which the outside daylight life seems to have no importance, and to be a mere margin to the hours in the darkened chamber. Their entrance interrupted the conversation. The shaking of hands was a melancholy and silent ceremony, till Uncle Pullet observed, as Tom approached him, "'Well, young sir, we've been talking as we should want your pen and ink. You can write rarely now, after all your schooling, I should think.' "'Aye, aye,' said Uncle Glegg, with admonition which he meant to be kind. "'We must look to see the good of all this schooling, as your father sunk so much money in now.' When land is gone and money spent, then learning is most excellent. Now's the time, Tom, to let us see the good of your learning. Let us see whether you can do better than I can, as have made my fortune without it. But I began we doing with little, you see. I could live on a basin of porridge and a crust of bread and cheese but I doubt high living and high learning will make it harder for you, young man, nor it was for me. But he must do it, interposed Aunt Glegg energetically. Whether it's hard or no, he hasn't got to consider what's hard. He must consider as he isn't to trust him to his friends to keep him in idleness and luxury. He's got to bear the fruits of his father's misconduct, and bring his mind to fare hard and to work hard and he must be humble and grateful to his aunts and uncles for what they're doing for his mother and father, as must be turned out into the streets and go to the workhouse if they didn't help him. And his sister, too, continued Mrs. Glegg, looking severely at Maggie, who had sat down on the sofa by her Aunt Dean, drawn to her by the sense that she was Lucy's mother. She must make up her mind to be humble and work, for there'll be no servants to wait on her any more. She must remember that. She must do the work of the house, and she must respect and love her aunts, as have done so much for her, and save their money to leave to their nephews and nieces. End of part one. 
of Chapter Three of Book Third. Recording by Tom Denham. Chapter Three, Part Two, of Book Third of The Mill on the Floss by George Eliot. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Tom Denham. The Family Council continued. Tom was still standing before the table in the centre of the group. There was a heightened colour in his face, and he was very far from being humbled. But he was preparing to say, in a respectful tone, something he had previously meditated, when the door opened and his mother re-entered. Poor Mrs. Tulliver had in her hands a small tray, on which she had placed her silver teapot, a specimen teacup and saucer, the castors, and sugar-tongs. "'See here, sister,' she said, looking at Mrs. Dean as she set the tray on the table. "'I thought, perhaps, if you looked at the teapot again, it's a good while since you saw it, you might like the pattern better. It makes beautiful tea, and there's a stand and everything.' "'You might use it for every day, or else lay it by for Lucy when she goes to housekeeping. "'I should be so loath for em to buy it at the Golden Lion,' said the poor woman, her heart swelling and the tears coming. "'My teapot, as I bought when I was married, and to think o' its being scratched and set before the travellers and folks, and my letters on it, see here!' E, D, and everybody to see him. Ah, oh, dear, dear, said Aunt Pullet, shaking her head with deep sadness. It's very bad to think of the family initials going about everywhere. It never was so before. You're a very unlucky sister, Bessie. But what's the use of buying the teapot when there's the linen and spoons and everything to go? and some of em with your full name, and when it's got that straight spout, too. "'As to the disgrace of the family,' said Mrs. Glegg, "'that can't be helped with buying a teapots. The disgrace is for one of the family to have married a man as has brought her to beggary. The disgrace is as they're to be sold up. We can't hinder the country from knowing that.' Maggie had started up from the sofa at the allusion to her father, but Tom saw her action and flushed face in time to prevent her from speaking. "'Be quiet, Maggie,' he said authoritatively, pushing her aside. It was a remarkable manifestation of self-command and practical judgment in a lad of fifteen that when his aunt Glegg ceased he began to speak in a quiet and respectful manner, though with a good deal of trembling in his voice, for his mother's words had cut him to the quick. "'Then, aunt,' he said, looking straight at Mrs. Glegg, "'if you think it's a disgrace to the family that we should be sold up, wouldn't it be better to prevent it altogether? And if you and my aunt pull it, he continued, looking at the latter, "'think of leaving any money to me and Maggie. "'Wouldn't it be better to give it now, "'and pay the debt we are going to be sold up for, "'and save my mother from parting with her furniture?' There was silence for a few moments, for every one, including Maggie, was astonished at Tom's sudden manliness of tone. Uncle Glegg was the first to speak. "'Ay, hey, ay, hey, young man, come now. You show some notion of things. But there's the interest, you must remember. Your aunts get five per cent on their money, and they'd lose that if they advanced it. You haven't thought of that.' "'I could work and pay that every year,' said Tom promptly. "'I'd do anything.' to save my mother from parting with her things. 
"'Well done,' said Uncle Glegg, admiringly. He had been drawing Tom out rather than reflecting on the practicability of his proposal, but he had produced the unfortunate result of irritating his wife. "'Yes, Mr. Glegg,' said that lady, with angry sarcasm, "'it's pleasant work for you to be giving my money away, as you've pretended to leave at my own disposal. "'And my money, as was my own father's gift, and not yours, Mr. Glegg, and I've saved it, and added to it myself.' and had more to put out almost every year, and it's to go and be sunk in other folks's furniture, and encourage em in luxury and extravagance, as they've no means of supporting, and I'm to alter my will, or have a codicil made, and leave two or three hundred less behind me when I die, me, as have always done right and been careful, and the eldest of the family— and my money's to go and be squandered on them as have had the same chance as me, only they've been wicked and wasteful. Sister Pullet, you may do as you like, and you may let your husband rob you back again of the money he's given you, but that isn't my spirit. La, Jane, how fiery you are, said Mrs. Pullet. I'm sure you'll have the blood in your head, and have to be cupped. I'm sorry for Bessie and her children. I'm sure I think of em a night's dreadful, for I sleep very bad with this new medicine. But it's no use for me to think o' doing anything, if you won't meet me half way. Why, there's this to be considered, said Mr. Glegg. It's no use to pay off this debt and save the furniture, when there's all the law debts behind, as it take every shilling, and more than could be made out of land and stock, for I've made that out from lawyer Gore. We'll need save our money to keep the poor man with, instead of spending it on furniture as he can neither eat nor drink. You will be so hasty, Jane, as if I didn't know what was reasonable. "'Then speak accordingly, Mr. Glegg,' said his wife, with slow, loud emphasis, bending her head towards him significantly. Tom's countenance had fallen during this conversation, and his lip quivered, but he was determined not to give way. He would behave like a man— Maggie, on the contrary, after her momentary delight in Tom's speech, had relapsed into her state of trembling indignation. Her mother had been standing close by Tom's side, and had been clinging to his arm ever since he had last spoken. Maggie suddenly started up and stood in front of them, her eyes flashing like the eyes of a young lioness. "'Why do you come, then?' she burst out, talking and interfering with us and scolding us if you don't mean to do anything to help my poor mother, your own sister, if you've no feeling for her when she's in trouble and won't part with anything, though you would never miss it, to save her from pain. Keep away from us, then, and don't come to find fault with my father. He was better than any of you. He was kind he would have helped you if you had been in trouble. Tom and I don't ever want to have any of your money if you won't help my mother. We'd rather not have it. We'll do without you. Maggie, having hurled her defiance at aunts and uncles in this way, stood still with her large dark eyes glaring at them as if she were ready to await all consequences. Mrs. Tulliver was frightened. There was something portentous in this mad outbreak. She did not see how life could go on after it. Tom was vexed. It was no use to talk so. The aunts were silent with surprise for some moments. At length, in a case of aberration such as this, comment presented itself as more expedient than any answer. 
"'You haven't seen the end of your trouble with that child, Bessie,' said Mrs. Pullet. "'She's beyond everything for boldness and unthankfulness. "'It's dreadful. "'I might a let alone paying for her schooling, for she's worse nor ever.' "'It's no more than what I've always said,' followed Mrs. Glegg. "'Other folks may be surprised, but I'm not. "'I've said over and over again, years ago I've said, "'Mark my words, that child'll come to no good. "'There isn't a bit of our family in her. "'And as for her having so much schooling, I never thought well of that. I'd my reasons when I said I wouldn't pay anything towards it. Come, come, said Mr. Glegg, let's waste no more time in talking. Let's go to business. Tom, now, get the pen and ink. While Mr. Glegg was speaking, a tall, dark figure was seen hurrying past the window. Why, there's Mrs. Moss, said Mrs. Tulliver, the bad news must have reached her then, and she went out to open the door. Maggie eagerly following her. "'That's fortunate,' said Mrs. Glegg. "'She can agree to the list of things to be bought in. But it's right she should do her share when it's her own brother.' Mrs. Moss was in too much agitation to resist Mrs. Tulliver's movement, as she drew her into the parlour automatically, without reflecting that it was hardly kind to take her among so many persons in the first painful moment of arrival. The tall, worn, dark-haired woman was a strong contrast to the Dodson sisters as she entered in her shabby dress, with her shawl and bonnet looking as if they had been hastily huddled on, and with that entire absence of self-consciousness which belongs to keenly felt trouble. Maggie was clinging to her arm, and Mrs. Moss seemed to notice no one else except Tom, whom she went straight up to and took by the hand. "'Oh, my dear children,' she burst out, "'you've no call to think well of me. I'm a poor aunt to you, for I'm one of them as take all and give nothing.' "'How's my poor brother?' "'Mr. Turnbull thinks he'll get better,' said Maggie. "'Sit down, Aunt Gritty. Don't fret.' "'Oh, my sweet child, I feel tawny too,' said Mrs. Moss, allowing Maggie to lead her to the sofa, but still not seeming to notice the presence of the rest. "'We've three hundred pounds of my brother's money, and now he wants it, and you all want it, poor things.' and yet we must be sold up to pay it. And there's my poor children, eight of em, and the little un of all can't speak plain. And I feel as if I was a robber, but I'm sure I'd no thought as my brother. The poor woman was interrupted by a rising sob. Three hundred pounds! Oh, dear, dear, said Mrs. Tulliver, who, when she had said that her husband had done unknown things for his sister, had not had any particular sum in her mind, and felt a wife's irritation at having been kept in the dark. "'What madness, to be sure!' said Mrs. Glegg. "'A man with a family! He'd no right to lend his money o' that way, and without security I'll be bound if the truth was known!' Mrs. Glegg's voice had arrested Mrs. Moss's attention, and looking up she said, "'Yes, there was security. My husband gave a note for it. We're not that sort of people. Neither of us has robbed my brother's children, and we looked to paying back the money when the times got a bit better.' "'Well, but now,' said Mr. Glegg gently, "'hasn't your husband no way of raising this money?' "'because it'd be a little fortin like for these folks "'if we can do without Tulliver's been made a bankrupt. "'Your husband's got stock. "'It is but right he should raise the money, as it seems to me, "'not but what I'm sorry for you, Mrs. Moss.' "'Oh, sir, you don't know what bad luck my husband's had with his stock. "'The farm's suffering so as never was for want of stock.' 
and we've sold all the wheat, and we're behind with our rent, not but what we'd like to do what's right, and I'd sit up and work half the night if it'd be any good. But there's them poor children, four of em such little uns. Don't cry so, aunt. Don't fret, whispered Maggie, who had kept hold of Mrs. Moss's hand. "'Did Mr. Tulliver let you have the money all at once?' said Mrs. Tulliver, still lost in the conception of things which had been going on without her knowledge. "'No, uh, twice,' said Mrs. Moss, rubbing her eyes, and making an effort to restrain her tears. "'The last was after my bad illness four years ago, as everything went wrong.' and there was a new note made then. What with illness and bad luck, I've been nothing but cumber all my life. Yes, Mrs. Moss, said Mrs. Glegg with decision, yours is a very unlucky family, the more's the pity for my sister. I set off in the cart as soon as I ever I heard of what had happened, said Mrs. Moss, looking at Mrs. Tulliver. "'I should never have stayed away all this while if you'd thought well to let me know. "'And it isn't as I'm thinking all about ourselves and nothing about my brother. "'Only the money was so on my mind I couldn't help speaking about it. "'And my husband and me desired to do the right thing, sir,' she added, looking at Mr. Glegg. "'And we'll make shift and pay the money, come what will, if that's all my brother's got to trust to. We've been used to trouble, and don't look for much else. It's only the thought of my poor children pulls me it too. "'Why, there's this to be thought on, Mrs. Moss,' said Mr. Glegg, "'and it's right to warn you. If Tulliver's made a bankrupt, and he's got a note of hand of your husband's for three hundred pounds,' "'You'll be obliged to pay it. "'The signees'll come on you for it.' "'Oh, dear, oh, dear,' said Mrs. Tulliver, "'thinking of the bankruptcy and not of Mrs. Moss's concern in it. "'Poor Mrs. Moss herself listened in trembling submission, "'while Maggie looked with bewildered distress at Tom, to see if he showed any signs of understanding this trouble, and caring about poor Aunt Moss. Tom was only looking thoughtful, with his eyes on the tablecloth. "'And if he isn't made bankrupt,' continued Mr. Glegg, "'as I said before, three hundred pounds would be a little fortune for him, poor man. We don't know but what he may be partly helpless.' "'if he ever gets up again. "'I'm very sorry if it goes hard with you, Mrs. Moss, "'but my opinion is, looking at it one way, "'it'll be right for you to raise the money, "'and looking at it the other way, "'you'll be obliged to pay it. "'You won't think ill of me for speaking the truth.' "'Uncle,' said Tom, "'looking up suddenly from his meditative view of the tablecloth, "'I don't think it would be right for my Aunt Moss to pay the money, "'if it would be against my father's will for her to pay it, would it?' "'Mr. Glegg looked surprised for a moment or two before he said, "'Why, no, perhaps not, Tom, but then he'd have destroyed the note, you know. "'We must look for the note. "'What makes you think it'd be against his will?' "'Why?' said Tom, colouring, but trying to speak firmly, in spite of a boyish tremor. "'I remember quite well. Before I went to school to Mr. Stelling, my father said to me one night, when we were sitting by the fire together, and no one else was in the room—' Tom hesitated a little, and then went on. "'He said something to me about Maggie, and then he said, "'I've always been good to my sister, though she married against my will, and I've lent Moss money, but I shall never think of distressing him to pay it. I'd rather lose it. My children must not mind being the poorer for that. 
and now my father's ill, and not able to speak for himself, I shouldn't like anything to be done contrary to what he said to me. "'Well, but then, my boy,' said Uncle Glegg, whose good feeling led him to enter into Tom's wish, but who could not at once shake off his habitual abhorrence of such recklessness as destroying securities or alienating anything important enough to make an appreciable difference in a man's property. "'We should have to make away with the note, you know, if we're to guard against what may happen, supposing your father's made bankrupt.' "'Mr. Glegg,' interrupted his wife severely, "'mind what you're saying. You're putting yourself very forward in other folks' business. If you speak rash, don't say it was my fault.' "'That's such a thing as I never heard of before,' said Uncle Pullet, who had been making haste with his lozenge in order to express his amazement. "'Making away with a note?' "'I should think anybody could set the constable on you for it.' "'Well, but,' said Mrs. Tulliver, "'if the note's worth all that money, "'why can't we pay it away and save my things from going away? "'We've no call to meddle with your uncle and Aunt Moss, Tom, "'if you think your father'd be angry when he gets well.' Mrs. Tulliver had not studied the question of exchange and was straining her mind after original ideas on the subject. "'Poo, poo, poo! You women don't understand these things,' said Uncle Glegg. "'There's no way of making it safe for Mr. and Mrs. Moss, but destroying the note.' "'Then I hope you'll help me to do it, Uncle,' said Tom earnestly. "'If my father shouldn't get well, I should be very unhappy to think anything had been done against his will that I could hinder. And I'm sure he meant me to remember what he said that evening. I ought to obey my father's wish about his property. Even Mrs. Glegg could not withhold her approval from Tom's words. She felt that the Dodson blood was certainly speaking in him, though if his father had been a Dodson there would never have been this wicked alienation of money. Maggie would hardly have restrained herself from leaping on Tom's neck if her Aunt Moss had not prevented her by herself rising and taking Tom's hand while she said, with a rather choked voice, "'You'll never be the poorer for this, my dear boy, if there's a God above.' and if the money's wanted for your father, Moss and me'll pay it, the same as if there was ever such security. We'll do as we'd be done by, for if my children have got no other luck, they've got an honest father and mother. Well, said Mr. Glegg, who had been meditating after Tom's words, we shouldn't be doing any wrong by the creditors, supposing your father was bankrupt. I've been thinking of that, for I've been a creditor myself and seen no end of cheating. If he meant to give your aunt the money before ever he got into this sad work of lawing, it's the same as if he'd made away with the note himself, for he'd made up his mind to be that much poorer. But there's a deal of things to be considered, young man, Mr. Glegg added, looking admonishingly at Tom. "'When you come to money business, and you may be taking one man's dinner away to make another man's breakfast. You don't understand that, I doubt.' "'Yes, I do,' said Tom decidedly. "'I know, if I owe money to one man, I've no right to give it to another. But if my father had made up his mind to give my aunt the money before he was in debt, he had a right to do it.' "'Well done, young man. I didn't think you'd been so sharp,' said Uncle Glegg, with much candour. "'But perhaps your father did make away with the note. Let us go and see if we can find it in the chest.' "'It's in my father's room. Let us go too, Aunt Gritty,' whispered Maggie. End of chapter 3 of Book 3rd 
Recording by Tom Denham Chapter 4 of Book 3rd of The Mill on the Floss by George Eliot This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Tom Denham A Vanishing Gleam Mr. Tulliver, even between the fits of spasmodic rigidity which had recurred at intervals ever since he had been found fallen from his horse, was usually in so apathetic a condition that the exits and entrances into his room were not felt to be of great importance. He had lain so still, with his eyes closed, all this morning, that Maggie told her Aunt Moss she must not expect her father to take any notice of them. They entered very quietly, and Mrs. Moss took her seat near the head of the bed, while Maggie sat in her old place on the bed, and put her hand on her father's, without causing any change in his face. Mr. Glegg and Tom had also entered, treading softly, and were busy selecting the key of the old oak chest from the bunch which Tom had brought from his father's bureau. They succeeded in opening the chest, which stood opposite the foot of Mr. Tulliver's bed, and propping the lid with the iron holder, without much noise. "'There's a tin box,' whispered Mr. Glegg. "'He'd most like put a small thing like a note in there. Lift it out, Tom. But I'll just lift up these deeds. They're the deeds of the house and mill, I suppose, and see what there is under em. Mr. Glegg had lifted out the parchments, and had fortunately drawn back a little when the iron holder gave way, and the heavy lid fell with a loud bang that resounded over the house. Perhaps there was something in that sound more than the mere fact of the strong vibration that produced the instantaneous effect on the frame of the prostrate man, and for the time completely shook off the obstruction of paralysis. The chest had belonged to his father, and his father's father, and it had always been rather a solemn business to visit it. All long-known objects, even a mere window fastening or a particular door latch, have sounds which are a sort of recognised voice to us, a voice that will thrill and awaken when it has been used to touch deep-lying fibres. In the same moment when all the eyes in the room were turned upon him, he started up and looked at the chest, the parchments in Mr. Glegg's hand, and Tom holding the tin box, with a glance of perfect consciousness and recognition. "'What are you going to do with those deeds?' he said, in his ordinary tone of sharp questioning whenever he was irritated. "'Come here, Tom. What do you do?' going to my chest. Tom obeyed with some trembling. It was the first time his father had recognised him, but instead of saying anything more to him, his father continued to look with a growing distinctness of suspicion at Mr. Glegg and the deeds. "'What's been happening, then?' he said sharply. "'What are you meddling with my deeds for?' Is Wakem laying hold of everything? Why don't you tell me what you've been a doing? He added impatiently as Mr. Glegg advanced to the foot of the bed before speaking. No, no, friend Tulliver said, Mr. Glegg in a soothing tone. Nobody's getting hold of anything as yet. We only came to look and see what was in the chest. You've been ill, you know and we've had to look after things a bit, but let's hope you'll soon be well enough to attend to everything yourself. Mr. Tulliver looked round him meditatively, at Tom, at Mr. Glegg, and at Maggie, then suddenly appearing aware that someone was seated by his side at the head of the bed, he turned sharply round and saw his sister. "'Eh, hey, gritty!' he said, in the half-sad, affectionate tone in which he had been wont to speak to her. 
"'What you're there, are you? "'How could you manage to leave the children?' "'Oh, brother,' said good Mrs. Moss, "'too impulsive to be prudent. "'I'm thankful I'm come now to see you yourself again. "'I thought you'd never know us any more.' "'What have I had a stroke?' said Mr. Tulliver, anxiously looking at Mr. Glegg. "'A fall from your horse shook you a bit. That's all, I think,' said Mr. Glegg. "'But you'll soon get over it, let's hope.' Mr. Tulliver fixed his eyes on the bedclothes, and remained silent for two or three minutes. A new shadow came over his face. He looked up at Maggie first, and said in a lower tone, "'You got the letter, then, my wench?' "'Yes, father,' she said, kissing him with a full heart. She felt as if her father were come back to her from the dead, and her yearning to show him how she had always loved him could be fulfilled. "'Where's your mother?' he said, so preoccupied that he received the kiss as passively as some quiet animal might have received it. "'She's downstairs with my aunt's father. Shall I fetch her?' "'Ay, ay, poor Bessie!' And his eyes turned towards Tom as Maggie left the room. "'You'll have to take care of em both if I die, you know, Tom. You'll be badly off, I doubt. But you must see and pay everybody. And mind, there's fifty pound of looks as I put into the business. He gave it me a bit at a time, and he's got nothing to show for it. "'You must pay him first thing.' Uncle Glegg involuntarily shook his head, and looked more concerned than ever, but Tom said firmly, "'Yes, father, and haven't you a note from my Uncle Moss for three hundred pounds? We came to look for that. What do you wish to be done about it, father?' "'Ah, I'm glad you thought of that, my lad,' said Mr. Tulliver. "'I always meant to be easy about that money, because of your aunt. "'You mustn't mind losing the money if they can't pay it, "'and it's like enough they can't. "'The note's in that box, mind. "'I always meant to be good to you, Gritty,' said Mr. Tulliver, turning to his sister. "'But, you know, you aggravated me when you would have moss.' "'At this moment Maggie re-entered with her mother.' who came in much agitated by the news that her husband was quite himself again. "'Well, Bessie,' he said, as she kissed him, "'you must forgive me if you're worse off than you ever expected to be. "'But it's the fault of the law. It's none of mine,' he added angrily. "'It's the fault of rascals. "'Tom, you mind this.' "'If ever you've got the chance, you make Wakem smart. "'If you don't, you're a good-for-nothing son. "'You might horse-whip him, but he'd set the law on you. "'The law's made to take care of rascals.' "'Mr. Tulliver was getting excited, and an alarming flush was on his face. "'Mr. Glegg wanted to say something soothing.' but he was prevented by Mr. Tulliver's speaking again to his wife. "'They'll make a shift to pay everything, Bessie,' he said, "'and yet leave you your furniture. "'And your sisters'll do something for you, and Tom'll grow up, "'though what he's to be I don't know. "'I've done what I could. "'I've given him a education. "'And there's the little wench. "'She'll get married.' "'But it's a poor tale.' The sanative effect of the strong vibration was exhausted, and with the last words the poor man fell again, rigid and insensible. Though this was only a recurrence of what had happened before, it struck all present as if it had been death, not only from its contrast with the completeness of the revival, but because his words had all had reference to the possibility that his death was near. But with poor Tulliver death was not to be a leap, it was to be a long descent under thickening shadows. Mr. Turnbull was sent for, but when he heard what had passed, 
He said this complete restoration, though only temporary, was a hopeful sign, proving that there was no permanent lesion to prevent ultimate recovery. Among the threads of the past which the stricken man had gathered up, he had omitted the bill of sale. The flash of memory had only lit up prominent ideas, and he sank into forgetfulness again, with half his humiliation unlearned. But Tom was clear upon two points, that his uncle Moss's note must be destroyed, and that Luke's money must be paid, if in no other way, out of his own and Maggie's money, now in the savings bank. There were subjects, you perceive, on which Tom was much quicker than on the niceties of classical construction, or the relations of a mathematical demonstration. End of chapter 4 of Book 3rd Recording by Tom Denham Chapter 5 of Book 3rd of the Mill on the Floss by George Eliot. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Tom Denham. Tom applies his knife to the oyster. The next day at ten o'clock, Tom was on his way to St. Ogg's to see his uncle Dean, who was to come home last night, his aunt had said, and Tom had made up his mind that his uncle Dean was the right person to ask for advice, about getting some employment. He was in a great way of business. He had not the narrow notions of Uncle Glegg, and he had risen in the world on a scale of advancement which accorded with Tom's ambition. It was a dark, chill, misty morning, likely to end in rain, one of those mornings when even happy people take refuge in their hopes and Tom was very unhappy. He felt the humiliation as well as the prospective hardships of his lot, with all the keenness of a proud nature, and with all his resolute dutifulness towards his father, there mingled an irrepressible indignation against him which gave misfortune the less endurable aspect of a wrong. Since these were the consequences of going to law, his father was really blamable, as his aunts and uncles had always said he was, and it was a significant indication of Tom's character that though he thought his aunts ought to do something more for his mother, he felt nothing like Maggie's violent resentment against them for showing no eager tenderness and generosity. There were no impulses in Tom that led him to expect what did not present itself to him as a right to be demanded. Why should people give away their money plentifully to those who had not taken care of their own money? Tom saw some justice in severity, and all the more because he had confidence in himself that he should never deserve that just severity. It was very hard upon him that he should be put at this disadvantage in life by his father's want of prudence. But he was not going to complain and to find fault with people, because they did not make everything easy for him. He would ask no one to help him, more than to give him work and pay him for it. Poor Tom was not without his hopes to take refuge in, under the chill, damp imprisonment of the December fog, which seemed only like a part of his home troubles. At sixteen, the mind that has the strongest affinity for fact cannot escape illusion and self-flattery, and Tom, in sketching his future, had no other guide in arranging his facts than the suggestions of his own brave self-reliance. Both Mr. Glegg and Mr. Dean, he knew, had been very poor once, he did not want to save money slowly and retire on a moderate fortune like his uncle Glegg, but he would be like his uncle Dean, get a situation in some great house of business, and rise fast. He had scarcely seen anything of his uncle Dean for the last three years, 
The two families had been getting wider apart, but for this very reason Tom was the more hopeful about applying to him. His uncle Glegg, he felt sure, would never encourage any spirited project, but he had a vague imposing idea of the resources at his uncle Dean's command. He had heard his father say long ago how Dean had made himself so valuable to Guest and Company that they were glad enough to offer him a share in the business. That was what Tom resolved he would do. It was intolerable to think of being poor and looked down upon all one's life. He would provide for his mother and sister, and make every one say that he was a man of high character. He leaped over the years in this way, and in the haste of strong purpose and strong desire, did not see how they would be made up of slow days, hours, and minutes. By the time he had crossed the stone bridge over the floss, and was entering St. Ogg's, he was thinking that he would buy his father's mill and land again when he was rich enough, and improve the house and live there. He should prefer it to any smarter, newer place, and he could keep as many horses and dogs as he liked. Walking along the street with a firm, rapid step, at this point in his reverie he was startled by someone who had crossed without his notice, and who said to him in a rough, familiar voice, "'Why, Master Tom, how's your father this morning?' It was a publican of St. Ogg's, one of his father's customers. Tom disliked being spoken to just then, but he said civilly, "'He's still very ill, thank you.' "'Aye, it's been a sore chance for you, young man, hasn't it? "'This lawsuit turning out against him,' said the publican, "'with a confused, beery idea of being good-natured. "'Tom reddened and passed on. "'He would have felt it like the handling of a bruise, "'even if there had been the most polite and delicate reference to his position. "'That's Tulliver's son!' said the publican to a grocer standing on the adjacent doorstep. "'Ah!' said the grocer. "'I thought I knew his features like. He takes after his mother's family. She was a Dodson. He's a fine straight youth. What's he been brought up to?' "'Oh, to turn up his nose at his father's customers, and be a fine gentleman. Not much else, I think.' Tom, roused from his dream of the future to a thorough consciousness of the present, made all the greater haste to reach the warehouse offices of Guest and Company, where he expected to find his uncle Dean. But this was Mr. Dean's morning at the bank, a clerk told him, with some contempt for his ignorance. Mr. Dean was not to be found in River Street on a Thursday morning. At the bank, Tom was admitted into the private room where his uncle was, immediately after sending in his name. Mr. Dean was auditing accounts, but he looked up as Tom entered, and putting out his hand, said, "'Well, Tom, nothing fresh the matter at home, I hope. How's your father?' "'Much the same, thank you, uncle,' said Tom, feeling nervous. "'But I want to speak to you, please, when you're at liberty.' "'Sit down, sit down,' said Mr. Dean, relapsing into his accounts, in which he and the managing clerk remained so absorbed for the next half-hour that Tom began to wonder whether he should have to sit in this way till the bank closed. There seemed so little tendency towards a conclusion in the quiet, monotonous procedure of these sleek, prosperous men of business. Would his uncle give him a place in the bank?' It would be very dull, prosy work, he thought, writing there forever, to the loud ticking of a timepiece. He preferred some other way of getting rich. But at last there was a change. His uncle took a pen, and wrote something with a flourish at the end. "'You'll just step up to Torrey's now, Mr. Spence, will you?' said Mr. Dean, and the clock suddenly became less loud and deliberate in Tom's ears. 
"'Well, Tom,' said Mr. Dean, when they were alone, turning his substantial person a little in his chair, and taking out his snuff-box, "'What's the business, my boy? What's the business?' Mr. Dean, who had heard from his wife what had passed the day before, thought Tom was come to appeal to him for some means of averting the sale. "'I hope you'll excuse me for troubling you, uncle,' said Tom, colouring, but speaking in a tone which, though tremulous, had a certain proud independence in it, but I thought you were the best person to advise me what to do. "'Ah!' said Mr. Dean, reserving his pinch of snuff, and looking at Tom with new attention. "'Let us hear.' "'I want to get a situation, uncle, so that I may earn some money,' said Tom, who never fell into circumlocution. "'A situation?' said Mr. Dean, and then took his pinch of snuff with elaborate justice to each nostril. Tom thought snuff-taking a most provoking habit. "'Well, let me see. How old are you?' said Mr. Dean, as he threw himself backward again. Sixteen, I mean, I'm going in seventeen, said Tom, hoping his uncle noticed how much beard he had. Let me see. Your father had some notion of making you an engineer, I think. But I don't think I could get any money at that for a long while, could I? That's true. But people don't get much money at anything, my boy, when they're only sixteen. You've had a good deal of schooling, however. I suppose you're pretty well up in accounts, eh? You understand bookkeeping? No, said Tom, rather falteringly. I was in practice. But Mr. Stelling says I write a good hand, uncle. That's my writing, added Tom, laying on the table a copy of the list he had made yesterday. Ah, that's good, that's good. But you see— the best hand in the world's will not get you a better place than a copying clerk's if you know nothing of bookkeeping, nothing of accounts. And a copying clerk's a cheap article. But what have you been learning at school, then? Mr. Dean had not occupied himself with methods of education, and had no precise conception of what went forward in expensive schools. We learned Latin— said Tom, pausing a little between each item, as if he were turning over the books in his school-desk, to assist his memory. A good deal of Latin. And the last year I did themes. One week in Latin, and one in English. And Greek and Roman history. And Euclid. And I began algebra, but I left it off again. And we had one day every week for arithmetic. Then I used to have drawing lessons, and there were several other books we either read or learned out of, English poetry, and Horae Paulinae, and Blair's Rhetoric, the last half. Mr. Dean tapped his snuff-box again, and screwed up his mouth. He felt in the position of many estimable persons when they had read the new tariff and found how many commodities were imported of which they knew nothing. Like a cautious man of business, he was not going to speak rashly of a raw material in which he had no experience. But the presumption was, that if it had been good for anything, so successful a man as himself would hardly have been ignorant of it. About Latin he had an opinion, and thought that in case of another war, since people would no longer wear hair-powder, it would be well to put a tax upon Latin, as a luxury much run upon by the higher classes, and not telling at all on the ship-owning department. But for what he knew, the ore Paulinae might be something less neutral. On the whole, this list of acquirements gave him a sort of repulsion towards poor Tom— "'Well,' he said, at last, in a rather cold, sardonic tone, "'you've had three years at these things. You must be pretty strong in em. 
"'Hadn't you better take up some line where they'll come in handy?' Tom coloured, and burst out with new energy. "'I'd rather not have any employment of that sort, Uncle. I don't like Latin and those things. I don't know what I could do with them unless I went as usher in a school, and I don't know them well enough for that. Besides, I would as soon carry a pair of panniers. I don't want to be that sort of person. I should like to enter into some business where I can get on.' a manly business where I should have to look after things and get credit for what I did, and I shall want to keep my mother and sister. "'Ah, young gentleman,' said Mr. Dean, with that tendency to repress youthful hopes which stout and successful men of fifty find one of their easiest duties, "'that's sooner said than done, sooner said than done.' "'But didn't you get on in that way, Uncle?' said Tom, a little irritated that Mr. Dean did not enter more rapidly into his views. "'I mean, didn't you rise from one place to another, through your abilities and good conduct?' "'Aye, aye, sir,' said Mr. Dean, spreading himself in his chair a little, and entering with great readiness into a retrospect of his own career. "'But I'll tell you how I got on.' It wasn't by getting astride a stick, and thinking it would turn into a horse if I sat on it long enough. I kept my eyes and ears open, sir, and I wasn't too fond of my own back, and I made my master's interest my own. Why, with only looking into what went on in the mill, I found out how there was a waste of five hundred a year that might be hindered. Why, sir, I hadn't more schooling to begin with than a charity boy, but I pretty soon saw that I couldn't get on far without mastering accounts, and I learned them between working hours after I'd been unlading. Look here. Mr. Dean opened a book and pointed to the page. I write a good hand enough, and I'll match anybody at all sorts of reckoning by the head, and I got it all by hard work and paid for it out of my own earnings, often out of my own dinner and supper. And I looked into the nature of all the things we had to do within the business, and picked up knowledge as I went about my work, and turned it over in my head. Why, I'm no mechanic, I never pretended to be, but I've thought of a thing or two that the mechanics never thought of, and it's made a fine difference in our returns." and there isn't an article shipped or unshipped at our wharf, but I know the quality of it. If I got places, sir, it was because I made myself fit for em. If you want to slip into a round hole, you must make a ball of yourself. That's where it is. Mr. Dean tapped his box again. He had been led on by pure enthusiasm in his subject, and had really forgotten what bearing this retrospective survey had on his listener. He had found occasion for saying the same thing more than once before, and was not distinctly aware that he had not his port wine before him. "'Well, uncle,' said Tom, with a slight complaint in his tone, "'that's what I should like to do. Can't I get on in the same way?' "'In the same way?' said Mr. Dean, eyeing Tom with quiet deliberation. "'There go two or three questions to that, Master Tom. "'That depends on what sort of material you are to begin with, "'and whether you've been put into the right mill. "'But I'll tell you what it is. "'Your poor father went the wrong way to work in giving you an education. "'It wasn't my business, and I didn't interfere.' but it is as I thought it would be. You've had a sort of learning that's all very well for a young fellow like our Mr. Stephen Guest, who'll have nothing to do but sign cheques all his life, and may as well have Latin inside his head as any other sort of stuffing. "'But, Uncle,' said Tom earnestly, "'I don't see why the Latin need hinder me from getting on in business. I shall soon forget it all, 
It makes no difference to me. I had to do my lessons at school, but I always thought they'd never be of any use to me afterwards. I didn't care about them. Aye, aye, that's all very well, said Mr. Dean, but it doesn't alter what I was going to say. Your Latin and rigmarole may soon dry off you, but you'll be but a bare stick after that. Besides, it's whitened your hands and taken the rough work out of you. And what do you know? Why, you know nothing about bookkeeping to begin with, and not so much of reckoning as a common shopman. You'll have to begin at a low round of the ladder, let me tell you, if you mean to get on in life. It's no use forgetting the education your father's been paying for, if you don't give yourself a new un. Tom bit his lips hard. He felt as if the tears were rising, and he would rather die than let them. "'You want me to help you to a situation,' Mr. Dean went on. "'Well, I've no fault to find with that. I'm willing to do something for you. But you youngsters nowadays think you're to begin with living well and working easy. You've no notion of running afoot before you get on horseback. Now, you must remember what you are. You're a lad of sixteen, trained to nothing particular. There's heaps of your sort, like so many pebbles, made to fit in nowhere. Well, you might be apprenticed to some business, a chemist and druggist, perhaps. Your Latin might come in a bit there. Tom was going to speak, but Mr. Dean put up his hand and said, Stop! Hear what I've got to say. You don't want to be apprentice. I know, I know. You want to make more haste, and you don't want to stand behind a counter. But if you're a copying clerk, you'll have to stand behind a desk and stare at your ink and paper all day. There isn't much outlook there, and you won't be much wiser at the end of the year than at the beginning. The world isn't made of pen, ink, and paper— and if you're to get on in the world, young man, you must know what the world's made of. Now the best chance for you would be to have a place on a wharf, or in a warehouse, where you'd learn the smell of things. But you wouldn't like that, I'll be bound. You'd have to stand cold and wet, and be shouldered about by rough fellows. You're too fine a gentleman for that.' Mr. Dean paused and looked hard at Tom, who certainly felt some inward struggle before he could reply. "'I would rather do what will be best for me in the end, sir. I would put up with what was disagreeable.' "'That's well, if you can carry it out. But you must remember, it isn't only laying hold of a rope. You must go on pulling.' "'It's the mistake you lads make that have got nothing either in your brains or your pocket to think you've got a better start in the world if you stick yourselves in a place where you can keep your coats clean and have the shop wenches take you for fine gentlemen. "'That wasn't the way I started, young man. When I was sixteen my jacket smelt of tar, and I wasn't afraid of handling cheeses.' That's the reason I can wear good broadcloth now, and have my legs under the same table with the heads of the best firms in St. Ogg's. Uncle Dean tapped his box, and seemed to expand a little under his waistcoat and gold chain, as he squared his shoulders in the chair. "'Is there any place at liberty that you know of now, Uncle, that I should do for? I should—' like to set to work at once, said Tom, with a slight tremor in his voice. Stop a bit, stop a bit, we mustn't be in too great a hurry. You must bear in mind, if I put you in a place you're a bit young for, because you happen to be my nephew, I shall be responsible for you. And there's no better reason, you know, than your being my nephew, because it remains to be seen whether you're good for anything.' "'I hope I should never do you any discredit, uncle,' said Tom, hurt, as all boys are, at the statement of the unpleasant truth that people feel no ground for trusting them. 
I care about my own credit too much for that. Well done, Tom, well done. That's the right spirit, and I never refuse to help anybody if they've a mind to do themselves justice. There's a young man of two and twenty I've got my eye on now. I shall do what I can for that young man. He's got some pith in him. But then, you see, he's made good use of his time. A first-rate calculator can tell you the cubic contents of anything in no time, and put me up the other day to a new market for Swedish bark. He's uncommonly knowing in manufactures, that young fellow. "'I'd better set about learning bookkeeping, hadn't I, uncle?' said Tom, anxious to prove his readiness to exert himself. "'Yes, yes, you can't do a miss there. But, ah, Spence, you're back again. Well, Tom, there's nothing more to be said just now, I think, and I must go to business again. Good-bye. Remember me to your mother.' Mr. Dean put out his hand with an air of friendly dismissal, and Tom had not courage to ask another question, especially in the presence of Mr. Spence. So he went out again into the cold, damp air. He had to call at his uncle Glegg's about the money in the savings bank, and by the time he set out again the mist had thickened, and he could not see very far before him but going along River Street again he was startled when he was within two yards of the projecting side of a shop window by the words Dollcut Mill in large letters on a handbill, placed as if on purpose to stare at him. It was the catalogue of the sale to take place the next week. It was a reason for hurrying faster out of the town. Poor Tom! formed no visions of the distant future as he made his way homeward. He only felt that the present was very hard. It seemed a wrong towards him that his Uncle Dean had no confidence in him, did not see at once that he should acquit himself well, which Tom himself was as certain of as the daylight. Apparently he, Tom Tulliver, was likely to be held of small account in the world, and for the first time he felt a sinking of heart under the sense that he really was very ignorant, and could do very little. Who was that enviable young man that could tell the cubic contents of things in no time, and make suggestions about Swedish bark? Swedish bark! Tom had been used to be so entirely satisfied with himself, in spite of his breaking down in a demonstration, and construing nunc illas promite vires, as now promise those men. But now he suddenly felt at a disadvantage, because he knew less than someone else knew. There must be a world of things connected with that Swedish bark, which, if he only knew them, might have helped him to get on. It would have been much easier to make a figure with a spirited horse and a new saddle. Two hours ago, as Tom was walking to St. Ogg's, he saw the distant future before him, as he might have seen a tempting stretch of smooth, sandy beach beyond a belt of flinty shingles. He was on the grassy bank then, and thought the shingles might soon be passed. But now his feet were on the sharp stones, the belt of shingles had widened, and the stretch of sand had dwindled into narrowness. "'What did my Uncle Dean say, Tom?' said Maggie, putting her arm through Tom's, as he was warming himself rather drearily by the kitchen fire. "'Did he say he would give you a situation?' "'No.' He didn't say that. He didn't quite promise me anything. He seemed to think I couldn't have a very good situation. I'm too young. But didn't he speak kindly, Tom? Kindly? Pooh! What's the use of talking about that? I wouldn't care about his speaking kindly if I could get a situation. But it's such a nuisance and bother. I've been at school all this while learning Latin and things— 
not a bit of good to me, and now my uncle says I must set about learning bookkeeping and calculation and those things. He seems to make out I'm good for nothing. Tom's mouth twitched with a bitter expression as he looked at the fire. "'Oh, what a pity we haven't got Dominie Sampson,' said Maggie, who couldn't help mingling some gaiety with their sadness. "'If he had taught me bookkeeping by double entry, and after the Italian method, as he did Lucy Bertram, I could teach you, Tom.' "'You teach? Yes, I dare say. That's always the tone you take,' said Tom. "'Dear Tom, I was only joking.' said Maggie, putting her cheek against his coat-sleeve. "'But it's always the same, Maggie,' said Tom, with the little frown he put on when he was about to be justifiably severe. "'You're always setting yourself up above me and everyone else, and I've wanted to tell you about it several times. You ought not to have spoken as you did to my uncles and aunts, you should leave it to me to take care of my mother and you, and not put yourself forward. You think you know better than any one, but you're almost always wrong. I can judge much better than you can. Poor Tom! He had just come from being lectured and made to feel his inferiority. The reaction of his strong, self-asserting nature must take place somehow— and here was a case in which he could justly show himself dominant. Maggie's cheek flushed, and her lip quivered with conflicting resentment and affection, and a certain awe as well as admiration of Tom's firmer and more effective character. She did not answer immediately. Very angry words rose to her lips, but they were driven back again, and she said at last— "'You often think I am conceited, Tom, when I don't mean what I say at all in that way. "'I don't mean to put myself above you. "'I know you behaved better than I did yesterday. "'But you're always so harsh to me, Tom.' "'With the last words the resentment was rising again. "'No, I'm not harsh,' said Tom, with severe decision. "'I'm always kind to you.' and so I shall be. I shall always take care of you, but you must mind what I say. Their mother came in now, and Maggie rushed away, that her burst of tears, which she felt must come, might not happen till she was safe upstairs. They were very bitter tears. Everybody in the world seemed so hard and unkind to Maggie. There was no indulgence, no fondness, such as she imagined when she fashioned the world afresh in her own thoughts. In books there were people who were always agreeable or tender, and delighted to do things that made one happy, and who did not show their kindness by finding fault. The world outside the books was not a happy one, Maggie felt. It seemed to be a world where people behaved the best to those they did not pretend to love, and that did not belong to them. And if life had no love in it, what else was there for Maggie? Nothing but poverty and the companionship of her mother's narrow griefs, perhaps of her father's heart-cutting childish dependence. There is no hopelessness so sad as that of early youth, when the soul is made up of wants, and has no long memories, no super-added life in the life of others. Though we who look on think lightly of premature despair, as if our vision of the future lightened the blind sufferer's present. Maggie, in her brown frock, with her eyes reddened, and her heavy hair pushed back, looking from the bed where her father lay to the dull walls of this sad chamber which was the centre of her world, was a creature full of eager, passionate longings for all that was beautiful and glad, thirsty for all knowledge, with an ear straining after dreamy music that died away and would not come near to her. 
with a blind, unconscious yearning for something that would link together the wonderful impressions of this mysterious life, and give her soul a sense of home in it. No wonder, when there is this contrast between the outward and the inward, that painful collisions come of it. End of chapter 5 of Book 3rd Recording by Tom Denham Chapter 6 of Book 3rd of The Mill on the Floss by George Eliot This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Tom Denham Tending to refute the popular prejudice against the present of a pocket-knife. In that dark time of December, the sale of the household furniture lasted beyond the middle of the second day. Mr. Tulliver, who had begun, in his intervals of consciousness, to manifest an irritability which often appeared to have as a direct effect the recurrence of spasmodic rigidity and insensibility, had lain in this living death throughout the critical hours when the noise of the sail came nearest to his chamber. Mr. Turnbull had decided that it would be a less risk to let him remain where he was than to move him to Luke's cottage, a plan which the good Luke had proposed to Mrs. Tulliver, thinking it would be very bad if the master were to waken up at the noise of the sail and the wife and children had sat imprisoned in the silent chamber, watching the large prostrate figure on the bed, and trembling lest the blank face should suddenly show some response to the sounds which fell on their own ears with such obstinate, painful repetition. But it was over at last, that time of importunate certainty and eye-straining suspense. The sharp sound of a voice, almost as metallic as the rap that followed it, had ceased. The tramping of footsteps on the gravel had died out. Mrs. Tulliver's blonde face seemed aged ten years by the last thirty hours. The poor woman's mind had been busy divining when her favourite things were being knocked down by the terrible hammer. Her heart had been fluttering at the thought that first one thing and then another had gone to be identified as hers in the hateful publicity of the Golden Lion. And all the while she had to sit and make no sign of this inward agitation. Such things bring lines in well-rounded faces, and broaden the streaks of white among the hairs that once looked as if they had been dipped in pure sunshine. Already, at three o'clock, Kezia, the good-hearted, bad-tempered housemaid, who regarded all people that came to the sale as her personal enemies, the dirt on whose feet was of a peculiarly vile quality, had begun to scrub and swill with an energy much assisted by a continual low muttering against "'Folkses came to buy up other folkses' things,' and made light of scrazing the tops of mahogany tables over which better folks than themselves had had to suffer a waste of tissue through evaporation. She was not scrubbing indiscriminately, for there would be further dirt of the same atrocious kind made by people who had still to fetch away their purchases, but she was bent on bringing the parlour where that pipe-smoking pig the bailiff had sat, to such an appearance of scant comfort as could be given to it by cleanliness, and the few articles of furniture bought in for the family. Her mistress and the young folks should have their tea in it that night, Kezia was determined. It was between five and six o'clock, near the usual tea-time, when she came upstairs and said that Master Tom was wanted. The person who wanted him was in the kitchen, and in the first moments by the imperfect fire and candlelight, Tom had not even an indefinite sense of any acquaintance with the rather broad-set but active figure, perhaps two years older than himself, 
that looked at him with a pair of blue eyes set in a disc of freckles, and pulled some curly red locks with a strong intention of respect. A low-crowned oilskin-covered hat, and a certain shiny deposit of dirt on the rest of the costume, as of tablets prepared for writing upon, suggested a calling that had to do with boats, but this did not help Tom's memory. "'Sarvent, Master Tom,' said he of the red locks, with a smile which seemed to break through a self-imposed air of melancholy. "'You don't know me again, I doubt,' he went on, as Tom continued to look at him inquiringly, "'but I'd like to talk to you by yourself a bit, please.' "'There's a fire in the parlour, Master Tom,' said Kezia, who objected to leaving the kitchen in the crisis of toasting. "'Come this way, then,' said Tom, wondering if this young fellow belonged to Guest and Company's wharf, for his imagination ran continually towards that particular spot, and Uncle Dean might any time be sending for him to say that there was a situation at liberty.' The bright fire in the parlour was the only light that showed the few chairs, the bureau, the carpetless floor, and the one table. No, not the one table. There was a second table in a corner, with a large Bible and a few other books upon it. It was this new, strange bareness that Tom felt first, before he thought of looking again at the face which was also lit up by the fire, and which stole a half-shy, questioning glance at him, as the entirely strange voice said, "'Why, you don't remember, Bob, then, as you gain the pocket-knife, Mr. Tom?' The rough-handled pocket-knife was taken out in the same moment, and the largest blade opened by way of irresistible demonstration. "'What? Bob Jakin?' said Tom, not with any cordial delight, for he felt a little ashamed of that early intimacy symbolised by the pocket-knife, and was not at all sure that Bob's motives for recalling it were entirely admirable. "'Aye, aye, Bob Jakin, if Jakin it must be, cause there's so many Bobs, as you went out of the squirrels with that day as I plumped right down from the bow and bruised my shins a good'n, but I got the squirrel tight for all that, and a scratter it was. And this littlish blade's broke, you see, but I wouldn't have a new un put in, cause they might be cheating me and giving me another knife instead, for there isn't such a blade in the country. It's got used to my hand like. And there was never nobody else gen me nothing but what I got by my own sharpness, only you, Mr. Tom. If it wasn't Bill Fawkes as gen me the terrier pup instead of drowning it, and I had to jaw him a good un afore he'd give it to me. Bob spoke with a sharp and rather treble volubility, and got through his long speech with surprising dispatch, giving the blade of his knife an affectionate rub on his sleeve when he had finished. "'Well, Bob,' said Tom, with a slight air of patronage, the foregoing reminiscences having disposed him to be as friendly as was becoming, though there was no part of his acquaintance with Bob that he remembered better than the cause of their parting quarrel. "'Is there anything I can do for you?' "'Why, no, Mr. Tom,' answered Bob, shutting up his knife with a click and returning it to his pocket, where he seemed to be feeling for something else. "'I shouldn't have come back upon you now you're in trouble, and folk says the master, as I used to frighten the birds for, and he flogged me a bit for fun when he catched me eating the turnip, as they say, he'll never lift up his head no more. I shouldn't have come now to ax you to give me another knife, cause you gain me one of four. If a chap gives me one black eye, that's enough for me. I shan't ax him for another afore I sarve him out, and a good turn's worth as much as a bad un anyhow. I shall never grow downards again, Mr. Tom, and you were the little chap as I liked the best when I were a little chap, for all you leathered me and wouldn't look at me again. There's Dick Brumby there. I could leather him as much as I'd a mind, but laws, you get tired of leathering a chap, 
when you can never make him see what you want him to shy at. I'm seen chaps as had stand staring at a bough till their eyes shot out afore they'd see as a bird's tail want a leaf. It's poor work going with such rough, but you were all as a rare and it's shy in Mr. Tom, and I could trust him to you for dropping down with your stick in the nick of time at a running rat or a stoat or that, when I would have beat in the bushes. Bob had drawn out a dirty canvas bag, and would perhaps not have paused just then if Maggie had not entered the room and darted a look of surprise and curiosity at him, whereupon he pulled his red locks again with due respect. But the next moment the sense of the altered room came upon Maggie with a force that overpowered the thought of Bob's presence. Her eyes had immediately glanced from him to the place where the bookcase had hung. There was nothing now but the oblong, unfaded space on the wall, and below it the small table with the Bible and the few other books. "'Oh, Tom!' she burst out, clasping her hands. "'Where are the books? I thought my Uncle Glegg said he would buy them. Didn't he? Are those all they've left us?' "'I suppose so,' said Tom, with a sort of desperate indifference. "'Why should they buy many books when they bought so little furniture?' "'Oh, but Tom,' said Maggie, her eyes filling with tears as she rushed up to the table to see what books had been rescued." "'Our dear old Pilgrim's progress that you coloured with your little paints, "'and that picture of Pilgrim with a mantle on, looking just like a turtle. "'Oh, dear,' Maggie went on, half sobbing as she turned over the few books. "'I thought we should never part with that while we lived. "'Everything is going away from us. "'The end of our lives will have nothing in it like the beginning.' Maggie turned away from the table and threw herself into a chair, with the big tears ready to roll down her cheeks, quite blinded to the presence of Bob, who was looking at her with the pursuant gaze of an intelligent dumb animal, with perceptions more perfect than his comprehension. "'Well, Bob,' said Tom, feeling that the subject of the books was unseasonable, "'I suppose you just came to see me because we're in trouble.' "'That was very good-natured of you.' "'I'll tell you how it is, Master Tom,' said Bob, beginning to untwist his canvas bag. "'You see, I'm been with a barge this two year. That's how I'm been getting my living. If it wasn't when I was tending the furnace between whiles at Torrey's Mill. But a fortnight ago I had a rare bit of luck.' "'I always thought I was a lucky chap, for I never set a trap but what I catch something. "'But this wasn't a trap. It was a fire at Torrey's mill, and I doused it, else it would have set the oil alight. "'And the gentleman gen me ten sovereigns. He gen me em himself last week. "'And he said first I was a spirited chap, but I know that afore. "'But then he outs with the ten sovereigns, "'And that was summat new. "'Here they are, all but one.' "'Here Bob emptied the canvas bag on the table, "'and when I'd got em, "'my head was all of a boil like a kettle of broth, "'thinking what sort of life I should take to, "'for there were a many trades I'd thought on, "'for as for the barge I'm clean tired out wit, "'for it pulls the days out till they're as long as pig's chitterlings. "'And I thought first I'd have ferrets and dogs and be a rat-catcher. "'And then I thought as I should like a bigger way of life, as I didn't know so well. "'For I'm seen to the bottom of rat-catching, "'and I thought and thought till at last I settled I'd be a pack-man, "'for they're knowing fellows the pack-men are, "'and I'd carry the lightest things I could in my pack and there'd be a use for a feller's tongue, as is no use neither with rats nor barges. 
and I should go about the country far and wide, and come round the women with my tongue, and get my dinner hot at the public, laws, it'd be a lovely life. Bob paused, and then said, with defiant decision, as if resolutely turning his back on that paradisaic picture, "'But I don't mind about it, not a chip, and I'n changed one of the sovereigns to buy my mother a goose for dinner, and I'n bought a blue plush waistcoat and a sealskin cap, for if I meant to be a packman I'd do it respectable. But I don't mind about it, not a chip. My yeed isn't a turnip, and I shall perhaps have a chance of dowsing another fire afore long. I'm a lucky chap, so I'll thank you, to take the nine sovereigns, Mr. Tom, and set your sen up with them somehow. If it's true as the master's broke, they mayn't go fur enough, but they'll help. Tom was touched keenly enough to forget his pride and suspicion. You're a very kind fellow, Bob, he said, colouring with that little diffident tremor in his voice which gave a certain charm even to Tom's pride and severity, and I shan't forget you again, though I didn't know you this evening. But I can't take the nine sovereigns. I should be taking your little fortune from you, and they wouldn't do me much good either. Wouldn't they, Mr. Tom? said Bob regretfully. Now don't say so, cause you think I want em. I aren't a poor chap. My mother gets a good penneth with picking feathers and things, and if she eats nothing but bread and water it runs to fat. And I'm such a lucky chap, and I doubt you aren't quite so lucky, Mr. Tom. The old master isn't anyhow, and so you might take a slice of my luck, and no harm done. Laws, I found a leg of pork in the river one day, It'd tumble out of one of them round stern Dutchmen, I'll be bound. Come, think better on it, Mr. Tom, for old Quinton's sake, else I shall think you bear me a grudge. Bob pushed the sovereigns forward, but before Tom could speak, Maggie, clasping her hands and looking penitently at Bob, said, Oh, I'm so sorry, Bob. I never thought you were so good. Why, I think you're the kindest person in the world. Bob had not been aware of the injurious opinion for which Maggie was performing an inward act of penitence, but he smiled with pleasure at this handsome eulogy, especially from a young lass who, as he informed his mother that evening, had such uncommon eyes, they looked somehow as— they made me feel no how. No, indeed, Bob, I can't take them, said Tom, but don't think I feel your kindness less because I say no. I don't want to take anything from anybody but to work my own way. And those sovereigns wouldn't help me much, they wouldn't really, if I were to take them. Let me shake hands with you instead." Tom put out his pink palm, and Bob was not slow to place his hard, grimy hand within it. "'Let me put the sovereigns in the bag again,' said Maggie, "'and you'll come and see us when you've bought your pack, Bob.' "'It's like as if I'd come out to make-believe a purpose to show em you,' said Bob with an air of discontent, as Maggie gave him the bag again. "'It taken em back of this way,' I am a bit of a do, you know, but it isn't that sort of do. It's only when a feller's a big rogue or a big flat I like to let him in a bit, that's all. Now don't you be up to any tricks, Bob, said Tom, else you'll get transported some day. No, no, not me, Mr. Tom, said Bob, with an air of cheerful confidence. There's no law again flea bites. If I wasn't to take a fool in now and then, he'd never get any wiser. But laws have a sovereign to buy you and Miss Summit, only for a token, just to match my pocket-knife. While Bob was speaking, 
He laid down the sovereign, and resolutely twisted up his bag again. Tom pushed back the gold, and said, "'No, indeed, Bob. Thank you heartily, but I can't take it.' And Maggie, taking it between her fingers, held it up to Bob, and said more persuasively, "'Not now, but perhaps another time. If ever Tom or my father wants help that you can give, we'll let you know, won't we, Tom? That's what you would like, to have us always depend on you as a friend that we can go to, isn't it, Bob?' "'Yes, miss, and thank you,' said Bob, reluctantly taking the money. "'That's what I like, anything as you like.' "'And I wish you good-bye, miss, and good luck, Mr. Tom, "'and thank you for shaking hands with me, though you wouldn't take the money.' Kezia's entrance, with very black looks, to inquire if she shouldn't bring in the tea now, or whether the toast was to get hardened to a brick, was a seasonable check on Bob's flux of words, and hastened his parting bow. End of chapter six of book third. Recording by Tom Denham. Chapter seven of book third of The Mill on the Floss by George Eliot. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Tom Denham. How a Hen Takes to Stratagem. The days passed, and Mr. Tulliver showed, at least to the eyes of the medical man, stronger and stronger symptoms of a gradual return to his normal condition. The paralytic obstruction was little by little losing its tenacity, and the mind was rising from under it with fitful struggles, like a living creature making its way from under a great snowdrift that slides and slides again and shuts up the newly made opening. Time would have seemed to creep to the watchers by the bed, if it had only been measured by the doubtful distant hope which kept count of the moments within the chamber. But it was measured for them by a fast-approaching dread which made the nights come too quickly. While Mr. Tulliver was slowly becoming himself again, his lot was hastening towards its moment of most palpable change. The taxing masters had done their work like any respectable gunsmith conscientiously preparing the musket that, duly pointed by a brave arm, will spoil a life or two. Allocators, filing of bills in chancery, decrees of sale, are legal chain-shot, or bombshells that can never hit a solitary mark, but must fall with widespread shattering. So deeply inherent is it in this life of ours that men have to suffer for each other's sins, so inevitably diffusive is human suffering that even justice makes its victims, and we can conceive no retribution that does not spread beyond its mark in pulsations of unmerited pain. By the beginning of the second week in January the bills were out advertising the sale, under a decree of chancery, of Mr. Tulliver's farming and other stock, to be followed by a sale of the mill and land held in the proper after-dinner hour at the Golden Lion. The miller himself, unaware of the lapse of time, fancied himself still in that first stage of his misfortunes when expedients might be thought of, and often in his conscious hours talked in a feeble, disjointed manner of plans he would carry out when he got well. The wife and children were not without hope of an issue that would at least save Mr. Tulliver from leaving the old spot, and seeking an entirely strange life. For Uncle Dean had been induced to interest himself in this stage of the business. It would not, he acknowledged, be a bad speculation for Guest and Company to buy Dalkett Mill and carry on the business, which was a good one, 
and might be increased by the addition of steam-power, in which case Mr. Tulliver might be retained as manager. Still Mr. Dean would say nothing decided about the matter. The fact that Wakeham held the mortgage on the land might put it into his head to bid for the whole estate, and further to outbid the cautious firm of Guest and Company, who did not carry on business on sentimental grounds. Mr. Dean was obliged to tell Mrs. Tulliver something to that effect, when he rode over to the mill to inspect the books in company with Mrs. Glegg, for she had observed that, "'If Guest and Company would only think about it, Mr. Tulliver's father and grandfather had been carrying on Dalcott Mill long before the oil mill of that firm had been so much as thought of.' Mr. Dean, in reply, doubted whether that was precisely the relation between the two mills which would determine their value as investments. As for Uncle Glegg, the thing lay quite beyond his imagination. The good-natured man felt sincere pity for the Tulliver family, but his money was all locked up in excellent mortgages, and he could run no risk. That would be unfair to his own relatives." but he had made up his mind that Tulliver should have some new flannel waistcoats which he had himself renounced in favour of a more elastic commodity, and that he would buy Mrs. Tulliver a pound of tea now and then. It would be a journey which his benevolence delighted in beforehand to carry the tea, and see her pleasure on being assured it was the best black. Still, it was clear that Mr. Dean was kindly disposed towards the Tullivers. One day he had brought Lucy, who was come home for the Christmas holidays, and the little blonde angel head had pressed itself against Maggie's darker cheek with many kisses and some tears. These fair, slim daughters keep up a tender spot in the heart of many a respectable partner in a respectable firm, and perhaps Lucy's anxious, pitying questions about her poor cousins helped to make Uncle Dean more prompt in finding Tom a temporary place in the warehouse, and in putting him in the way of getting evening lessons in bookkeeping and calculation. That might have cheered the lad and fed his hopes a little, if there had not come at the same time the much dreaded blow of finding that his father must be a bankrupt after all. At least the creditors must be asked to take less than their due, which to Tom's untechnical mind was the same thing as bankruptcy. His father must not only be said to have lost his property, but to have failed the word that carried the worst obloquy to Tom's mind. For when the defendant's claim for costs had been satisfied, there would remain the friendly bill of Mr. Gore, and the deficiency at the bank, as well as the other debts, which would make the assets shrink into unequivocal disproportion. "'Not more than ten or twelve shillings in the pound,' predicted Mr. Dean in a decided tone, tightening his lips, and the words fell on Tom like a scalding liquid, leaving a continual smart. He was sadly in want of something to keep up his spirits a little in the unpleasant newness of his position. Suddenly transported from the easy carpeted ennui of study hours at Mr. Stelling's, and the busy idleness of castle-building in a last half at school, to the companionship of sacks and hides, and bawling men thundering down heavy weights at his elbow. The first step towards getting on in the world was a chill, dusty, noisy affair, and implied going without one's tea in order to stay in St. Ogg's and have an evening lesson from a one-armed elderly clerk in a room smelling strongly of bad tobacco. Tom's young pink-and-white face had its colours very much deadened by the time he took off his hat at home, and sat down with keen hunger to his supper. No wonder he was a little cross if his mother or Maggie spoke to him. But all this while Mrs. Tulliver 
was brooding over a scheme by which she, and no one else, would avert the result to be most dreaded, and prevent Wakem from entertaining the purpose of bidding for the mill. Imagine a truly respectable and amiable hen, by some portentous anomaly taking to reflection and inventing combinations by which she might prevail on Hodge not to wring her neck, or send her and her chickens to market. The result could hardly be other than much cackling and fluttering. Mrs. Tulliver, seeing that everything had gone wrong, had begun to think that she had been too passive in life, and that, if she had applied her mind to business, and taken a strong resolution now and then, it would have been all the better for her and her family. Nobody, it appeared, had thought of going to speak to Wakem on this business of the mill. And yet, Mrs. Tulliver reflected, it would have been quite the shortest method of securing the right end. It would have been of no use, to be sure, for Mr. Tulliver to go, even if he had been able and willing, for he had been going to law against Wakem and abusing him for the last ten years. Wakem was always likely to have a spite against him. And now that Mrs. Tulliver had come to the conclusion that her husband was very much in the wrong to bring her into this trouble, she was inclined to think that his opinion of Wakem was wrong too. To be sure, Wakem had put the Baileys in the house and sold them up, but she supposed he did that to please the man that lent Mr. Tulliver the money, for a lawyer had more folks to please than one, and he wasn't likely to put Mr. Tulliver, who had gone to law with him, above everybody else in the world. The attorney might be a very reasonable man. Why not? He had married a Miss Clint. And at the time Mrs. Tulliver had heard of that marriage, the summer when she wore her blue satin spencer, and had not yet any thoughts of Mr. Tulliver, she knew no harm of Wakem, and certainly towards herself, whom he knew to have been a Miss Dodson, it was out of all possibility that he could entertain anything but good will, when it was once brought home to his observation that she, for her part, had never wanted to go to law, and indeed was at present disposed to take Mr. Wakem's view of all subjects rather than her husband's. In fact, if that attorney saw a respectable matron like herself disposed to give him good words, why shouldn't he listen to her representations? For she would put the matter clearly before him, which had never been done yet, and he would never go and bid for the mill on purpose to spite her, an innocent woman who thought it likely enough that she had danced with him in their youth at Squire Darley's, for at those big dances she had often and often danced with young men whose names she had forgotten. Mrs. Tulliver hid these reasonings in her own bosom, for when she had thrown out a hint to Mr. Dean and Mr. Glegg that she wouldn't mind going to speak to Wakem herself, they had said, No, 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 and Poo, poo, and let Wakem alone, in the tone of men who were not likely to give a candid attention to a more definite exposition of her project. Still less dead she mention the plan to Tom and Maggie, for the children were always so against everything their mother said, and Tom, she observed, was almost as much set against Wakem as his father was. But this unusual concentration of thought naturally gave Mrs. Tulliver an unusual power of device and determination, and a day or two before the sale, to be held at the Golden Lion, when there was no longer any time to be lost, she carried out her plan by a stratagem. There were pickles in question, a large stock of pickles and ketchup which Mrs. Tulliver possessed, and which Mr. Hindmarsh, the grocer, would certainly purchase if she could transact the business in a personal interview. So she would walk with Tom to St. Ogg's that morning, 
and when Tom urged that she might let the pickles be at present, he didn't like her to go about just yet, she appeared so hurt at this conduct in her son, contradicting her about pickles, which she had made after the family receipts inherited from his own grandmother, who had died when his mother was a little girl, that he gave way, and they walked together until she turned towards Danish Street, where Mr. Hindmarsh retailed his grocery, not far from the offices of Mr. Wakeham. That gentleman was not yet come to his office. Would Mrs. Tulliver sit down by the fire in his private room and wait for him? She had not long to wait before the punctual attorney entered, knitting his brow with an examining glance at the stout blonde woman who rose curtsying deferentially. A tallish man, with an aquiline nose and abundant iron-grey hair. You have never seen Mr. Wakeham before, and are possibly wondering whether he was really as eminent a rascal, and as crafty, bitter an enemy of honest humanity in general, and of Mr. Tulliver in particular, as he is represented to be in that idolon or portrait of him which we have seen to exist in the miller's mind. It is clear that the irascible miller was a man to interpret any chance shot that grazed him as an attempt on his own life, and was liable to entanglements in this puzzling world, which, due consideration had to his own infallibility, required the hypothesis of a very active diabolical agency to explain them. It is still possible to believe that the attorney was not more guilty towards him than an ingenious machine, which performs its work with much regularity, is guilty towards the rash man, who, venturing too near it, is caught up by some flywheel or other, and suddenly converted into unexpected sausages. But it is really impossible to decide this question by a glance at his person. The lines and lights of the human countenance are like other symbols, not always easy to read without a key. On an a priori view of Wakeham's aquiline nose, which offended Mr. Tulliver, there was not more rascality than in the shape of his stiff shirt-collar, though this too, along with his nose, might have become fraught with damnatory meaning when once the rascality was ascertained. "'Mrs. Tulliver, I think,' said Mr. Wakeham. "'Yes, sir, Miss Elizabeth Dodson as was.' "'Pray be seated. You have some business with me?' "'Well, sir, yes,' said Mrs. Tulliver, beginning to feel alarmed at her own courage, now she was really in presence of the formidable man, and reflecting that she had not settled with herself how she should begin. Mr. Wakeham felt in his waistcoat pockets, and looked at her in silence. "'I hope, sir,' she began at last, "'I hope, sir, you're not a-thinking as I bear you any ill-will because of my husband's losing his lawsuit, and the baileys being put in, and the linen being sold. Oh, dear!' "'for I wasn't brought up in that way. "'I'm sure you remember my father, sir, "'for he was close friends with Squire Darley, "'and we always went to the dancers there, "'the Miss Dodsons. "'Nobody could be more looked on. "'And justly, for there was four of us, "'and you're quite aware as Mrs. Glegg "'and Mrs. Dean or my sisters. "'And as for going to law and losing money "'and having sales before you're dead,' I never saw anything of that before I was married, nor for a long while after. And I'm not to be answerable for my bad luck in marrying out of my own family into one where the goings-on was different. And as for being drawn in to abuse you as other folks abuse you, sir, that I never was, and nobody can say it of me. Mrs. Tulliver shook her head a little and looked at the hem of her pocket-handkerchief. "'I've no doubt of what you say, Mrs. Tulliver,' said Mr. Wakeham, with cold politeness. 
but you have some question to ask me. Well, sir, yes. But that's what I've said to myself. I've said you'd have some natural feeling, and as for my husband, as hasn't been himself for this two months, I'm not a defending him in no way for being so hot about the irrigation. Not but what there's worse men, for he never wronged nobody of a shilling nor a penny. Not willingly. And as for his fieriness and lawing, what could I do? And him struck as if it was with death when he got the letter as said you'd got the hold upon the land. But I can't believe but what you'll behave as a gentleman. What does all this mean, Mrs. Tulliver? said Mr. Wakem rather sharply. What do you want to ask me? Why, sir, if you'll be so good, said Mrs. Tulliver, starting a little and speaking more hurriedly, if you'll be so good not to buy the mill and the land, the land wouldn't so much matter, only my husband'll be like mad at your having it. Something like a new thought flashed across Mr. Wakem's face as he said, "'Who told you I meant to buy it?' "'Why, sir, it's none of my inventing, and I should never have thought of it, for my husband has ought to know about the law. He always used to say as lawyers had never no call to buy anything, either lands or houses, for they always got em into their hands other ways. And I should think, and I should think that'd be the way with you, sir, and I never said as you'd be the man to do contrary to that.' "'Ah, well, who was it that did say so?' said Wakem, opening his desk, and moving things about with the accompaniment of an almost inaudible whistle. "'Why, sir, it was Mr. Glegg and Mr. Dean as have all the management. And Mr. Dean thinks as guest and company had buy the mill and let Mr. Tulliver work it for em if you didn't bid for it and raise the price.' "'And it'd be such a thing for my husband to stay where he is if he could get his living, "'for it was his father's before him the mill was, and his grandfather built it. "'Though I wasn't fond of the noise of it when first I was married, "'for there was no mills in our family, not the Dodsons, "'and if I'd known as the mills had so much to do with the law, "'it wouldn't have been me as it'd have been the first Dodson to marry one. "'But I went into it blindfold, that I did, irrigation and everything.' "'What? Guest and company would keep the mill in their own hands, I suppose, and pay your husband wages?' "'Oh, dear, sir, it's hard to think of,' said poor Mrs. Tulliver, a little tear making its way, "'as my husband should take wage.' "'But it did look more like what used to be to stay at the mill than to go anywhere else. "'And if you'll only think, if you was to bid for the mill and buy it, "'my husband might be struck worse than he was before, "'and never get better again as he's getting now.' "'Well, but if I bought the mill, and allowed your husband to act as my manager in the same way, how then?' said Mr. Wakem. "'Oh, sir, I doubt he could never be got to do it, not if the very mill stood still to beg and pray of him, for your name's like poison to him. It's so as never was. And he looks upon it as you've been the ruin of him all along, ever since you set the law on him about the road through the meadow. That's eight year ago, and he's been going on ever since— as I've always told him he was wrong. "'He's a pig-headed, foul-mouthed fool!' burst out Mr. Wakem, forgetting himself. "'Oh, dear, sir,' said Mrs. Tulliver, frightened at a result so different from the one she had fixed her mind on. "'I wouldn't wish to contradict you, but it's like enough he's changed his mind with his illness. He's forgot a many things he used to talk about. "'And you wouldn't like to have a corpse on your mind if he was to die, "'and they do say as it's all as unlucky when Dolcott Mill changes hands "'and the water might all run away, and then... "'Not as I'm wishing you any ill luck, sir, "'for I forgot to tell you as I remember your wedding as if it was yesterday. "'Mrs. Wakem was a Miss Clint, I know that, and my boy... 
as there isn't a nicer, handsomer, straighter boy nowhere went to school with your son. Mr. Wakeham rose, opened the door, and called to one of his clerks. "'You must excuse me for interrupting you, Mrs. Tulliver. I have business that must be attended to, and I think there is nothing more necessary to be said.' "'But if you would bear it in mind, sir,' said Mrs. Tulliver, rising, "'and not run against me and my children, "'and I'm not denying Mr. Tulliver's been in the wrong, "'but he's been punished enough, "'and there's worse men, for it's been giving to other folks "'has been his fault. "'He's done nobody any harm but himself and his family, "'the more's the pity, "'and I go and look at the bare shelves every day.' "'and think where all my things used to stand.' "'Yes, yes, I'll bear it in mind,' said Mr. Wakeham hastily, "'looking towards the open door. "'And if you'd please not to say as I've been to speak to you, "'for my son would be very angry with me for demeaning myself, I know he would, "'and I've trouble enough without being scalded by my children.' Poor Mrs. Tulliver's voice trembled a little, and she could make no answer to the attorney's good morning, but curtsied and walked out in silence. "'Which day is it that Dalcott Mill is to be sold? Where's the bill?' said Mr. Wakeham to his clerk when they were alone. "'Next Friday's the day. Friday at six o'clock.' "'Oh, just run to Winship's, the auctioneer, and see if he's at home.' "'I have some business for him. Ask him to come up.' Although when Mr. Wakeham entered his office that morning he had had no intention of purchasing Dalcott Mill, his mind was already made up. Mrs. Tulliver had suggested to him several determining motives, and his mental glance was very rapid. He was one of those men who can be prompt without being rash, because their motives run in fixed tracks, and they have no need to reconcile conflicting aims. To suppose that Wakeham had the same sort of inveterate hatred towards Tulliver that Tulliver had towards him, would be like supposing that a pike and a roach can look at each other from a similar point of view. The roach necessarily abhors the mode in which the pike gets its living, and the pike is likely to think nothing further, even of the most indignant roach, than that he is excellent good eating. It could only be when the roach choked him that the pike could entertain a strong personal animosity. If Mr. Tulliver had ever seriously injured or thwarted the attorney, Wakeham would not have refused him the distinction of being a special object of his vindictiveness. But when Mr. Tulliver called Wakeham a rascal at the market dinner-table, the attorney's clients were not a whit inclined to withdraw their business from him, and if, when Wakeham himself happened to be present, some jocose cattle-feeder, stimulated by opportunity and brandy, made a thrust at him by alluding to old ladies' wills, he maintained perfect sang-froid, and knew quite well that the majority of substantial men then present were perfectly contented with the fact that Wakeham was Wakeham. That is to say, a man who always knew the stepping-stones that would carry him through very muddy bits of practice. A man who had made a large fortune, had a handsome house among the trees at Tofton, and decidedly the finest stock of port wine in the neighbourhood of St. Ogg's, was likely to feel himself on a level with public opinion. And I am not sure that even honest Mr. Tulliver himself, with his general view of law as a cockpit, might not, under opposite circumstances, have seen a fine appropriateness in the truth that Wakeham was Wakeham, since I have understood from persons versed in history that mankind is not disposed to look narrowly into the conduct of great victors when their victory is on the right side. Tulliver, then, could be no obstruction to Wakeham. On the contrary, 
He was a poor devil whom the lawyer had defeated several times, a hot-tempered fellow who would always give you a handle against him. Wakeham's conscience was not uneasy because he had used a few tricks against the miller. Why should he hate that unsuccessful plaintiff, that pitiable, furious bull entangled in the meshes of a net? Still, among the various excesses to which human nature is subject, moralists have never numbered that of being too fond of the people who openly revile us. The successful yellow candidate for the borough of Old Topping, perhaps, feels no pursuant meditative hatred towards the blue editor who consoles his subscribers with vituperative rhetoric against yellow men who sell their country and are the demons of private life. But he might not be sorry, if law and opportunity favoured, to kick that blue editor to a deeper shade of his favourite colour. Prosperous men take a little vengeance now and then, as they take a diversion, when it comes easily in their way, and is no hindrance to business, and such small unimpassioned revenges have an enormous effect in life, running through all degrees of personal infliction, blocking the fit men out of places, and blackening characters in unpremeditated talk. Still more, to see people who have been only insignificantly offensive to us, reduced in life, and humiliated without any special efforts of ours, is apt to have a soothing, flattering influence. Providence, or some other prince of this world, it appears, has undertaken the task of retribution for us, and really, by an agreeable constitution of things, our enemies somehow don't prosper. Wakeham was not without this parenthetic vindictiveness towards the uncomplimentary Miller. And now Mrs. Tulliver had put the notion into his head, it presented itself to him as a pleasure to do the very thing that would cause Mr. Tulliver the most deadly mortification, and a pleasure of a complex kind not made up of crude malice, but mingling with it the relish of self-approbation. To see an enemy humiliated gives a certain contentment, but this is jejun compared with the highly blent satisfaction of seeing him humiliated by your benevolent action or concession on his behalf. That is a sort of revenge which falls into the scale of virtue, and Wakeham was not without an intention of keeping that scale respectably filled. He had once had the pleasure of putting an old enemy of his into one of the St. Og's almshouses, to the rebuilding of which he had given a large subscription, and here was an opportunity of providing for another by making him his own servant. Such things give a completeness to prosperity and contribute elements of agreeable consciousness that are not dreamed of by that short-sighted, overheated vindictiveness which goes out of its way to wreak itself in direct injury. And Tulliver, with his rough tongue filed by a sense of obligation, would make a better servant than any chance fellow who was cap in hand for a situation. Tulliver was known to be a man of proud honesty, and Wakeham, was too acute not to believe in the existence of honesty. He was given to observing individuals, not to judging of them according to maxims, and no one knew better than he that all men were not like himself. Besides, he intended to overlook the whole business of land and mill pretty closely. He was fond of these practical rural matters." but there were good reasons for purchasing Dalcott Mill, quite apart from any benevolent vengeance on the miller. It was really a capital investment. Besides, Guest and Company were going to bid for it. Mr. Guest and Mr. Wakeham were on friendly dining terms, and the attorney liked to predominate over a ship-owner and mill-owner, who was a little too loud in the town affairs as well as in his own table-talk. 
for Wakeham was not a mere man of business. He was considered a pleasant fellow in the upper circles of St. Ogg's, chattered amusingly over his port wine, did a little amateur farming, and had certainly been an excellent husband and father. At church, when he went there, he sat under the handsomest of mural monuments erected to the memory of his wife. Most men would have married again under his circumstances, but he was said to be more tender to his deformed son than most men were to their best-shapen offspring. Not that Mr. Wakeham had not other sons besides Philip, but towards them he held only a chiaroscuro parentage, and provided for them in a grade of life duly beneath his own. In this fact, indeed, there lay the clenching motive to the purchase of Dalcott Mill. While Mrs. Tulliver was talking, it had occurred to the rapid-minded lawyer, among all the other circumstances of the case, that this purchase would, in a few years to come, furnish a highly suitable position for a certain favourite lad whom he meant to bring on in the world. These were the mental conditions on which Mr. Tulliver had undertaken to act persuasively, and had failed, a fact which may receive some illustration from the remark of a great philosopher, that fly-fishers fail in preparing their bait so as to make it alluring in the right quarter, for want of a due acquaintance with the subjectivity of fishes. End of chapter 7 of Book 3rd Recording by Tom Denham Chapter 8 of Book 3rd of The Mill on the Floss by George Eliot This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Tom Denham Daylight on the Wreck it was a clear, frosty January day on which Mr. Tulliver first came downstairs. The bright sun on the chestnut boughs and the roofs opposite his window had made him impatiently declare that he would be caged up no longer. He thought everywhere would be more cheery under this sunshine than his bedroom, for he knew nothing of the bareness below, which made the flood of sunshine importunate, as if it had an unfeeling pleasure in showing the empty places and the marks where well-known objects once had been. The impression on his mind that it was but yesterday when he received the letter from Mr. Gore was so continually implied in his talk and the attempts to convey to him the idea that many weeks had passed and much had happened since then had been so soon swept away by recurrent forgetfulness that even Mr. Turnbull had begun to despair of preparing him to meet the facts by previous knowledge. The full sense of the present could only be imparted gradually by new experience, not by mere words, which must remain weaker than the impressions left by the old experience. This resolution to come downstairs was heard with trembling by the wife and children. Mrs. Tulliver said Tom must not go to St. Ogg's at the usual hour. He must wait and see his father downstairs. And Tom complied, though with an intense inward shrinking from the painful scene. The hearts of all three had been more deeply dejected than ever during the last few days. For guest and company had not bought the mill. Both mill and land had been knocked down to Wakeham who had been over the premises and had laid before Mr. Dean and Mr. Clegg, in Mrs. Tulliver's presence, his willingness to employ Mr. Tulliver, in case of his recovery, as a manager of the business. This proposition had occasioned much family debating. Uncles and aunts were almost unanimously of opinion that such an offer ought not to be rejected when there was nothing in the way but a feeling in Mr. Tulliver's mind which, as neither aunts nor uncles shared it, was regarded as entirely unreasonable and childish, indeed as a transferring towards Wakeham of that indignation and hatred which Mr. Tulliver ought properly to have directed against himself 
for his general quarrelsomeness and his special exhibition of it in going to law. Here was an opportunity for Mr. Tulliver to provide for his wife and daughter without any assistance from his wife's relations, and without that too evident descent into pauperism which makes it annoying to respectable people to meet the degraded member of the family by the wayside. Mr. Tulliver, Mrs. Glegg considered, must be made to feel, when he came to his right mind, that he could never humble himself enough for that had come which she had always foreseen would come of his insolence in time past to them as were the best friends he'd got to look to mr glegg and mr dean were less stern in their views but they both of them thought tulliver had done enough harm by his hot-tempered crotchets and ought to put them out of the question when a livelihood was offered him Wakem showed a right feeling about the matter. He had no grudge against Tulliver. Tom had protested against entertaining the proposition. He shouldn't like his father to be under Wakem. He thought it would look mean-spirited. But his mother's main distress was the utter impossibility of ever turning Mr. Tulliver round about Wakem, or getting him to hear reason. No, they would all have to go and live in a pigsty on purpose to spite Wakem, who spoke so as nobody could be fairer. Indeed, Mrs. Tulliver's mind was reduced to such confusion by living in this strange medium of unaccountable sorrow, against which she continually appealed by asking, "'Oh, dear, what have I done to deserve worse than other women?' that Maggie began to suspect her poor mother's wits were quite going. "'Tom,' she said, when they were out of their father's room together, "'we must try to make father understand a little of what has happened before he goes downstairs. But we must get my mother away. She will say something that will do harm. Ask Kezia to fetch her down and keep her engaged with something in the kitchen.' Kezia was equal to the task. Having declared her intention of staying till the master could get about again, wage or no wage, she had found a certain recompense in keeping a strong hand over her mistress, scolding her for moithering herself, and going about all day without changing her cap, and looking as if she was mushed. Altogether, this time of trouble was rather a Saturnalian time to Kezia. She could scold her betters with unreproved freedom. On this particular occasion there were drying clothes to be fetched in. She wished to know if one pair of hands could do everything indoors and out, and observed that she should have thought it would be good for Mrs. Tulliver to put on her bonnet and get a breath of fresh air by doing that needful piece of work. Poor Mrs. Tulliver went submissively downstairs. To be ordered about by a servant was the last remnant of her household dignities. She would soon have no servant to scold her. Mr. Tulliver was resting in his chair a little, after the fatigue of dressing, and Maggie and Tom were seated near him, when Luke entered, to ask if he should help Master downstairs. "'Ay, ay, Luke, stop a bit, sit down,' said Mr. Tulliver, pointing his stick towards a chair, and looking at him with that pursuant gaze which convalescent persons often have for those who have tended them, reminding one of an infant gazing about after its nurse. For Luke had been a constant night-watcher by his master's bed. "'How's the water now, eh, Luke?' said Mr. Tulliver. "'Dicks hasn't been choking you up again, eh?' "'No, sir, it's all right.' "'Aye, ah, I thought not. He won't be in a hurry at that again, now Riley's been to settle him. That was what I said to Riley yesterday. I said, uh... Mr. Tulliver leaned forward, resting his elbows on the armchair, and looking on the ground as if in search of something, 
striving after vanishing images like a man struggling against a doze. Maggie looked at Tom in mute distress. Their father's mind was so far off the present, which would by and by thrust itself on his wandering consciousness. Tom was almost ready to rush away with that impatience of painful emotion which makes one of the differences between youth and maiden, man and woman. "'Father,' said Maggie, laying her hand on his, "'don't you remember that Mr. Riley is dead?' "'Dead?' said Mr. Tulliver, sharply, looking in her face with a strange examining glance. "'Yes, he died of apoplexy nearly a year ago. I remember hearing you say you had to pay money for him, and he left his daughters badly off. One of them is under-teacher at Miss Furness's, where I've been to school, you know.' "'Ah!' said her father doubtfully, still looking in her face. But as soon as Tom began to speak, he turned to look at him with the same inquiring glances, as if he were rather surprised at the presence of these two young people. Whenever his mind was wandering in the far past, he fell into this oblivion of their actual faces. They were not those of the lad and the little wench who belonged to that past. "'It's a long while since you had the dispute with Dick's father,' said Tom. "'I remember your talking about it three years ago, before I went to school at Mr. Stelling's. I've been at school there three years, don't you remember?' Mr. Tulliver threw himself backward again, losing the childlike outward glance under a rush of new ideas which diverted him from external impressions. "'Ay, ay, he said after a minute or two, "'I've paid a deal of money. "'I was determined my son should have a good education. "'I'd none myself, and I felt the miss of it. "'And he'll want no other fortin. "'That's what I say, if Wakem was to get the better of me again.' "'The thought of Wakem roused new vibrations, "'and after a moment's pause he began to look at the coat he had on, and to feel in his side-pocket. Then he turned to Tom, and said in his old, sharp way, "'Where have they put Gore's letter?' It was close at hand in a drawer, for he had often asked for it before. "'You know what there is in the letter, father?' said Tom, as he gave it to him. "'To be sure I do,' said Mr. Tulliver, rather angrily, "'What of that? If Furley can't take to the property, somebody else can. There's plenty of people in the world besides Furley, but it's hindering. My not being well. Go and tell em to get the horse in the gig, look. I can get down to St. Ogg's well enough. Gore's expecting me.' "'No, dear father,' Maggie burst out entreatingly. "'It's a very long while since all that. You've been ill a great many weeks.' "'More than two months. Everything is changed.' Mr. Tulliver looked at them all three alternately with a startled gaze. The idea that much had happened of which he knew nothing had often transiently arrested him before, but it came upon him now with entire novelty. "'Yes, father,' said Tom, in answer to the gaze. "'You needn't trouble your mind about business until you are quite well. Everything is settled about that for the present, about the mill, and the land, and the debts.' "'What's settled, then?' said his father angrily. "'Don't you take on too much about it, sir,' said Luke. "'You'd have paid everybody if you could. That's what I said to Master Tom. I said you'd have paid everybody if you could.' Good look felt after the manner of contented, hard-working men whose lives have been spent in servitude, that sense of natural fitness in rank which made his master's downfall a tragedy to him. He was urged, in his slow way, to say something that would express his share in the family sorrow, and these words, 
which he had used over and over again to Tom when he wanted to decline the full payment of his fifty pounds out of the children's money, were the most ready to his tongue. They were just the words to lay the most painful hold on his master's bewildered mind. "'Paid everybody?' he said, with vehement agitation, his face flushing and his eye lighting up. "'Why, what, have they made me a bankrupt?' "'Oh, father, dear father,' said Maggie, who thought that terrible word really represented the fact, "'bear it well, because we love you. Your children will always love you. Tom will pay them all. He says he will when he's a man.' She felt her father beginning to tremble. His voice trembled, too, as he said, after a few moments, "'Ay, my little wench, but I shall never live twice, o'er. "'But perhaps you will live to see me pay everybody, father,' said Tom, speaking with a great effort. "'Ah, my lad,' said Mr. Tulliver, shaking his head slowly, "'but what's broke?' "'Can never be whole again. "'It would be your doing, not mine.' "'Then, looking up at him, "'You're only sixteen. "'It's an uphill fight for you, "'but you mustn't throw it at your father. "'The rascals have been too many for him. "'I've given you a good education. "'That'll start you.' "'Something in his throat half choked the last words.' the flush which had alarmed his children, because it had so often preceded a recurrence of paralysis, had subsided, and his face looked pale and tremulous. Tom said nothing. He was still struggling against his inclination to rush away. His father remained quiet a minute or two, but his mind did not seem to be wandering again. "'Have they sold me up, then?' he said, more calmly, as if he were possessed simply by the desire to know what had happened. "'Everything is sold, father, but we don't know all about the mill and the land yet,' said Tom, anxious to ward off any question leading to the fact that Wakeham was the purchaser. "'You must not be surprised to see the room look very bare downstairs, father,' said Maggie. "'But there's your chair and the bureau. They're not gone.' "'Let us go. Help me down, Luke. I'll go and see everything,' said Mr. Tulliver, leaning on his stick, and stretching out his other hand towards Luke. "'Aye, sir,' said Luke, as he gave his arm to his master, "'you'll make up your mind to it a bit better when you've seen everything. You'll get used to it. That's what my mother says about her shortness of breath. She says she's made friends with it now.' though she fought again it saw when it fust come on. Maggie ran on before to see that all was right in the dreary parlour, where the fire, dulled by the frosty sunshine, seemed part of the general shabbiness. She turned her father's chair, and pushed aside the table to make an easy way for him, and then stood with a beating heart to see him enter and look round for the first time. Tom advanced before him, carrying the leg-rest, and stood beside Maggie on the hearth. Of those two young hearts, Tom's suffered the most unmixed pain, for Maggie, with all her keen susceptibility, yet felt as if the sorrow made larger room for her love to flow in, and gave breathing space to her passionate nature. No true boy feels that. He would rather go and slay the Nemean lion or perform any round of heroic harbours than endure perpetual appeals to his pity, for evils over which he can make no conquest. Mr. Tulliver paused just inside the door, resting on Luke, and looking round him at all the bare places which for him were filled with the shadows of departed objects, the daily companions of his life. His faculties seemed to be renewing their strength from getting a footing on this demonstration of the senses. 
"'Ah,' he said, slowly moving towards his chair, "'they've sold me up. They've sold me up.' Then, seating himself, and laying down his stick while Luke left the room, he looked round again. "'Then left the big Bible,' he said. "'It's got everything in. When I was born and married, bring it me, Tom.' The quarto Bible was laid open before him at the fly-leaf, and while he was reading with slowly travelling eyes, Mrs. Tulliver entered the room, but stood in mute surprise to find her husband down already, and with the great Bible before him. "'Ah!' he said, looking at a spot where his finger rested. "'My mother was Margaret Beaton. She died when she was forty-seven. Hers wasn't a long-lived family. We're our mother's children. Gritty and me are. We shall go to our last bed before long. He seemed to be pausing over the record of his sister's birth and marriage, as if it were suggesting new thoughts to them. Then he suddenly looked up at Tom, and said, in a sharp tone of alarm, "'They haven't come upon Moss for the money as I lent him, have they?' "'No, father,' said Tom. "'The note was burnt.' Mr. Tulliver turned his eyes on the page again, and presently said, "'Ah, Elizabeth Dodson. It's eighteen years since I married her.' "'Come next lady day,' said Mrs. Tulliver, going up to his side and looking at the page. Her husband fixed his eyes earnestly on her face. "'Poor Bessie,' he said. "'You was a pretty lass then. Everybody said so, and I used to think you kept your good looks rarely. But you're sorely aged. Don't you bear me ill will. I meant to do well by you. We promised one another for better or for worse.' "'But I never thought it'd be so for worse as this,' said poor Mrs. Tulliver, with the strange, scared look that had come over her of late, and my poor father gave me away, and to come on so all at once. Oh, mother, said Maggie, don't talk in that way. No, I know you won't let your poor mother speak. That's been the way all my life. Your father never minded what I said. It would have been a no use for me to beg and pray, and it'd be no use now, not if I was to go down on my hands and knees. "'Don't say so, Bessie,' said Mr. Tulliver, whose pride, in these first moments of humiliation, was in abeyance to the sense of some justice in his wife's reproach. "'If there's anything left as I could do to make you amends, I wouldn't say you nay.' "'Then we might stay here and get a living, and I might keep among my own sisters, and me being such a good wife to you, and never crossed you from week's end to week's end, and they all say so. They say it'd be nothing but right, only you're so turned against Wakem. "'Mother,' said Tom severely, "'this is not the time to talk about that.' "'Let her be,' said Mr. Tulliver. "'Say what you mean, Bessie. "'Why, now the mill and the land's all Wakem's, "'and he's got everything in his hands. "'What's the use of setting your face against him? "'When he says you may stay here and speaks as fair as can be, "'and says you may manage the business and have thirty shilling a week "'and a horse to ride about to market,' "'And where have we got to put our heads? "'We must go into one of the cottages in the village, "'and me and my children brought down to that, "'and all because you must set your mind against folks "'till there's no turning you.' "'Mr. Tulliver had sunk back in his chair, trembling. "'You may do as you like wi' me, Bessie,' he said in a low voice, "'I'n been the bringing of you to poverty. "'This world's too many for me. "'I'm naught but a bankrupt. "'It's no use standing up for anything now.' 
father said tom i don't agree with my mother or my uncles and i don't think you ought to submit to be under wakem i get a pound a week now and you can find something else to do when you get well say no more tom say no more i've had enough for this day give me a kiss bessie and let us bear one another no ill will we shall never be young again this world's been too many for me end of chapter 8 of book 3rd recording by tom denham chapter 9 of book 3rd of the mill on the floss by george eliot this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by tom denham an item added to the family register that first moment of renunciation and submission was followed by days of violent struggle in the miller's mind as the gradual access of bodily strength brought with it increasing ability to embrace in one view all the conflicting conditions under which he found himself feeble limbs easily resign themselves to be tethered and when we are subdued by sickness it seems possible to us to fulfil pledges which the old vigour comes back and breaks there were times when poor tulliver thought the fulfilment of his promise to bessie was something quite too hard for human nature he had promised her without knowing what she was going to say she might as well have asked him to carry a ton weight on his back but again there were many feelings arguing on her side besides the sense that life had been made hard to her by having married him he saw a possibility by much pinching of saving money out of his salary towards paying a second dividend to his creditors and it would not be easy elsewhere to get a situation such as he could fill he had led an easy life ordering much and working little and had no aptitude for any new business he must perhaps take to day labour and his wife must have help from her sisters a prospect doubly bitter to him now they had let all bessie's precious things be sold probably because they liked to set her against him by making her feel that he had brought her to that pass he listened to their admonitory talk when they came to urge on him what he was bound to do for poor bessie's sake with averted eyes that every now and then flashed on them furtively when their backs were turned nothing but the dread of needing their help could have made it an easier alternative to take their advice but the strongest influence of all was the love of the old premises where he had run about when he was a boy just as tom had done after him the tullivers had lived on this spot for generations and he had sat listening on a low stool on winter evenings while his father talked of the old half-timbered mill that had been there before the last great floods which damaged it so that his grandfather pulled it down and built the new one it was when he got able to walk about and look at all the old objects that he felt the strain of this clinging affection for the old home as part of his life part of himself he couldn't bear to think of himself living on any other spot than this where he knew the sound of every gate and door and felt that the shape and colour of every roof and weather stain and broken hillock was good because his growing senses had been fed on them our instructed vagrancy which has hardly time to linger by the hedgerows but runs away early to the tropics and is at home with palms and banyans which is nourished on books of travel and stretches the theatre of its imagination to the zambezi can hardly get a dim notion of what an old-fashioned man like tulliver felt for this spot where all his memories centred and where life seemed like a familiar smooth-handled tool that the fingers clutch with loving ease 
and just now he was living in that freshened memory of the far-off time which comes to us in the passive hours of recovery from sickness. "'Ay, Luke,' he said one afternoon, as he stood looking over the orchard gate, "'I remember the day they planted those apple trees. My father was a huge man for planting. It was like a merry-making to him to get a cart full of young trees, and I used to stand at the cold with him and follow him about like a dog.' Then he turned round, and leaning against the gate-post, looked at the opposite buildings. "'The old mill had missed me, I think, Luke. There's a story as when the mill changes hands, the river's angry. I've heard my father say it many a time. There's no telling whether there mayn't be summat in the story, for this is a puzzling world, and old Harry's got a finger in it. It's been too many for me, I know.' "'Aye, sir,' said Luke, with soothing sympathy, what with the rust on the wheat, and the, the fire and the ricks and that, as I've seen in my time, things often looks comical. There's the bacon fat we our last pigs runs away like butter. It leaves naught but a scratching. It's just as if it was yesterday now, Mr. Tulver went on, when my father began the malting. I remember— the day they finished the malt house, I thought somewhat great was to come of it, for we'd a plum pudding that day and a bit of a feast, and I said to my mother, she was a fine dark-eyed woman, my mother was, the little wench shall be as like her as two peas. Here Mr. Tulliver put his stick between his legs, and took out his snuff-box for the greater enjoyment of this anecdote, which dropped from him in fragments, as if he, every other moment, lost narration in vision. I was a little chap, no higher much than my mother's knee. She was so fond of us children, gritty in me. And so I said to her, Mother, I said, shall we have plum pudding every day because of the malt house? She used to tell me of that, till her dying day. She was but a young woman when she died, my mother was. But it's forty good years since they've finished the malt house, and it isn't many days out of em all, as I haven't looked out into the yard there, the first thing in the morning, all weathers, from year's end to year's end. I should go off my head in a new place. I should be like as if I'd lost me way. It's all hard, whichever way I look at it. The harness'll gall me, but it'd be summat to draw along the old road instead of a new one. Ay, sir, said Luke, you'd be a deal better here nor in some new place. I can't abide new places, Miss En. Things is all as awkward. Narrow wheeled wagons belike, and the styles all another sort, and oat cake is some places toward the head of the floss there. It's poor work changing your countryside. But I doubt, Luke, they'll be forgetting rid of Ben, and making you do with a lad, and I must help a bit with a mill. You'll have a worse place. Ne'er mind, sir, said Luke. I shan't plague Miss En. I'n been with you twenty year, and you can't get twenty year we're whistling for em. "'No more nor you can make the trees grow. "'You mun wait till God Almighty sends em. "'I can't abide new victual nor new faces, I can't. "'You never know but what they'll gripe you.' "'The walk was finished in silence after this, "'for Luke had disburdened himself of thoughts "'to an extent that left his conversational resources quite barren. "'And Mr. Tulliver, had relapsed from his recollections into a painful meditation on the choice of hardships before him. Maggie noticed that he was unusually absent that evening at tea, and afterwards he sat leaning forward in his chair, looking at the ground, moving his lips, and shaking his head from time to time. Then he looked hard at Mrs. Tulliver, who was knitting opposite him, 
then at Maggie, who, as she bent over her sewing, was intensely conscious of some drama going forward in her father's mind. Suddenly he took up the poker and broke the large coal fiercely. "'To your heart, Mr. Tulliver, what can you be thinking of?' said his wife, looking up in alarm. "'It's very wasteful breaking the coal, and we've got hardly any large coal left, and I don't know where the rest is to come from.' "'I don't think you're quite so well to-night, are you, father?' said Maggie. "'You seem uneasy.' "'Why, how is it Tom doesn't come?' said Mr. Tulliver impatiently. "'Dear heart, is it time? I must go and get his supper.' said Mrs. Tulliver, laying down her knitting and leaving the room. "'It's nigh upon half-past eight, said Mr. Tulliver. "'He'll be here soon. "'Go, go and get the big Bible, and open it at the beginning, where everything's set down, and get the pen and ink.' Maggie obeyed, wondering, but her father gave no further orders, and only sat listening for Tom's footfall on the gravel, apparently irritated by the wind which had risen and was roaring so as to drown all other sounds. There was a strange light in his eyes that rather frightened Maggie. She began to wish that Tom would come too. "'There he is, then,' said Mr. Tulliver, in an excited way, when the knock came at last. Maggie went to open the door, but her mother came out of the kitchen hurriedly, saying— "'Stop a bit, Maggie. I'll open it.' Mrs. Tulliver had begun to be a little frightened at her boy, but she was jealous of every office others did for him. "'Your supper's ready by the kitchen fire, me boy,' she said, as she took off his hat and coat. "'You shall have it by yourself, just as you like, and I won't speak to you.' "'I think my father wants Tom, mother,' said Maggie. "'He must come into the parlour first. Tom entered with his usual saddened evening face, but his eyes fell immediately on the open Bible and the inkstand, and he glanced with a look of anxious surprise at his father, who was saying, "'Come, come, you're late. I want you.' "'Is there anything the matter, father?' said Tom. "'You sit down, all of you,' said Mr. Tulliver peremptorily. "'And, Tom, sit down here. I've got something for you to write in the Bible.' They all three sat down, looking at him. He began to speak, slowly, looking first at his wife. "'I've made up my mind, Bessie, and I'll be as good as my word to you.' "'There's the same grave made for us to lie down in, "'and we mustn't be bearing one another ill will. "'I'll stop in the old place, and I'll serve under Wakeham, "'and I'll serve him like an honest man. "'There's no Tulliver but what's honest, mind that, Tom.' "'Here his voice rose. "'They'll have it to throw up against me as I paid a dividend.' "'But it wasn't my fault. "'It was because there's rascals in the world. "'They've been too many for me, and I must give in. "'I'll put my neck in harness, "'for you've a right to say as I've brought you into trouble, Bessie, "'and I'll serve him as honest as if he was no rascal. "'I'm an honest man, though I shall never hold my head up no more. "'I'm a tree as is broke.' "'A tree, as is broke.' He paused and looked on the ground. Then suddenly, raising his head, he said in a louder yet deeper tone, "'But I won't forgive him. I know what they say. He never meant me any harm. That's the way old Harry props up the rascals. He's been at the bottom of everything.' "'But he's a fine gentleman. I know, I know. "'I shouldn't have gone to law, they say. "'But who made it so as there was no arbitrating and no justice to be got? "'It signifies nothing to him. I know that.' 
"'He's one of them fine gentlemen as get money by doing business for poorer folks, "'and when he's made beggars of him, he'll give em charity. "'I won't forgive him. "'I wish he might be punished with shame till his own son had liked to forget him. "'I wish he may do summat as they'd make him work at the treadmill. "'But he won't. "'He's too big a rascal to let the law lay hold on him. "'And you mind this, Tom.' "'You never forgive him neither, if you mean to be my son. "'There'll maybe come a time when you may make him feel, "'it'll never come to me, and got my head under the yoke. "'Now write, write it in the Bible.' "'Oh, father, what?' said Maggie, sinking down by his knee, pale and trembling. "'It's wicked to curse and bear malice.' "'It isn't wicked, I tell you,' said her father fiercely. "'It's wicked as the rascals should prosper. It's the devil's doing. Do as I tell you, Tom. Write.' "'What am I to write, father?' said Tom, with gloomy submission. "'Write as your father, Edward Tulliver, took service under John Wakem. "'the man as had helped to ruin him, "'because I'd promised my wife to make her "'what amends I could for her trouble, "'and because I wanted to die in the old place "'where I was born and my father was born. "'Put that in the right words. "'You know how. "'And then write, as I don't forgive Wakem for all that, "'and for all I'll serve him honest, "'I wish evil may befall him. Write that!' There was a dead silence as Tom's pen moved along the paper. Mrs. Tulliver looked scared, and Maggie trembled like a leaf. "'Now, let me hear what you've wrote,' said Mr. Tulliver. Tom read aloud slowly. "'Now write!' "'Write as you'll remember what Wakem's done to your father, "'and you'll make him and his feel it if ever the day comes. "'And sign your name Thomas Tulliver.' "'Oh, no, father, dear father,' said Maggie, almost choked with fear. "'You shouldn't make Tom write that.' "'Be quiet, Maggie,' said Tom. "'I shall write it.' End of chapter 9 of Book 3rd End of Book 3rd Recording by Tom Denham Chapter 1 of Book 4th of The Mill on the Floss by George Eliot This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Tom Denham Book 4th the Valley of Humiliation Chapter 1 A Variation of Protestantism Unknown to Bossuet Journeying down the Rhone on a summer's day, you have perhaps felt the sunshine made dreary by those ruined villages which stud the banks in certain parts of its course, telling how the swift river once rose like an angry, destroying god, sweeping down the feeble generations whose breath is in their nostrils, and making their dwellings a desolation. Strange contrast, you may have thought, between the effect produced on us by these dismal remnants of commonplace houses, which in their best days were but the sign of a sordid life, belonging in all its details to our own vulgar era, and the effect produced by those ruins on the castle Rhine, which have crumbled and mellowed into such harmony with the green and rocky steeps, that they seem to have a natural fitness, like the mountain pine. Nay, even in the day when they were built, they must have had this fitness, as if they had been raised by an earth-born race, who had inherited from their mighty parent a sublime instinct of form." and that was a day of romance. If those robber barons were somewhat grim and drunken ogres, they had a certain grandeur of the wild beast in them. They were forest boars with tusks, tearing and rending, not the ordinary domestic grunter. 
They represented the demon forces forever in collision with beauty, virtue, and the gentle uses of life. They made a fine contrast in the picture with the wandering minstrel, the soft-lipped princess, the pious recluse, and the timid Israelite. That was a time of colour, when the sunlight fell on glancing steel and floating banners, a time of adventure and fierce struggle, nay, of living religious art and religious enthusiasm. For were not cathedrals built in those days, and did not great emperors leave their western palaces to die before the infidel strongholds in the sacred east? Therefore it is that these Rhine castles thrill me with a sense of poetry. They belong to the grand historic life of humanity, and raise up for me the vision of an epoch. But these dead-tinted, hollow-eyed, angular skeletons of villages on the Rhone oppress me with the feeling that human life, very much of it, is a narrow, ugly, grovelling existence, which even calamity does not elevate, but rather tends to exhibit in all its bare vulgarity of conception. And I have a cruel conviction that the lives these ruins are the traces of were part of a gross sum of obscure vitality that will be swept into the same oblivion with the generations of ants and beavers. Perhaps something akin to this oppressive feeling may have weighed upon you in watching this old-fashioned family life on the banks of the floss, which even sorrow hardly suffices to lift above the level of the tragicomic. It is a sordid life, you say, this of the Tullivers and Dodsons, irradiated by no sublime principles, no romantic visions, no active self-renouncing faith, moved by none of those wild, uncontrollable passions which create the dark shadows of misery and crime, without that primitive rough simplicity of wants, that hard submissive ill-paid toil, that childlike spelling out of what nature has written, which gives its poetry to peasant life. Here one has conventional worldly notions and habits without instruction and without polish, surely the most prosaic form of human life, proud respectability in a gig of unfashionable build, worldliness without side-dishes. Observing these people narrowly, even when the iron hand of misfortune has shaken them from their unquestioning hold on the world, one sees little trace of religion, still less of a distinctively Christian creed. Their belief in the unseen, so far as it manifests itself at all, seems to be rather of a pagan kind. Their moral notions, though held with strong tenacity, seem to have no standard beyond hereditary custom. You could not live among such people. You are stifled for want of an outlet towards something beautiful, great, or noble. You are irritated with these dull men and women, as a kind of population out of keeping with the earth on which they live. With this rich plain where the great river flows forever onward, and links the small pulse of the old English town with the beatings of the world's mighty heart. A vigorous superstition, that lashes its gods or lashes its own back, seems to be more congruous with the mystery of the human lot than the mental condition of these Emmet-like Dodsons and Tullivers. I share with you this sense of oppressive narrowness, but it is necessary that we should feel it if we care to understand how it acted on the lives of Tom and Maggie, how it has acted on young natures in many generations that in the onward tendency of human things have risen above the mental level of the generation before them, to which they have been nevertheless tied by the strongest fibres of their hearts. The suffering, whether of martyr or victim, which belongs to every historical advance of mankind, is represented in this way in every town, and by hundreds of obscure hearths. 
and we need not shrink from this comparison of small things with great, for does not science tell us that its highest striving is after the ascertainment of a unity which shall bind the smallest things with the greatest? In natural science, I have understood, there is nothing petty to the mind that has a large vision of relations, and to which every single object suggests a vast sum of conditions. It is surely the same with the observation of human life. Certainly, the religious and moral ideas of the Dodsons and Tullivers were of too specific a kind to be arrived at deductively from the statement that they were part of the Protestant population of Great Britain. Their theory of life had its core of soundness, as all theories must have, on which decent and prosperous families have been reared and have flourished. But it had the very slightest tincture of theology. If, in the maiden days of the Dodson sisters, their Bibles opened more easily at some parts than others, it was because of dried tulip petals which had been distributed quite impartially, without preference for the historical, devotional, or doctrinal. Their religion was of a simple, semi-pagan kind, but there was no heresy in it, if heresy properly means choice, for they didn't know there was any other religion except that of chapel-goers, which appeared to run in families, like asthma. How should they know? The vicar of their pleasant rural parish was not a controversialist, but a good hand at whist and one who had a joke always ready for a blooming female parishioner. The religion of the Dodsons consisted in revering whatever was customary and respectable. It was necessary to be baptised, else one could not be buried in the churchyard, and to take the sacrament before death as a security against more dimly understood perils. But it was of equal necessity to have the proper pallbearers and well-cured hams at one's funeral, and to leave an unimpeachable will. A Dodson would not be taxed with the omission of anything that was becoming, or that belonged to that eternal fitness of things which was plainly indicated in the practice of the most substantial parishioners. And in the family traditions, such as obedience to parents, faithfulness to kindred, industry, rigid honesty, thrift, the thorough scouring of wooden and copper utensils, the hoarding of coins likely to disappear from the currency, the production of first-rate commodities for the market, and the general preference for whatever was home-made. The Dodsons were a very proud race, and their pride lay in the utter frustration of all desire to tax them with a breach of traditional duty or propriety. A wholesome pride in many respects, since it identified honour with perfect integrity, thoroughness of work, and faithfulness to admitted rules. And society owes some worthy qualities in many of her members to mothers of the Dodson class, who made their butter and their fromenty well, and would have felt disgraced to make it otherwise. To be honest and poor was never a Dodson motto, still less to seem rich though being poor. Rather, the family badge was to be honest and rich, and not only rich, but richer than was supposed, to live respected and have the proper bearers at your funeral, was an achievement of the ends of existence that would be entirely nullified if, on the reading of your will, you sank in the opinion of your fellow men, either by turning out to be poorer than they expected, or by leaving your money in a capricious manner, without strict regard to degrees of kin. The right thing must always be done towards kindred, the right thing was to correct them severely, if they were other than a credit to the family, but still not to alienate from them the smallest rightful share in the family shoe-buckles and other property. 
A conspicuous quality in the Dodson character was its genuineness. Its vices and virtues alike were phases of a proud, honest egoism, which had a hearty dislike to whatever made against its own credit and interest, and would be frankly hard of speech to inconvenient kin, but would never forsake or ignore them, would not let them want bread, but only require them to eat it with bitter herbs. The same sort of traditional belief ran in the Tulliver veins, but it was carried in richer blood, having elements of generous imprudence, warm affection, and hot-tempered rashness. Mr. Tulliver's grandfather had been heard to say that he was descended from one Ralph Tulliver, a wonderfully clever fellow who had ruined himself. It is likely enough that the clever Ralph was a high liver, rode spirited horses, and was very decidedly of his own opinion. On the other hand, nobody had ever heard of a Dodson who had ruined himself. It was not the way of that family. If such were the views of life on which the Dodsons and Tullivers had been reared in the praiseworthy past of pit and high prices, you will infer from what you already know concerning the state of society in St. Ogg's that there had been no highly modifying influence to act on them in their maturer life. It was still possible, even in that later time of anti-Catholic preaching, for people to hold many pagan ideas and believe themselves good church people notwithstanding. So we need hardly feel any surprise at the fact that Mr. Tulliver, though a regular church-goer, recorded his vindictiveness on the fly-leaf of his Bible. It was not that any harm could be said concerning the vicar of that charming rural parish to which Dorcott Mill belonged. He was a man of excellent family, an irreproachable bachelor of elegant pursuits, had taken honours, and held a fellowship. Mr. Tulliver regarded him with dutiful respect, as he did everything else belonging to the church service, but he considered that church was one thing, and common sense another, and he wanted nobody to tell him what common sense was. Certain seeds which are required to find a nidus for themselves under unfavourable circumstances have been supplied by nature with an apparatus of hooks, so that they will get a hold on very unreceptive surfaces. The spiritual seed which had been scattered over Mr. Tulliver had apparently been destitute of any corresponding provision, and had slipped off to the winds again, from a total absence of hooks. End of chapter 1 of Book 4 Recording by Tom Denham Chapter 2 of Book 4 of The Mill on the Floss by George Eliot This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Tom Denham The torn nest is pierced by the thorns. There is something sustaining in the very agitation that accompanies the first shocks of trouble, just as an acute pain is often a stimulus, and produces an excitement which is transient strength. It is in the slow, changed life that follows, in the time when sorrow has become stale, and has no longer any motive intensity that counteracts its pain in the time when day follows day in dull, unexpectant sameness, and trial is a dreary routine. It is then that despair threatens, it is then that the peremptory hunger of the soul is felt, and eye and ear are strained after some unlearned secret of our existence, which shall give to endurance the nature of satisfaction." This time of utmost need was come to Maggie, with her short span of thirteen years. To the usual precocity of the girl, 
she added that early experience of struggle, of conflict between the inward impulse and outward fact, which is the lot of every imaginative and passionate nature, and the years since she hammered the nails into her wooden fetish among the worm-eaten shelves of the attic had been filled with so eager a life in the triple world of reality, books, and waking dreams, that Maggie was strangely old for her years in everything except in her entire want of that prudence and self-command which were the qualities that made Tom manly in the midst of his intellectual boyishness. And now her lot was beginning to have a still, sad monotony, which threw her more than ever on her inward self. Her father was able to attend to business again, his affairs were settled, and he was acting as Wakeham's manager on the old spot. Tom went to and fro every morning and evening, and became more and more silent in the short intervals at home. What was there to say? One day was like another, and Tom's interest in life, driven back and crushed on every other side, was concentrating itself into the one channel of ambitious resistance to misfortune. The peculiarities of his father and mother were very irksome to him, now they were laid bare of all the softening accompaniments of an easy, prosperous home. For Tom had very clear, prosaic eyes, not apt to be dimmed by mists of feeling or imagination. Poor Mrs. Tulliver, it seemed, would never recover her old self, her placid household activity. How could she? The objects among which her mind had moved complacently were all gone. All the little hopes and schemes and speculations, all the pleasant little cares about her treasures, which had made this world quite comprehensible to her for a quarter of a century, since she had made her first purchase of the sugar-tongs, had been suddenly snatched away from her, and she remained bewildered in this empty life. Why that should have happened to her, which had not happened to other women, remained an insoluble question, by which she expressed her perpetual ruminating comparison of the past with the present. It was piteous to see the comely woman getting thinner and more worn under a bodily as well as mental restlessness, which made her often wander about the empty house after her work was done, until Maggie, becoming alarmed about her, would seek her and bring her down by telling her how it vexed Tom that she was injuring her health by never sitting down and resting herself. Yet, amidst this helpless imbecility, there was a touching trait of humble, self-devoting maternity, which made Maggie feel tenderly towards her poor mother, amidst all the little wearing griefs caused by her mental feebleness. She would let Maggie do none of the work that was heaviest and most soiling to the hands, and was quite peevish when Maggie attempted to relieve her from her great brushing and scouring. "'Let it alone, me dear. Your hands'll get as hard as hard,' she would say. "'It's your mother's place to do that. I can't do the sewing. My eyes fail me.' And she would still brush and carefully tend Maggie's hair, which she had become reconciled to in spite of its refusal to curl, now it was so long and massy. Maggie was not her pet child, and in general would have been much better if she had been quite different. Yet the womanly heart, so bruised in its small personal desires, found a future to rest on in the life of this young thing, and the mother pleased herself with wearing out her own hands to save the hands that had so much more life in them. But the constant presence of her mother's regretful bewilderment was less painful to Maggie than that of her father's sullen, incommunicative depression. As long as the paralysis was upon him, 
and it seemed as if he might always be in a childlike condition of dependence, as long as he was still only half awakened to his trouble, Maggie had felt the strong tide of pitying love almost as an inspiration, a new power that would make the most difficult life easy for his sake. But now, instead of childlike dependence, there had come a taciturn, hard concentration of purpose, in strange contrast with his old vehement communicativeness and high spirit, and this lasted from day to day and from week to week, the dull eye never brightening with any eagerness or any joy. It is something cruelly incomprehensible to youthful natures, this sombre sameness in middle-aged and elderly people, whose life has resulted in disappointment and discontent, to whose faces a smile becomes so strange that the sad lines are all about the lips and brow seem to take no notice of it, and it hurries away again for want of a welcome. "'Why will they not kindle up and be glad sometimes?' thinks young Elasticity. "'It would be so easy if they only liked to do it.' And these leaden clouds that never part are apt to create impatience even in the filial affection that streams forth in nothing but tenderness and pity in the time of more obvious affliction. Mr. Tulliver lingered nowhere away from home. He hurried away from market. He refused all invitations to stay and chat as in old times in the houses where he called on business. He could not be reconciled with his lot. There was no attitude in which his pride did not feel its bruises, and in all behaviour toward him, whether kind or cold, he detected an allusion to the change in his circumstances. Even the days on which Wakeham came to ride round the land and inquire into the business were not so black to him as those market days on which he had met several creditors who had accepted a composition from him. To save something towards the repayment of those creditors was the object toward which he was now bending all his thoughts and efforts, and under the influence of this all-compelling demand of his nature, the somewhat profuse man, who hated to be stinted or to stint any one else in his own house, was gradually metamorphosed into the keen-eyed grudger of morsels. Mrs. Tulliver could not economise enough to satisfy him in their food and firing, and he would eat nothing himself but what was of the coarsest quality. Tom, though depressed and strongly repelled by his father's sullenness and the dreariness of home, entered thoroughly into his father's feelings about paying the creditors, and the poor lad brought his first quarter's money with a delicious sense of achievement, and gave it to his father to put into the tin box which held the savings. The little store of sovereigns in the tin box seemed to be the only sight that brought a faint beam of pleasure into the miller's eyes, faint and transient, for it was soon dispelled by the thought that the time would be long, perhaps longer than his life, before the narrow savings could remove the hateful incubus of debt. A deficit of more than five hundred pounds, with the accumulating interest, seemed a deep pit to fill with the savings from thirty shillings a week, even when Tom's probable savings were to be added. On this one point, there was entire community of feeling in the four widely differing beings who sat round the dying fire of sticks which made a cheap warmth for them on the verge of bedtime. Mrs. Tulliver carried the proud integrity of the Dodsons in her blood, and had been brought up to think that to wrong people of their money, which was another phrase for debt, was a sort of moral pillory. It would have been wickedness to her mind to have run counter to her husband's desire to do the right thing, and retrieve his name. 
she had a confused, dreamy notion that if the creditors were all paid, her plate and linen ought to come back to her, but she had an inbred perception that while people owed money they were unable to pay, they couldn't rightly call anything their own. She murmured a little that Mr. Tulliver so peremptorily refused to receive anything in repayment from Mr. and Mrs. Moss, but to all his requirements of household economy she was submissive to the point of denying herself the cheapest indulgences of mere flavour. Her only rebellion was to smuggle into the kitchen something that would make rather a better supper than usual for Tom. These narrow notions about debt, held by the old-fashioned Tullivers, may perhaps excite a smile on the faces of many readers in these days of wide commercial views and wide philosophy, according to which everything writes itself without any trouble of ours. The fact that my tradesman is out of pocket by me is to be looked at through the serene certainty that somebody else's tradesman is in pocket by somebody else and since there must be bad debts in the world, why, it is mere egoism not to like that we in particular should make them instead of our fellow citizens. I am telling the history of very simple people, who had never had any illuminating doubts as to personal integrity and honour. Under all this grim melancholy and narrowing concentration of desire, Mr. Tulliver retained the feeling towards his little wench, which made her presence a need to him, though it would not suffice to cheer him. She was still the desire of his eyes, but the sweet spring of fatherly love was now mingled with bitterness, like everything else. When Maggie laid down her work at night, it was her habit to get a low stool and sit by her father's knee, leaning her cheek against it. How she wished he would stroke her head, or give some sign that he was soothed by the sense that he had a daughter who loved him. But now she got no answer to her little caresses, either from her father or from Tom, the two idols of her life. Tom was weary and abstracted in the short intervals when he was at home, and her father was bitterly preoccupied with the thought that the girl was growing up, was shooting up into a woman, and how was she to do well in life? She had a poor chance for marrying, down in the world as they were, and he hated the thought of her marrying poorly, as her Aunt Gritty had done. That would be a thing to make him turn in his grave. The little wench so pulled down by children and toil as her Aunt Moss was. When uncultured minds, confined to a narrow range of personal experience, are under the pressure of continued misfortune, their inward life is apt to become a perpetually repeated round of sad and bitter thoughts. The same words, the same scenes, are evolved over and over again. The same mood accompanies them. The end of the year finds them as much what they were at the beginning, as if they were machines set to a recurrent series of movements. The sameness of the days was broken by few visitors. Uncles and aunts paid only short visits now. Of course they could not stay to meals, and the constraint caused by Mr. Tulliver's savage silence which seemed to add to the hollow resonance of the bare, uncarpeted room when the aunts were talking, heightened the unpleasantness of these family visits on all sides, and tended to make them rare. As for other acquaintances, there is a chill air surrounding those who are down in the world, and people are glad to get away from them, as from a cold room. Human beings, mere men and women, without furniture, without anything to offer you, who have ceased to count as anybody, present an embarrassing negation of reasons for wishing to see them, 
or of subjects on which to converse with them. At that distant day there was a dreary isolation in the civilised Christian society of these realms for families that had dropped below their original level, unless they belonged to a sectarian church which gets some warmth of brotherhood by walling in the sacred fire. End of chapter 2 of Book 4 Recording by Tom Denham Part 1 of Chapter 3 of Book 4 of The Mill on the Floss by George Eliot This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Tom Denham A Voice from the Past One afternoon, when the chestnuts were coming into flower, Maggie had brought her chair outside the front door, and was seated there with a book on her knees. Her dark eyes had wandered from the book, but they did not seem to be enjoying the sunshine which pierced the screen of jasmine on the projecting porch at her right, and threw leafy shadows on her pale round cheek. They seemed rather to be searching for something that was not disclosed by the sunshine. It had been a more miserable day than usual. Her father, after a visit of Wakeham's, had had a paroxysm of rage, in which for some trifling fault he had beaten the boy who served in the mill. Once before, since his illness, he had had a similar paroxysm in which he had beaten his horse, and the scene had left a lasting terror in Maggie's mind. The thought had risen that some time or other he might beat her mother if she happened to speak in her feeble way at the wrong moment. The keenest of all dread with her was lest her father should add to his present misfortune the wretchedness of doing something irretrievably disgraceful. The battered school-book of Tom's, which she held on her knees, could give her no fortitude under the pressure of that dread and again and again her eyes had filled with tears as they wandered vaguely, seeing neither the chestnut trees nor the distant horizon, but only future scenes of home sorrow. Suddenly she was roused by the sound of the opening gate, and of footsteps on the gravel. It was not Tom who was entering, but a man in a sealskin cap and a blue plush waistcoat, carrying a pack on his back, and followed closely by a bull-terrier of brindled coat and defiant aspect. "'Oh, Bob, it's you!' said Maggie, starting up with a smile of pleased recognition, for there had been no abundance of kind acts to efface the recollection of Bob's generosity. "'I'm so glad to see you!' "'Thank you, miss!' said Bob, lifting his cap and showing a delighted face, but immediately relieving himself of some accompanying embarrassment by looking down at his dog, and saying in a tone of disgust, "'Get out, will you, you thundering sawney!' "'My brother is not at home yet, Bob,' said Maggie. "'He is always at St. Ogg's in the daytime.' "'Well, miss,' said Bob, I should be glad to see Mr. Tom, but that isn't just what I'm come for. Look here. Bob was in the act of depositing his pack on the doorstep, and with it a row of small books fastened together with string. Apparently, however, they were not the object to which he wished to call Maggie's attention, but rather something which he had carried under his arm, wrapped in a red handkerchief. "'See here,' he said again, laying the red parcel on the others and unfolding it. "'You won't think I'm a-making too free, miss, I hope, but I lighted on these books, and I thought they might make up to you a bit for them as you've lost, for I heard you speak of pictures, and as for pictures, look here!' The opening of the red handkerchief had disclosed a superannuated keepsake, and six or seven numbers of A Portrait Gallery in Royal Octavo, and the emphatic request to look referred to a portrait of George the Fourth 
in all the majesty of his depressed cranium and voluminous neckcloth. "'There's all sorts of gentlemen here,' Bob went on, turning over the leaves with some excitement. "'We all sorts of noses, and some bald, and some were wigs. Parliament gentlemen, I reckon. And here,' he added, opening the keepsake, "'here's ladies for you. Some with curly hair, and some with smooth, and some are smiling with their heads a one side, and some as if they was going to cry. Look here, a sitting on the ground out a door, dressed like the ladies I'n seen get out of the carriages at the balls in the old hall there. My eyes! I wonder what the chaps wear as go a court in em. I sot up till the clock was gone twelve last night, a looking at em I did till they stared at me out of the pictures, as if they'd know when I spoke to em. But, laws, I shouldn't know what to say to em. They'll be more fit and company for you, miss, and the man at the bookstall, he said they banged everything for pictures. He said there was a first-rate article. "'And you've brought them for me, Bob?' said Maggie, deeply touched by this simple kindness. "'How very, very good of you! "'But I'm afraid you gave a great deal of money for them.' "'Not me,' said Bob. "'I'd a give three times the money "'if they'll make up to you a bit as for them "'as was sold away from you, miss, "'for I never forgot how you looked "'when you fretted about the books being gone. "'It stuck by me, as if it was a picter hanging before me. "'And when I see the book,' up and upon the stall, with a lady looking out of it, with eyes a bit like yourn when you was fretting. You'll excuse me taking the liberty, miss. I thought I'd make free to buy it for you. And then I bought the books full of gentlemen to match, and then— Here Bob took up the small stringed packet of books. I thought you might like a bit more print as well as the pictures, and I got these for a say-so. They're cram full of print, and I thought they'd do no harm coming along with these bettermost books. And I hope you won't say me nay, and tell me as you won't have em, like Mr. Tom did with the sovereigns. No, indeed, Bob, said Maggie. I'm very thankful to you for thinking of me and being so good to me and Tom. I don't think any one ever did such a kind thing for me before. I haven't many friends who care for me. Have a dog, miss. They're better friends nor any Christian, said Bob, laying down his pack again, which he had taken up with the intention of hurrying away, for he felt considerable shyness in talking to a young lass like Maggie, though, as he usually said of himself, his tongue overrun him when he began to speak. I can't give you mumps, "'because he'd break his heart to go away from me. "'Hey, Mumps, what do you say, you riff-raff?' "'Mumps declined to express himself more diffusely "'than by a single affirmative movement of his tail. "'But I'll get you a pup, miss, and welcome.' "'No, thank you, Bob. "'We have a yard dog, and I mayn't keep a dog of my own.' "'Eh, hey, that's a pity. "'Else there's a pup.' "'If you don't mind about it not being thoroughbred, "'its mother acts in the punch show, "'an uncommon sensible bitch. "'She seems more sense with her bark "'nor half the chaps can put into their talk "'from breakfast to sundown. "'There's one chap carries pots, "'a poor low trade as any on the road. "'He says, "'Why, Toby's not but a mongrel. "'There's not to look at in her. "'But I says to him, "'Why, what do you, you send but a mongrel?' "'There wasn't much picking o' your father and mother to look at you.' "'Not but what I like a bit of breed myself, "'but I can't abide to see one cur grinning at another.' "'I wish you good evening, miss,' said Bob, "'abruptly taking up his pack again, "'under the consciousness that his tongue was acting in an undisciplined manner. "'Won't you come in the evening some time and see my brother, Bob?' said Maggie. "'Yes, miss, thank you, another time. You'll give my duty to him, if you please. He is a fine growed chap, Mr. Tommies. He took to growing of the legs, and I didn't.' 
The pack was down again now, the hook of the stick having somehow gone wrong. "'You don't call Mumps a cur, I suppose,' said Maggie, divining that any interest she showed in Mumps would be gratifying to his master. "'No, miss, a fine way off that,' said Bob, with a pitying smile. "'Mumps is as fine a cross as you'll see anywhere along the floss, and i ain't been up it with the barges times in o. Why, the gentry stops to look at him, but you won't catch Mumps a-looking at the gentry much. He minds his own business, he does.' The expression of Mumps's face, which seemed to be tolerating the superfluous existence of objects in general, was strongly confirmatory of this high praise. "'He looks dreadfully surly,' said Maggie. "'Would he let me pat him?' "'Aye, that he wouldn't, thank you. He knows his company, Mumps does. He isn't a dog as'll be caught with gingerbread. He'll smell a thief a good deal stronger nor the gingerbread, he would. Laws, I talk to him by the hour together, when I'm walking alone places, and if I'm done a bit of mischief, I always tell him. I ain't got no secrets but what Mumps knows em. He knows about my big thumb, he does. Your big thumb? What's that, Bob? said Maggie. That's what it is, miss said Bob quickly, exhibiting a singularly broad specimen of that difference between the man and the monkey. It tells him measuring out the flannel, you see. I carry flannel because it's light for me pack, and it's dear stuff, you see, so a big thumb tells. I clap my thumb at the end of the yard, and cut to the hither side of it, and the old women aren't up to it. But Bob— said Maggie, looking serious. "'That's cheating. I don't like to hear you say that.' "'Don't you, miss?' said Bob, regretfully. "'Then I'm sorry I said it. But I'm so used to talking to Mumps, and he doesn't mind a bit of cheating when it's them skinflint women as haggle and haggle and had like to get their flannel for nothing, and had never ask theirselves how I got my dinner out on't. I never cheat anybody as doesn't want to cheat me, miss. Laws, I'm an honest chap, I am. Only I must have a bit of sport, and now I don't go with the ferrets. I ain't got no varmint to come over but them haggling women. I wish you good evening, miss. Good-bye, Bob. Thank you very much for bringing me the books. And come again to see Tom. Yes, miss, said Bob moving on a few steps. Then, turning half round, he said, "'I'll leave off that trick with my big thumb, if you don't think well on me for it, miss. But it'd be a pity it would. I couldn't find another trick so good. And what'd be the use of having a big thumb?' "'It might as well have been narrow. Maggie, thus exalted into Bob's directing Madonna, laughed in spite of herself, at which her worshipper's blue eyes twinkled too, and under these favouring auspices he touched his cap and walked away. The days of chivalry are not gone, notwithstanding Burke's grand dirge over them. They live still in that far-off worship, paid by many a youth and man to the woman of whom he never dreams that he shall touch so much as her little finger or the hem of her robe. Bob, with the pack on his back, had as respectful an adoration for this dark-eyed maiden as if he had been a knight in armour calling aloud on her name as he pricked on to the fight. That gleam of merriment soon died away from Maggie's face, and perhaps only made the returning gloom deeper by contrast. She was too dispirited even to like answering questions about Bob's present of books, and she carried them away to her bedroom, laying them down there, and seating herself on her one stool, without caring to look at them just yet. She leaned her cheek against the window-frame, and thought that the light-hearted Bob had a lot much happier than hers. 
Maggie's sense of loneliness and utter privation of joy had deepened with the brightness of advancing spring. All the favourite outdoor nooks about home, which seemed to have done their part with her parents in nurturing and cherishing her, were now mixed up with the home sadness, and gathered no smile from the sunshine. Every affection, every delight the poor child had had, was like an aching nerve to her. There was no music for her any more. No piano, no harmonised voices, no delicious stringed instruments, with their passionate cries of imprisoned spirits, sending a strange vibration through her frame. And of all her school life there was nothing left her now but her little collection of school books, which she turned over with a sickening sense that she knew them all, and they were all barren of comfort. Even at school she had often wished for books with more in them. Everything she learned there seemed like the ends of long threads that snapped immediately. And now, without the indirect charm of school emulation, Telemaque was mere bran, so were the hard, dry questions on Christian doctrine. There was no flavour in them, no strength. Sometimes Maggie thought she could have been contented with absorbing fancies. If she could have had all Scott's novels and all Byron's poems, then perhaps she might have found happiness enough to dull her sensibility to her actual daily life. And yet they were hardly what she wanted. She could make dream-worlds of her own, but no dream-world would satisfy her now. She wanted some explanation of this hard, real life. The unhappy-looking father, seated at the dull breakfast-table, the childish, bewildered mother, the little sordid tasks that filled the hours, or the more oppressive emptiness of weary, joyless leisure, the need of some tender demonstrative love, the cruel sense that Tom didn't mind what she thought or felt, and that they were no longer playfellows together, the privation of all pleasant things that had come to her more than to others. She wanted some key that would enable her to understand, and, in understanding, endure the heavy weight that had fallen on her young heart. If she had been taught real learning and wisdom such as great men knew— she thought she should have held the secrets of life. If she had only books, that she might learn for herself what wise men knew. Saints and martyrs had never interested Maggie so much as sages and poets. She knew little of saints and martyrs, and had gathered, as a general result of her teaching, that they were a temporary provision against the spread of Catholicism, and had all died at Smithfield. In one of these meditations it occurred to her that she had forgotten Tom's school books, which had been sent home in his trunk. But she found the stock unaccountably shrunk down to the few old ones which had been well thumbed, the Latin dictionary and grammar, a delectus, a torn Eutropius, the well-worn Virgil, Aldrich's logic, and the exasperating Euclid. Still— Latin, Euclid, and logic would surely be a considerable step in masculine wisdom, in that knowledge which made men contented and even glad to live. Not that the yearning for effectual wisdom was quite unmixed. A certain mirage would now and then rise on the desert of the future, in which she seemed to see herself honoured for her surprising attainments. And so the poor child— with her soul's hunger and her illusions of self-flattery, began to nibble at this thick-rinded fruit of the tree of knowledge, filling her vacant hours with Latin, geometry, and the forms of the syllogism, and feeling a gleam of triumph now and then, that her understanding was quite equal to these peculiarly masculine studies. For a week or two, she went on resolutely enough, though with an occasional sinking of heart, 
as if she had set out toward the promised land alone, and found it a thirsty, trackless, uncertain journey. In the severity of her early resolution, she would take Aldridge out into the fields, and then look off her book towards the sky, where the lark was twinkling, or to the reeds and bushes by the river, from which the waterfowl rustled forth on its anxious, awkward flight, with a startled sense that the relation between Aldrich and this living world was extremely remote for her. The discouragement deepened as the days went on, and the eager heart gained faster and faster on the patient mind. Somehow, when she sat at the window with her book, her eyes would fix themselves blankly on the outdoor sunshine, then they would fill with tears, and sometimes, if her mother was not in the room, the studies would all end in sobbing. She rebelled against her lot, she fainted under its loneliness, and fits, even of anger and hatred, toward her father and mother, who were so unlike what she would have them to be, towards Tom, who checked her, and met her thought or feeling always by some thwarting difference, would flow out over her affections and conscience like a lava stream, and frighten her with a sense that it was not difficult for her to become a demon. Then her brain would be busy with wild romances of a flight from home in search of something less sordid and dreary. She would go to some great man, Walter Scott, perhaps, and tell him how wretched and how clever she was, and he would surely do something for her. But in the middle of her vision her father would perhaps enter the room for the evening, and, surprised that she sat still without noticing him, would say complainingly, "'Come, am I to fetch my slippers myself?' The voice pierced through Maggie like a sword. There was another sadness besides her own, and she had been thinking of turning her back on it and forsaking it. End of Part 1 of Chapter 2 of Book 4 Recording by Tom Denham Part 2 of Chapter 3 of Book 4 of The Mill on the Floss by George Eliot. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Tom Denham. A Voice from the Past Continued. This afternoon the sight of Bob's cheerful, freckled face had given her discontent a new direction. She thought it was part of the hardship of her life that there was laid upon her the burden of larger wants than others seemed to feel, that she had to endure this wide, hopeless yearning for that something, whatever it was, that was greatest and best on this earth. She wished she could have been like Bob, with his easily satisfied ignorance, or like Tom, who had something to do on which he could fix his mind with a steady purpose and disregard everything else. Poor child! As she leaned her head against the window frame, with her hands clasped tighter and tighter, and her foot beating the ground, she was as lonely in her trouble as if she had been the only girl in the civilized world of that day who had come out of her school life with a soul untrained for inevitable struggles with no other part of her inherited share in the hard-won treasures of thought which generations of painful toil have laid up for the race of men, than shreds and patches of feeble literature and false history. With much futile information about Saxon and other kings of doubtful example, but unhappily quite without that knowledge of the irreversible laws within and without her, which, governing the habits, becomes morality, and developing the feelings of submission and dependence, becomes religion, as lonely in her trouble, 
as if every other girl besides herself had been cherished and watched over by elder minds, not forgetful of their own early time, when need was keen and impulse strong. At last Maggie's eyes glanced down on the books that lay on the window-shelf, and she half forsook her reverie to turn over listlessly the leaves of the portrait gallery, but she soon pushed this aside to examine the little row of books tied together with string. Beauties of the Spectator, Rasselas, Economy of Human Life, Gregory's Letters, she knew the sort of matter that was inside all these. The Christian Year. That seemed to be a hymn-book, and she laid it down again. But Thomas a Kempis? The name had come across her in her reading, and she felt the satisfaction, which every one knows, of getting some ideas to attach to a name that strays solitary in the memory. She took up the little old clumsy book with some curiosity. It had the corners turned down in many places, and some hand, now forever quiet, had made at certain passages strong pen and ink marks, long since browned by time. Maggie turned from leaf to leaf, and read where the quiet hand pointed. "'Know that the love of thyself doth hurt thee more than anything in the world.' If thou seekest this or that, and wouldst be here or there to enjoy thy own will and pleasure, thou shalt never be quiet nor free from care, for in everything somewhat will be wanting, and in every place there will be some that will cross thee, both above and below, which way soever thou dost turn thee, everywhere thou shalt find the cross, and everywhere of necessity thou must have patience if thou wilt have inward peace, and enjoy an everlasting crown. If thou desire to mount unto this height, thou must set out courageously, and lay the axe to the root, that thou mayst pluck up and destroy that hidden, inordinate inclination to thyself, and unto all private and earthly good. On this sin, that a man inordinately loveth himself, Almost all dependeth, whatsoever is thoroughly to be overcome. Which evil being once overcome and subdued, there will presently ensue great peace and tranquillity. It is but little thou sufferest in comparison of them that have suffered so much, were so strongly tempted, so grievously afflicted, so many ways tried and exercised. Thou oughtest therefore to call to mind the more heavy sufferings of others, that thou mayest the easier bear thy little adversities. And if they seem not little unto thee, beware lest thy impatience be the cause thereof. Blessed are those ears that receive the whispers of the divine voice, and listen not to the whisperings of the world. Blessed are those ears which hearken not unto the voice which soundeth outwardly, but unto the truth which teacheth inwardly. A strange thrill of awe passed through Maggie while she read, as if she had been wakened in the night by a strain of solemn music, telling of beings whose souls had been astir while hers was in stupor. She went on from one brown mark to another, where the quiet hand seemed to point, hardly conscious that she was reading, seeming rather to listen, while a low voice said, "'Why dost thou here gaze about, since this is not the place of thy rest? In heaven ought to be thy dwelling, and all earthly things are to be looked on as they forward thy journey thither. All things pass away, and thou together with them. Beware thou cleave not unto them, lest thou be entangled and perish. If a man should give all his substance, yet it is as nothing. And if he should do great penances, yet are they but little. And if he should attain to all knowledge, he is yet far off. And if he should be of great virtue, and very fervent devotion, 
yet there is much wanting, to wit one thing which is most necessary for him, what is that? That having left all, he leave himself, and go wholly out of himself, and retain nothing of self-love. I have often said unto thee, and now again I say the same, forsake thyself, resign thyself, and thou shalt enjoy much inward peace. Then shall all vain imaginations, evil perturbations, and superfluous cares fly away. Then shall immoderate fear leave thee, and inordinate love shall die. Maggie drew a long breath, and pushed her heavy hair back, as if to see a sudden vision more clearly. Here, then, was a secret of life that would enable her to renounce all other secrets. Here was a sublime height to be reached without the help of outward things. Here was insight and strength and conquest to be won by means entirely within her own soul, where a supreme teacher was waiting to be heard. It flashed through her like the suddenly apprehended solution of a problem that all the miseries of her young life had come from fixing her heart on her own pleasure, as if that were the central necessity of the universe. And for the first time she saw the possibility of shifting the position from which she looked at the gratification of her own desires, of taking her stand out of herself, and looking at her own life as an insignificant part of a divinely guided whole. She read on and on in the old book, devouring eagerly the dialogues with the invisible teacher, the pattern of sorrow, the source of all strength. Returning to it after she had been called away, and reading till the sun went down behind the willows, with all the hurry of an imagination that could never rest in the present, she sat in the deepening twilight, forming plans of self-humiliation and entire devotedness, and in the ardour of first discovery, renunciation seemed to her the entrance into that satisfaction which she had so long been craving in vain. She had not perceived, how could she until she had lived longer, the inmost truth of the old monk's outpourings, that renunciation remains sorrow, though a sorrow born willingly. Maggie was still panting for happiness, and was in ecstasy, because she had found the key to it. She knew nothing of doctrines and systems, of mysticism or quietism, but this voice, out of the far-off Middle Ages, was the direct communication of a human soul's belief and experience, and came to Maggie as an unquestioned message. I suppose that is the reason why the small, old-fashioned book, for which you need pay only sixpence at a bookstall, works miracles to this day, turning bitter waters into sweetness, while expensive sermons and treatises newly issued leave all things as they were before. It was written down by a hand that waited for the heart's prompting. It is the chronicle of a solitary, hidden anguish, struggle, trust, and triumph, not written on velvet cushions to teach endurance to those who are treading with bleeding feet on the stones. And so it remains to all time a lasting record of human needs and human consolations. The voice of a brother who ages ago felt and suffered and renounced, in the cloister perhaps, with serge gown and tonsured head, with much chanting and long fasts, and with a fashion of speech different from ours, but under the same silent far-off heavens, and with the same passionate desires, the same strivings, the same failures, the same weariness. In writing the history of unfashionable families, one is apt to fall into a tone of emphasis which is very far from being the tone of good society, where principles and beliefs 
are not only of an extremely moderate kind, but are always presupposed, no subject being eligible but such as can be touched with a light and graceful irony. But then, good society has its claret, and its velvet carpets, its dinner engagements six weeks deep, its opera, and its fairy ballrooms. Rides off its ennui on thoroughbred horses, lounges at the club, has to keep clear of crinoline vortices, gets its science done by Faraday, and its religion by the superior clergy, who are to be met in the best houses. How should it have time or need for belief and emphasis? But good society, floated on gossamer wings of light irony, is a very expensive production, requiring nothing less than a wide and arduous national life condensed in unfragrant deafening factories, cramping itself in mines, sweating at furnaces, grinding, hammering, weaving under more or less oppression of carbonic acid, or else spread over sheep walks and scattered in lonely houses and huts on the clayey or chalky cornlands where the rainy days look dreary. This wide national life is based entirely on emphasis, the emphasis of want which urges it into all the activities necessary for the maintenance of good society and light irony. It spends its heavy years often in a chill, uncarpeted fashion, amidst family discord unsoftened by long corridors. Under such circumstances, there are many among its myriads of souls who have absolutely needed an emphatic belief. Life in this unpleasurable shape, demanding some solution even to unspeculative minds. Just as you inquire into the stuffing of your couch when anything galls you there, whereas Eiderdown and perfect French springs excite no question. Some have an emphatic belief in alcohol, and seek their ecstasis or outside standing ground in gin. But the rest require something that good society calls enthusiasm, something that will present motives in an entire absence of high prizes, something that will give patience and feed human love when the limbs ache with weariness and human looks are hard upon us, something clearly that lies outside personal desires, that includes resignation for ourselves and active love for what is not ourselves. Now and then that sort of enthusiasm finds a far-echoing voice that comes from an experience springing out of the deepest need. And it was by being brought within the long lingering vibrations of such a voice that Maggie, with her girl's face and unnoted sorrows, found an effort and a hope that helped her through years of loneliness, making out a faith for herself, without the aid of established authorities and appointed guides, for they were not at hand, and her need was pressing. From what you know of her, you will not be surprised that she threw some exaggeration and willfulness, some pride and impetuosity, even into her self-renunciation. Her own life was still a drama for her, in which she demanded of herself that her part should be played with intensity. And so it came to pass that she often lost the spirit of humility by being excessive in the outward act. She often strove after too high a flight, and came down with her poor little half-fledged wings dabbled in the mud. For example, she not only determined to work at plain sewing that she might contribute something towards the fund in the tin box, but she went in the first instance, in her zeal of self-mortification, to ask for it at a linen shop in St. Ogg's, instead of getting it in a more quiet and indirect way, and could see nothing but what was entirely wrong and unkind, nay persecuting, in Tom's reproof of her for this unnecessary act. "'I don't like my sister to do such things,' said Tom. "'I'll take care that the debts are paid without your lowering yourself in that way.' 
Surely there was some tenderness and bravery mingled with the worldliness and self-assertion of that little speech. But Maggie held it as dross, overlooking the grains of gold, and took Tom's rebuke as one of her outward crosses. Tom was very hard to her, she used to think, in her long night watchings, to her who had always loved him so, and then she strove to be contented with that hardness, and to require nothing. That is the path we all like, when we set out on our abandonment of egoism, the path of martyrdom and endurance, where the palm branches grow, rather than the steep highway of tolerance, just allowance, and self-blame, where there are no leafy honours to be gathered and worn. The old books, Virgil, Euclid, and Aldrich, that wrinkled fruit of the tree of knowledge, had been all laid by, for Maggie had turned her back on the vain ambition to share the thoughts of the wise. In her first ardour she flung away the books with a sort of triumph that she had risen above the need of them, and if they had been her own she would have burned them, believing that she would never repent. She read so eagerly and constantly in her three books, the Bible, Thomas a Kempis, and the Christian Year, no longer rejected as a hymn-book, that they filled her mind with a continual stream of rhythmic memories, and she was too ardently learning to see all nature and life in the light of her new faith, to need any other material for her mind to work on, as she sat with her well-plied needle, making shirts and other complicated stitchings, falsely called plain, by no means plain to Maggie, since wristband and sleeve and the like had a capability of being sewed in wrong side outwards in moments of mental wandering. Hanging diligently over her sewing, Maggie was a sight any one might have been pleased to look at. That new inward life of hers, notwithstanding some volcanic upheavings of imprisoned passions, yet shone out in her face with a tender soft light that mingled itself as added loveliness with the gradually enriched colour and outline of her blossoming youth. Her mother felt the change in her with a sort of puzzled wonder that Maggie should be growing up so good. It was amazing that this once contrary child was become so submissive, so backward to assert her own will. Maggie used to look up from her work and find her mother's eyes fixed upon her. They were watching and waiting for the large young glance, as if her elder frame got some needful warmth from it. The mother was getting fond of her tall brown girl, the only bit of furniture now on which she could bestow her anxiety and pride, and Maggie, in spite of her own ascetic wish to have no personal adornment, was obliged to give way to her mother about her hair, and submit to have the abundant black locks plaited into a coronet on the summit of her head, after the pitiable fashion of those antiquated times. "'Let your mother have that bit of pleasure, my dear,' said Mrs. Tulliver. "'I'd trouble enough with your hair once.' So Maggie, glad of anything that would soothe her mother and cheer their long day together, consented to the vain decoration, and showed a queenly head above her old frocks, steadily refusing, however, to look at herself in the glass. Mrs. Tulliver liked to call the father's attention to Maggie's hair and other unexpected virtues, but he had a brusque reply to give. "'I knew well enough what she'd be before now. It's nothing new to me. But it's a pity she isn't made of commoner stuff. She'll be thrown away, I doubt. There'll be nobody to marry her as is fit for her and Maggie's graces of mind and body fed his gloom. He sat patiently enough while she read him a chapter, or said something timidly when they were alone together, about trouble being turned into a blessing. 
he took it all as part of his daughter's goodness, which made his misfortunes the sadder to him because they damaged her chance in life. In a mind charged with an eager purpose and an unsatisfied vindictiveness, there is no room for new feelings. Mr. Tulliver did not want spiritual consolation. He wanted to shake off the degradation of debt, and to have his revenge. End of chapter 3 of Book 4th End of Book 4th Recording by Tom Denham Chapter 1 of Book 5th of The Mill on the Floss by George Eliot This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Tom Denham Book Fifth, Wheat and Tares Chapter One, In the Red Deeps The family sitting-room was a long room with a window at each end, one looking towards the croft and along the ripple to the banks of the floss, the other into the mill-yard, Maggie was sitting with her work against the latter window, when she saw Mr. Wakeham entering the yard, as usual, on his fine black horse, but not alone, as usual. Someone was with him, a figure in a cloak on a handsome pony. Maggie had hardly time to feel that it was Philip come back, before they were in front of the window, and he was raising his hat to her, while his father catching the movement by a side-glance, looked sharply round at them both. Maggie hurried away from the window and carried her work upstairs, for Mr. Wakeham sometimes came in and inspected the books, and Maggie felt that the meeting with Philip would be robbed of all pleasure in the presence of the two fathers. Some day, perhaps, she should see him when they could just shake hands— and she could tell him that she remembered his goodness to Tom, and the things he had said to her in the old days, though they could never be friends any more. It was not at all agitating to Maggie to see Philip again. She retained her childish gratitude and pity towards him, and remembered his cleverness, and in the early weeks of her loneliness— she had continually recalled the image of him among the people who had been kind to her in life, often wishing she had him for a brother and a teacher, as they had fancied it might have been in their talk together. But that sort of wishing had been banished, along with other dreams that savoured of seeking her own will, and she thought, besides, that Philip might be altered by his life abroad— he might have become worldly, and really not care about her saying anything to him now. And yet, his face was wonderfully little altered. It was only a larger, more manly copy of the pale, small-featured boy's face, with the grey eyes and the boyish waving brown hair. There was the old deformity to awaken the old pity, and after all her meditations, Maggie felt that she really should like to say a few words to him. He might still be melancholy, as he always used to be, and like her to look at him kindly. She wondered if he remembered how he used to like her eyes. With that thought, Maggie glanced towards the square looking-glass, which was condemned to hang with its face towards the wall, and she half started from her seat to reach it down. But she checked herself, and snatched up her work, trying to repress the rising wishes by forcing her memory to recall snatches of hymns, until she saw Philip and his father returning along the road, and she could go down again. It was far on in June now, and Maggie was inclined to lengthen the daily walk which was her one indulgence. But this day and the following she was so busy with work which must be finished that she never went beyond the gate, and satisfied her need of the open air by sitting out of doors. One of her frequent walks, when she was not obliged to go to St. Ogg's, 
was to a spot that lay beyond what was called the hill, an insignificant rise of ground crowned by trees, lying along the side of the road which ran by the gates of Dalcott Mill. Insignificant, I call it, because in height it was hardly more than a bank. But there may come moments when nature makes a mere bank a means towards a fateful result, and that is why I ask you to imagine this high bank crowned with trees, making an uneven wall for some quarter of a mile along the left side of Dalcott Mill, and the pleasant fields behind it, bounded by the murmuring ripple. Just where this line of bank sloped down again to the level, a by-road turned off and led to the other side of the rise, where it was broken into very capricious hollows and mounds by the working of an exhausted stone quarry, so long exhausted that both mounds and hollows were now clothed with brambles and trees, and here and there by a stretch of grass which a few sheep kept close nibbled. In her childish days Maggie held this place, called the Red Deeps, in very great awe, and needed all her confidence in Tom's bravery to reconcile her to an excursion thither. Visions of robbers and fierce animals haunting every hollow. But now it had the charm for her, which any broken ground, any mimic rock and ravine, have for the eyes that rest habitually on the level, especially in summer, when she could sit on a grassy hollow under the shadow of a branching ash, stooping aslant from the steep above her, and listen to the hum of insects, like tiniest bells on the garment of silence or see the sunlight piercing the distant boughs, as if to chase and drive home the truant heavenly blue of the wild hyacinths. In this June time, too, the dog-roses were in their glory. And that was an additional reason why Maggie should direct her walk to the Red Deeps, rather than to any other spot, on the first day she was free to wander at her will a pleasure she loved so well that sometimes, in her ardours of renunciation, she thought she ought to deny herself the frequent indulgence in it. You may see her now as she walks down the favourite turning, and enters the deeps by a narrow path through a group of Scotch firs. Her tall figure and old lavender gown, visible through an hereditary black silk shawl, of some wide-meshed, net-like material. And now she is sure of being unseen, she takes off her bonnet and ties it over her arm. One would certainly suppose her to be farther on in life than her seventeenth year, perhaps because of the slow, resigned sadness of the glance, from which all search and unrest seem to have departed, perhaps because her broad-chested figure as the mould of early womanhood. Youth and health have withstood well the involuntary and voluntary hardships of her lot, and the nights in which she has lain on the hard floor for a penance have left no obvious trace. The eyes are liquid, the brown cheek is firm and rounded, the full lips are red. With her dark colouring and jet crown surmounting her tall figure, she seems to have a sort of kinship with the grand Scotch firs, at which she is looking up as if she loved them well. Yet one has a sense of uneasiness in looking at her, a sense of opposing elements, of which a fierce collision is imminent. Surely there is a hushed expression, such as one often sees in older faces under borderless caps, out of keeping with the resistant youth, which one expects to flash out in a sudden, passionate glance that will dissipate all the quietude, like a damped fire leaping out again when all seemed safe. But Maggie herself was not uneasy at this moment. She was calmly enjoying the free air, while she looked up at the old fir-trees, and thought that those broken ends of branches were the records of past storms, which had only made the red stems soar higher. 
but while her eyes were still turned upward, she became conscious of a moving shadow cast by the evening sun on the grassy path before her, and looked down with a startled gesture to see Philip Wakeham, who first raised his hat, and then, blushing deeply, came forward to her and put out his hand. Maggie, too, coloured with surprise, which soon gave way to pleasure. She put out her hand and looked down at the deformed figure before her with frank eyes, filled for the moment with nothing but the memory of her child's feelings, a memory that was always strong in her. She was the first to speak. "'You startled me,' she said, smiling faintly. "'I'd never meet anyone here.' "'How came you to be walking here? "'Did you come to meet me?' "'It was impossible not to perceive "'that Maggie felt herself a child again. "'Yes, I did,' said Philip, still embarrassed. "'I wished to see you very much. "'I watched a long while yesterday on the bank near your house "'to see if you would come out, but you never came. "'Then I watched again to-day, and when I saw the way you took, I kept you in sight and came down the bank behind there. I hope you will not be displeased with me. No, said Maggie, with simple seriousness, walking on as if she meant Philip to accompany her. I'm very glad you came, for I wished very much to have an opportunity of speaking to you. I've never forgotten how good you were long ago to Tom, and me too but I was not sure that you would remember us so well. Tom and I have had a great deal of trouble since then, and I think that makes one think more of what happened before the trouble came. I can't believe that you have thought of me so much as I have thought of you, said Philip timidly. Do you know, when I was away, I made a picture of you as you looked that morning in the study when you said you would not forget me. Philip drew a large miniature case from his pocket and opened it. Maggie saw her old self leaning on a table, with her black locks hanging down behind her ears, looking into space with strange dreamy eyes. It was a water-colour sketch of real merit as a portrait. "'Oh, dear!' said Maggie, smiling and flushed with pleasure. "'What a queer little girl I was! "'I remember myself with my hair in that way, in that pink frock. "'I really was like a gypsy. "'I dare say I am now,' she added after a little pause. "'Am I like what you expected me to be?' "'The words might have been those of a coquette, "'but the full bright glance Maggie turned on Philip "'was not that of a coquette.' She really did hope he liked her face as it was now, but it was simply the rising again of her innate delight in admiration and love. Philip met her eyes and looked at her in silence for a long moment before he said quietly, "'No, Maggie.' The light died out a little from Maggie's face, and there was a slight trembling of the lip. Her eyelids fell lower, but she did not turn away her head, and Philip continued to look at her. Then he said, slowly, "'You are very much more beautiful than I thought you would be.' "'Am I?' said Maggie, the pleasure returning in a deeper flush. She turned her face away from him and took some steps, looking straight before her in silence, as if she were adjusting her consciousness to this new idea. Girls are so accustomed to think of dress as the main ground of vanity, that in abstaining from the looking-glass Maggie had thought more of abandoning all care for adornment than of renouncing the contemplation of her face. Comparing herself with elegant, wealthy young ladies, it had not occurred to her that she could produce any effect with her person. Philip seemed to like the silence well. He walked by her side, watching her face as if that sight left no room for any other wish. 
they had passed from among the fir trees and had now come to a green hollow almost surrounded by an amphitheatre of the pale pink dog roses but as the light about them had brightened maggie's face had lost its glow she stood still when they were in the hollows and looking at philip again she said in a serious sad voice i wish we could have been friends i mean if it would have been good and right for us but that is the trial i have to bear in everything i may not keep anything i used to love when i was little the old books went and tom is different and my father it is like death i must part with everything i cared for when i was a child and i must part with you we must never take any notice of each other again that is what i wanted to speak to you for i wanted to let you know that tom and i can't do as we like about such things and that if i behave as if i had forgotten all about you it is not out of envy or pride or or any bad feeling maggie spoke with more and more sorrowful gentleness as she went on and her eyes began to fill with tears the deepening expression of pain on philip's face gave him a stronger resemblance to his boyish self and made the deformity appeal more strongly to her pity i know i see all that you mean he said in a voice that had become feebler from discouragement i know what there is to keep us apart on both sides but it is not right maggie don't you be angry with me i am so used to call you maggie in my thoughts it is not right to sacrifice everything to other people's unreasonable feelings i would give up a great deal for my father but i would not give up a friendship or or an attachment of any sort in obedience to any wish of his that i didn't recognize as right i don't know said maggie musingly often when i have been angry and discontented it has seemed to me that i was not bound to give up anything and i have gone on thinking till it has seemed to me that i could think away all my duty but no good has ever come of that it was an evil state of mind i am quite sure that whatever i might do i should wish in the end that i had gone without anything for myself rather than have made my father's life harder to him but would it make his life harder if we were to see each other sometimes said philip he was going to say something else but checked himself oh i'm sure he wouldn't like it don't ask me why or anything about it said maggie in a distressed tone my father feels so strongly about some things he is not at all happy no more am i said philip impetuously i am not happy why said maggie gently at least i ought not to ask but i'm very very sorry philip turned to walk on as if he had not patience to stand still any longer and they went out of the hollow winding amongst the trees and bushes in silence after that last word of philip's maggie could not bear to insist immediately on their parting i've been a great deal happier she said at last timidly since i have given up thinking about what is easy and pleasant and being discontented because i couldn't have my own will our life is determined for us and it makes the mind very free when we give up wishing and only think of bearing what is laid upon us and doing what is given us to do but i can't give up wishing said philip impatiently it seems to me we can never give up longing and wishing while we are thoroughly alive there are certain things we feel to be beautiful and good and we must hunger after them how can we ever be satisfied without them until our feelings are deadened i delight in fine pictures 
I long to be able to paint such. I strive and strive, and can't produce what I want. That is pain to me, and always will be pain, until my faculties lose their keenness, like aged eyes. Then there are many other things I long for. Here Philip hesitated a little, and then said, "'Things that other men have, and that will always be denied me. My life will have nothing great or beautiful in it. I would rather not have lived.' "'Oh, Philip,' said Maggie, "'I wish you didn't feel so.' But her heart began to beat with something of Philip's discontent. "'Well, then,' said he, turning quickly round and fixing his grey eyes entreatingly in her face, "'I should be contented to live if you would let me see you sometimes.' Then, checked by a fear which her face suggested, he looked away again and said more calmly, "'I have no friend to whom I can tell everything, no one who cares enough about me.' and if I could only see you now and then, and you would let me talk to you a little, and show me that you cared for me, and that we may always be friends in heart, and help each other, then I might come to be glad of life. "'But how can I see you, Philip?' said Maggie falteringly. "'Could she really do him good?' It would be very hard to say good-bye this day, and not speak to him again. Here was a new interest to vary the days. It was so much easier to renounce the interest before it came. If you would let me see you here sometimes, walk with you here, I would be contented if it were only once or twice in a month. That could injure no one's happiness, and it would sweeten my life. Besides, Philip went on, with all the inventive astuteness of love at one and twenty, if there is any enmity between those who belong to us, we ought all the more to try and quench it by our friendship. I mean that by our influence on both sides— we might bring about a healing of the wounds that have been made in the past, if I could know everything about them, and I don't believe there is any enmity in my own father's mind. I think he has proved the contrary. Maggie shook her head slowly and was silent under conflicting thoughts. It seemed to her inclination that to see Philip now and then, and keep up the bond of friendship with him, was something not only innocent, but good. Perhaps she might really help him to find contentment, as she had found it. The voice that said this made sweet music to Maggie, but athwart it there came an urgent, monotonous warning from another voice which she had been learning to obey, the warning that such interviews implied secrecy, implied doing something she would dread to be discovered in, something that, if discovered, must cause anger and pain, and that the admission of anything so near doubleness would act as a spiritual blight. Yet the music would swell out again like chimes borne onward by a recurrent breeze, persuading her that the wrong lay all in the faults and weaknesses of others and that there was such a thing as futile sacrifice for one to the injury of another. It was very cruel for Philip that he should be shrunk from, because of an unjustifiable vindictiveness towards his father. Poor Philip, whom some people would shrink from only because he was deformed. The idea that he might become her lover, or that her meeting him could cause disapproval in that light, had not occurred to her, and Philip saw the absence of this idea clearly enough, saw it with a certain pang, although it made her consent to his request the less unlikely. There was bitterness to him in the perception that Maggie was almost as frank and unconstrained towards him as when she was a child. "'I can't say either yes or no,' she said at last, turning round and walking towards the way she had come. 
I must wait, lest I should decide wrongly. I must seek for guidance. May I come again, then, to-morrow, or the next day, or next week? I think I had better write, said Maggie, faltering again. I have to go to St. Ogg's sometimes, and I can put the letter in the post. Oh, no, said Philip eagerly, that would not be so well. My father might see the letter, and he has not any enmity, I believe, but he views things differently from me. He thinks a great deal about wealth and position. Pray let me come here once more. Tell me when it shall be, or if you can't tell me, I will come as often as I can, till I do see you. I think it must be so, then, said Maggie, for I can't be quite certain of coming here any particular evening. Maggie felt a great relief in adjourning the decision. She was free now to enjoy the minutes of companionship. She almost thought she might linger a little. The next time they met she should have to pain Philip by telling him her determination. "'I can't help thinking,' she said, looking smilingly at him after a few moments of silence, "'how strange it is that we should have met and talked to each other just as if it had been only yesterday when we parted at Lawton. And yet we must both be very much altered in those five years. I think it is five years. How was it you seemed to have a sort of feeling that I was the same Maggie? I was not quite so sure that you would be the same. I know you are so clever, and you must have seen and learned so much to fill your mind. I was not quite sure you would care about me now. I have never had any doubt that you would be the same whenever I might see you, said Philip. I mean, the same in everything that made me like you better than any one else. I don't want to explain that. I don't think any of the strongest effects our natures are susceptible of can ever be explained. We can neither detect the process by which they are arrived at, nor the mode in which they act on us. The greatest of painters only once painted a mysteriously divine child. He couldn't have told how he did it, and we can't tell why we feel it to be divine. I think there are stores laid up in our human nature that our understandings can make no complete inventory of. Certain strains of music affect me so strangely. I can never hear them without their changing my whole attitude of mind for a time, and if the effect would last, I might be capable of heroisms. "'Ah, I know what you mean about music. I feel so,' said Maggie, clasping her hands with her old impetuosity. "'At least,' she added, in a saddened tone, "'I used to feel so when I had any music.' I never have any now except the organ at church. "'And you long for it, Maggie?' said Philip, looking at her with affectionate pity. "'Ah, you can have very little that is beautiful in your life. Have you many books? You were so fond of them when you were a little girl.' They were come back to the hollow round which the dog-roses grew and they both paused under the charm of the fairy evening light, reflected from the pale pink clusters. "'No, I have given up books,' said Maggie quietly, "'except a very, very few.' Philip had already taken from his pocket a small volume, and was looking at the back as he said, "'Ah, this is the second volume, I see, else you might have liked to take it home with you.' I put it in my pocket because I am studying a scene for a picture. Maggie had looked at the back, too, and saw the title. It revived an old impression with overmastering force. "'The Pirate!' she said, taking the book from Philip's hands. "'Oh, I began that once. I read to where Minna is walking with Cleveland, and I could never get to read the rest.' I went on with it in my own head, 
and I made several endings, but they were all unhappy. I could never make a happy ending out of that beginning. Poor Minna! I wonder what is the real end. For a long while I couldn't get my mind away from the Shetland Isles. I used to feel the wind blowing on me from the rough sea. Maggie spoke rapidly with glistening eyes. "'Take that volume home with you, Maggie,' said Philip, watching her with delight. "'I don't want it now. I shall make a picture of you instead. You among the Scotch firs and the slanting shadows.' Maggie had not heard a word he had said. She was absorbed in a page at which she had opened. But suddenly she closed the book and gave it back to Philip, shaking her head with a backward movement as if to say, Avaunt to floating visions. "'Do keep it, Maggie,' said Philip entreatingly. "'It will give you pleasure.' "'No, thank you,' said Maggie, putting it aside with her hand and walking on. "'It would make me in love with this world again as I used to be. "'It would make me long to see and know many things. "'It would make me long for a full life. "'But you will not always be shut up in your present lot. "'Why should you starve your mind in that way? "'It is narrow asceticism. "'I don't like to see you persisting in it, Maggie.' "'Poetry and art and knowledge are sacred and pure.' "'But not for me, not for me,' said Maggie, walking more hurriedly. "'Because I should want too much. I must wait. This life will not last long.' "'Don't hurry away from me without saying good-bye, Maggie,' said Philip, as they reached the group of Scotch firs, and she continued still to walk along without speaking. I must not go any farther, I think, must I? Oh, no, I forgot. Good-bye, said Maggie, pausing, and putting out her hand to him. The action brought her feeling back in a strong current to Philip, and after they had stood looking at each other in silence for a few moments, with their hands clasped, she said, withdrawing her hand, "'I'm very grateful to you for thinking of me all those years. "'It is very sweet to have people love us. "'What a wonderful, beautiful thing it seems "'that God should have made your heart "'so that you could care about a queer little girl "'whom you only knew for a few weeks. "'I remember saying to you "'that I thought you cared for me more than Tom did.' "'Ah, Maggie,' said Philip, almost fretfully, "'You would never love me so well as you love your brother.' "'Perhaps not,' said Maggie simply. "'But then, you know, the first thing I ever remember in my life "'is standing with Tom by the side of the floss while he held my hand. "'Everything before that is dark to me. "'But I shall never forget you, though we must keep apart.' "'Don't say so, Maggie.' said Philip, if I kept that little girl in my mind for five years, didn't I earn some part in her? She ought not to take herself quite away from me. Not if I were free, said Maggie, but I am not. I must submit. She hesitated a moment and then added, and I wanted to say to you that you had better not take more notice of my brother than just bowing to him. "'He once told me not to speak to you again, and he doesn't change his mind. "'Oh, dear, the sun is set. I'm too long away. Good-bye.' "'She gave him her hand once more. "'I shall come here as often as I can till I see you again, Maggie. "'Have some feeling for me as well as for others.' "'Yes, yes, I have,' said Maggie, hurrying away, and quickly disappearing behind the last fir-tree, though Philip's gaze after her remained immovable for minutes, as if he saw her still. Maggie went home, with an inward conflict already begun. Philip went home to do nothing but remember and hope. You can hardly help blaming him severely.' 
He was four or five years older than Maggie, and had a full consciousness of his feeling towards her to aid him in foreseeing the character his contemplated interviews with her would bear in the opinion of a third person. But you must not suppose that he was capable of a gross selfishness, or that he could have been satisfied without persuading himself that he was seeking to infuse some happiness into Maggie's life seeking this even more than any direct ends for himself. He could give her sympathy, he could give her help. There was not the slightest promise of love towards him in her manner. It was nothing more than the sweet girlish tenderness she had shown him when she was twelve. Perhaps she would never love him, perhaps no woman ever could love him. Well, then, he would endure that, he should at least have the happiness of seeing her, of feeling some nearness to her, and he clutched passionately the possibility that she might love him. Perhaps the feeling would grow if she could come to associate him with that watchful tenderness which her nature would be so keenly alive to. If any woman could love him, surely Maggie was that woman." There was such wealth of love in her, and there was no one to claim it all. Then, the pity of it, that a mind like hers should be withering in its very youth, like a young forest tree, for want of the light and space it was formed to flourish in. Could he not hinder that by persuading her out of her system of privation? He would be her guardian angel. He would do anything— bear anything for her sake, except not seeing her. End of chapter 1 of Book 5th Recording by Tom Denham